Here we go, another cartoon from my childhood. The Amazing World of Gumball is a 2011 Cartoon Network show created by Ben Boclet. I feel like I pronounced that very wrong. It revolves around a blue cat named Gumball Watterson and his goldfish brother Darwin Watterson. We see them go on crazy adventures with their family, their friends, and the entirety of Elmore. Now, I gotta admit, when I first heard the concept for this show, it reminded me of another Cartoon Network show, Chowder. You have this cat that's named after a food that goes on crazy adventures with their friends and family members. Like I said in my regular show video, I like the amazing world of Gumball. I thought the animation of the show was very unique, the characters were enjoyable, the jokes were pretty freaking hilarious, there are some moments in the show where it can be pretty heartwarming, and there are some episodes that try to be satirical. I mean, we already have South Park for that job, but okay. Now join me as I watch and rank every single episode of The Amazing World of Gumball. Yep, we're gonna look at the pilot first. The premise for this short is that Gumball and Darwin make a plan to try and escape school by building a Rube Goldberg machine. This thing, right here. As all pilots go, I say it does a pretty decent job of introducing you to the characters and the creativity of the show. And you get to see all the school characters from the show in this short. But it's pretty obvious that some of their genders got swapped and some of their designs went through some minor changes. Even Gumball and Darwin went through some changes too. For example, Darwin originally was supposed to be CGI looking, but they made him 2D like the rest of the Watterson family. So yeah, I think the pilot's pretty good. Not much to scream on about. Now let's get into the main series. After accidentally destroying the DVD disc, Gumball and Darwin try to make some money so they can pay off the fine. Much like regular show's first episode, there's lots of quotable lines in here. The money I have to go and earn to feed you kids. The kids you decided to have. The reason you guys are on the streets is to pay a DVD fine? Yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? People don't understand how hard our life is. Trouble? <laughs> no, we're fine. Absolutely fine. No trouble here. Bye. Are you lying? <laughs> oh, no, of course not. Bright, you're lying. I'm coming home now. There are bones in there? I thought it was pretty enjoyable, even though throughout the episode, I'm just asking, why don't you just pirate the damn movie? Gumball! You wouldn't steal a car, you wouldn't steal a woman's purse, you wouldn't steal a cell phone, Percy is stealing! I know, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you're stealing from corporations that have way too much money as it is, so don't give me that crap. The animation is pretty great as it has a very unique art style, which makes it stand out from all of Cartoon Network's other shows. I think this episode does a good job of introducing us to the characters, like the other shows I've ranked before. You have Gumball, who is a lazy, irresponsible 12-year-old cat, and Darwin, the goldfish with legs, who has a better set of morals than Gumball. Because throughout the episode, he constantly keeps recommending that they tell Nicole what happened, to which Gumball responds by saying no, but then <laughs> we get this hilarious ending. See Darwin, you should always tell the truth and face the consequences of your actions. And I like Nicole too, mainly because she chases after their asses in the final act of the episode. That was awesome. And she also says that no matter what the kids do, she'll never stop loving them. Can you hold on to this line? Because it's going to be important for later episodes, I promise. I need to note that Anais and Richard don't make an appearance in this episode. Which is weird considering the fact that Penny's family members and Larry make an appearance in this episode before the other two do. But don't worry, they'll pop up in the next episode. Speaking of which... I guess you guys are old enough to babysit? Us? Yes, you. Oh yeah, Nicole. That's fucking genius on your part. But I won't get on you too hard since Richard didn't get a babysitter in time. With Nicole and Richard going to the parent-teacher conference meeting, she tasks Gumball and Darwin to look after Anais. See, I told you they would make an appearance. I thought this episode had a bunch of funny jokes in it, specifically relating to Richard. Richard, pants on. 
No! No! <laughs> Are you aware that your husband isn't wearing any pants? And as for the main plot, I think it's pretty good, but I have some issues with it. I like that Gumball and Darwin are trying their best to look after Anais, even though they're being very condescending while they're doing it. It's ridiculous, and look at the mess you're making! It's a small price to pay for your safety. You're too young to understand. They treat her like a child, despite the fact that she's more mature than both of them. And now that I think about it, I do think their stupidity is grouped up to 100 in this one, which is why I have some issues with this episode. But, at the same time, I think it's a pretty good episode. Not one of the greatest, but it's a good episode, nevertheless. And I need to note, this marks the first time that Darwin has kissed Gumball. Just need to let you know. Darwin, maybe it's not the games. Maybe we're part of each other. No, don't say that. It can't be. It's the truth, Darwin, and you know it. I'll give regular show credit that they waited four years before jumping into the whole we should have a third friend for our group bit. Gumball and Darwin start to realize that their friendship is getting a little stale. So they decide to have a third friend to add to their group. This is where Tobias comes along. And not surprisingly, when Tobias steps into the picture, Darwin ends up ditching Gumball. It reminds me of one of those dumb love stories, except with bros. Actually, I need to nitpick real quick. I suppose it's only 10 bucks each. Yeah, about that. Can I borrow 10 bucks? Fine. That's clearly a $1 bill. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? I mean, I give it credit that it does show us the student characters that would get their own time in the spotlight in later seasons. Gumball talking to Alan about his problems was pretty sweet, especially considering how he acts like a dick to him in later seasons. And I do think the ending was pretty heartwarming, but it's just as stale as Gumball and Darwin's relationship in this episode. Am I the only one that thinks that the shtick between Gumball and Mr. Robinson is too similar to Spongebob and Squidward? But I'll give Gumball a pass because he's 12, and meanwhile Spongebob is like, 35. But it still doesn't change the fact that it reminds me too much of Spongebob. Gumball tries to save Mr. Robinson's life because he thinks that Mr. Robinson saved him, even though he didn't. Most of the gags wouldn't be out of place in a Spongebob episode. You have constant moments of Gumball trying to save Mr. Robinson's life, only for him to get berated because he constantly keeps bothering him. I will admit that Darwin and Anais trying to help Gumball at the end was pretty nice, but you still have an ending where Mr. Robinson doesn't appreciate Gumball in the slightest. But I thought the talent show act was pretty cool. Pretty meh overall. I will give the episode credit that it does add another animation style to the show. And much like other shows I've talked about in this ranking series, this is the first episode that has a musical number in it. Just wanted to let you know. Gumball and Darwin think the end of the world is coming, so they decide to do everything they've ever wanted within the time span of 24 hours. It's a pretty basic concept, sure, but I had a pretty fun time with this one. Seeing Gumball blow off Miss Simeon, his teacher, trying to marry Penny, his crush, wearing a perm for some reason. Gumball, why do you have a perm? It's just something I've always wanted to do. And finally getting Richard to jump in on this nonsense does lead to some pretty funny moments. Try scanning faster. A little bit faster. A little bit faster. A little bit faster. Scan successful. Yes! Item unrecognized. Please rescan. Insufficient scanning speed. Yeah! I thought it was a pretty fun time. It's a way more entertaining and funnier episode compared to the last one. And I thought it taught a nice lesson of living life to the fullest. Well, we've hit our first stinker. Gumball doesn't have any clothes to wear, so Richard gives him Nicole's wedding dress. And oddly enough, everyone starts simping for Gumball Pokemane style. Even Darwin falls in love with him. Ugh. I love you. 
This episode is too stupid for my taste. Everyone bowing down to Gumball is one thing, but to have Darwin be a fucking stalker is just... No. It's, it's, it's just no. I mean, there were a couple of jokes I did like. This one is one of the funnier jokes of the episode. But this is the first truly bad episode of season one. I mean, I think the song is pretty nice to listen to, but just cut out Darwin being a fucking weirdo and I might like it a little bit more. Okay, now we're talking. Gumball and Darwin have to get Anais's stuffed toy Daisy the Donkey back from Tina the T-Rex. Okay, we'll get it back. I like how we get to see other characters like Leslie, Juke, Hector, and finally Tina. There's some nice cuteness overload in this episode that I need to bring up. The third act is just awesome with the kids going over to Tina's place to get the toy back. There's some nice references to Jurassic Park. Darwin, keep absolutely still. Her vision is based on movement. That only works in movies. And I thought the final scene of the episode was pretty heartwarming, with Anais giving Daisy over to Tina because she needs it more than she does. I mean, she lives in a junkyard for God's sake. And maybe this ending would hold a little bit more water if it wasn't for the fact that Anais still has Daisy the donkey in her possession in the next couple of seasons, despite her saying this. I don't need her anymore. I've got Darwin and Gumball to look after me. <sighs> Group hug! Then why the hell do you still have the toy in the next couple of seasons then? It, you know what, forget it. With that nitpick aside, it's still a pretty great episode. I, I like this one. I like the expressive animation that Richard has in this scene. It looks pretty hilarious. Because Richard didn't get anything for Nicole's birthday, he makes Gumball and Darwin go to the gas station to get her a present. And while they're there, the gas station ends up getting robbed by a fingerprint. Look, 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 just, 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 just roll with it, okay? Who carries a spoon as his weapon. Okay, yeah, it's pretty stupid that all the guys are scared of a spoon, but I still found this episode to be pretty funny. It's way better than the dress episode, by a wide margin. And once again, the third act was pretty awesome. And that's something I've noticed. Every single third act of every single episode so far is pretty awesome. And once again, Nicole proves how much of a badass she is by saving the day. Sure, she accidentally gets sent to jail, but luckily they caught the robbers, so everything worked out okay. Gumball needs to save Darwin from Masami because Masami has plans to kiss Darwin at the treehouse that the girls hang out in. This episode takes me back as a kid. Except, I don't know why, because I've never partaken in activities like this before, so I don't know why. But I'm pretty sure this episode can be relatable for some people out there. I do like how Gumball is trying his damnedest to help out Darwin, but he constantly gets distracted by Penny. What a goddamn sip. A sip. Okay, you know what? I'm not gonna get on Gumball for this. You wanna know why? Because unlike Finn and Mordecai, he actually got the girl in the end. Oh shit, that's a spoiler. I like how the animation changes when Gumball and Penny are together. It looks really nice. Eventually, it leads to a messed up ending of Gumball and Darwin kissing each other for the second time. Like seriously, what the fuck? And it's all Banana Joe and Tobias's fault. Speaking of which, I do like that they formed this quartet of the bros. I wish these guys were there to help out Finn and Mordecai when they were simping, but eh, what can you do? This episode is nice and it teaches the most important lesson. Bros before hoes any day of the week. Okay, this is the episode where I start to realize that there are a lot of animation goofs in this show. Look, Nicole's missing her mouth and her whiskers in this shot. But honestly, I don't really care. I just threw this in there because... After he looks at Anais' painting... 
I don't I don't know why this is called a painting. It's clearly a drawing. Principal Brown comes to the conclusion that Nicole needs to stop overworking herself, Richard needs to get a job, and Gumball and Darwin spend the day with Mr. Small to get their destructive behavior under control. I love how each family member is trying their best to commit to what they're trying to do, but ultimately it proves frivolous as they just revert back to normal by the end of the episode. And then we get to the obvious ending that Anais loves her family just the way they are. Sure, it's pretty predictable, but it has a lot of heart, which is why I really enjoyed this one. Aw, damn it. Richard, Gumball, and Darwin have a lazy off. The bet is simple. If you can find anyone lazier than me in this town, I'll do your chores for a whole day. And if you lose, you'll do mine for the rest of your life. How does that sound? <laughs> After realizing that the bet is kind of challenging, Gumball and Darwin try to get Lazy Larry to participate in the bet. And the way they do this is by ruining his well-established lifestyle. And the worst part about these past couple of minutes is that they don't even use him for the fight. Like, what? Seriously, like, what? Eventually, the episode ends with Richard manipulating Nicole into thinking he's been working all day, and he lets Gumball and Darwin take the blame. Oh, my back! I've done enough today, my little fluffy soldier. I don't want you to move another muscle. Oh, thank you, honey. You dick! Nicole, you know damn well Richard is too fat and lazy to do chores. It's a pretty shitty Richard episode. Usually Richard's a pretty lazy yet well-meaning father, kind of like Homer Simpson. But in this episode, they simplified him to just being a fat lazy fuck. Not to mention the midpoint of the episode is pretty pointless. As I said before, they don't even use Larry for the final fight. So what was really the point of introducing Larry? It added nothing but just pointless filler. I mean, there are some decent jokes, like the characters trying to flash back to the summer of 83, but they get interrupted by Gumball. It all goes back to the summer of 83. Can you just tell it quickly? Why, that's a name I haven't heard since the summer of 83. Oh, nobody cares about the summer of 83! And I also thought some of the songs that were used in this episode were pretty nice to listen to. My personal favorite is the Sugar Rush song. But yeah, this episode is just pretty bad. Mom, I think I might be putting on weight. Oh no, it's just baby fat, dear. <sighs> oh, perhaps you have gained a little. Dude, just seeing Gumball get fatter and fatter as the episode progressed, <laughs> it's just funny to me. Carrie possesses Gumball's body so that she can eat all the junk food she wants. There are some pretty creepy yet entertaining moments that I really enjoyed. Not to mention it teaches a nice lesson of saying, don't let anyone force you to do something you don't want to do. I also think this episode does a good job of introducing Carrie. Help me Darwin! Ah! Ah! I can't do this on my own! You're gonna have to beat this ghost out of me! Then I'm a pacifist! <laughs> my ass you are. It's a pretty nice, I guess, Halloween episode? Can we call it a Halloween episode? Eh, why not? <laughs> Muffin top! <laughs> it's only funny when it's someone else's body! Oh, I'm gonna talk about that. Trust me, I'm just saving it for a special occasion. Okay, before I talk about the episode, I want you to look at Miss Simeon's texture. It changes from this shot to the next shot. It's like night and day. Everyone finds Principal Brown painted, shaved, wrapped in toilet paper, and found in Gumball's locker. So Miss Simeon has everybody locked in the classroom while she takes Nigel, that's his first name, to the nurse's office. Meanwhile, Gumball tries to find out who the culprit is. I think it's a great murder mystery parody. I like the different scenarios that Gumball presents as to why Penny or Rocky would commit the crime. The chase at the end of the episode was pretty entertaining, and the revelation actually makes a lot of sense. And I thought the episode would end with Miss Simeon getting away with committing the crime, 
but she gets punished by getting run over. Also, I noticed that there's two running over jokes in this episode. Oy, that's, that's, ew, that's, ew. For. You got ketchup all over me. That was the prank. <laughs> yeah, we did it because it's funny. No, it isn't. It's only funny when it happens to someone else. <laughs> Muffin top. <laughs> it's only funny when it's someone else's fun. That's basically how you petty mortals operate. It's all fun and games when it happens to another person, but if it happens to you, it's a problem. That wasn't very nice. You two should know better. What? You didn't tell him off for pranking us. You know it's too late for your father. That's messed up, but pretty accurate. Richard, Gumball, and Darwin start pranking each other. It's a pretty basic episode. Richard pranks them first, and then Gumball and Darwin start going all out, eventually leading to their pranks getting a little out of hand. It kind of reminds me of Muscle Man's pranking episodes from regular show. But I thought the third act was pretty fun. Although, you guys could just run out of the house to get away from Richard. It, it, it's that simple. Anyway, a pretty good episode. Even though I think Nicole is a little out of line by saying that the boys need to apologize to Richard. But hey, what she said earlier was messed up, but it's pretty accurate. How about a little kiss? Ha. <sighs> So who can I fire for all the damage you two did to the park? So randomly out of nowhere, Gumball and Darwin want to do karate. No, seriously, <laughs> that's how the episode starts. We really want to do karate. Olu, olu. So because the little bastards are annoying, Nicole bows down to their will. And after getting their karate gear, they make a vow to never take them off, which results in the entire school making fun of them. But they're too naive to see it at first. <laughs> Are you trying to get me in a wreck, you little shit? It's a pretty fun and relatable episode, as I can relate to Gumball and Darwin. Because when you're younger and you try to stand out from the crowd, some kids will make fun of you because you're different. And this episode teaches a valuable lesson about being yourself even if other people don't like it. And you should be friends with people that like you for you. We even get a nice little flashback of Nicole and Richard as children, showing that Nicole always had his back from day one. And finally, I think the ending of the episode is pretty solid, with Penny standing up to the rest of the kids after they made fun of Gumball. It's a pretty solid episode, even if the song in the middle kind of drags a little bit. Gumball gets kissed by Granny Jojo, which leaves him scarred for life, so Darwin tries to help him get over it. And while that's happening, Anais tries to take Granny Jojo's suitcase up to her room. The whole gist of the episode is just Gumball getting permanently scarred by getting a kiss from his grandmother. And that's it really. There are some good giggles in this episode, specifically relating to Anais's plot. I did it! You did what? I carried your suitcase up to your room! Oh, well, good for you, dear. Now bring it back down. My bus will be here any minute. But for the most part, I was just bored. I mean, I will admit the final act is fine, but it's nothing to write home about. In fact, now that I think about it, this episode reminds me too much of Brain Eraser from Regular Show. Hell, it even ends the same way. What did you guys do? What is this mess? I can't even take a shower around here without you guys screwing things up. Gumball, give me a hand with this bag! Okay. Ugh, it's not bad, but it's not great either. Gumball and the rest of his classmates get invited to a high school party, but there's a catch. But you all have to bring a date. Okay. Uh huh. So now Gumball has to find a date for the party, 
and eventually he lands a date with Tina the T-Rex. I just have one question. Everyone was forced to get a date for the party, right? So why is Darwin able to go to the party? He doesn't have a date. Look, look at him. Look at him just standing there. He, 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 he doesn't have a date for the party. What the fuck? And also, Miss Simeon and Principal Brown show up to the party too. You guys aren't my friends. You just trashed my parents' house. <laughs> Dear God, I totally forgot this was a character in the show. It's a pretty fun episode. I like how the party starts off lame because of these middle schoolers, but the second Principal Brown and Miss Simeon show up, the party gets lit. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. I also think the animation in this one is really good, with the different colors flashing on the screen. I also like this little moment between Penny and Gumball. The thing is, originally, Penny asked Gumball out, but he didn't get it as an invitation to the party. I don't know, just seeing these two interact, it's just, it's just so adorable, you know? I also need to note this, there's a moment where Rachel kisses Darwin on the cheek after he fixes up the house. When this happened, I thought there were going to be a couple down the line, but they ditched this concept entirely, and instead they shipped Carwin. It's Carrie and Darwin, in case you didn't know. I was very confused why they didn't make these two a couple, but eh, whatever. It's a pretty entertaining episode. This is the second episode that reminds me of a regular show episode, but I have a receipt. In that episode, it focused on Mordecai and Rigby trying to get a refund for this board game they purchased. And throughout the episode, they expose the game's flaws to the customers until the owner can give them a refund. It's basically the same case here. Gumball and Darwin try to get a refund for this game that's not compatible with their console. And throughout the episode, they try multiple tactics in order for Larry to give them a refund. They even sing some songs at one point. I've been treated so wrong, I've been treated so long, touch and But when all else fails, they turn to Richard. I will admit this episode is pretty entertaining on its own right, even if it reminds me of that regular show episode I mentioned earlier. The part that made me laugh my ass off the most was when Richard got involved, and he ends up losing to the manager, who looks like this. <laughs> so yeah, this episode had a bunch of laugh out loud moments that I really enjoyed. It's a pretty good episode. Dad, he sold us a shredder. <sighs> Come on and get your ass whooped. Again. Man, they did Bobbert so dirty in this episode. Bobbert feels isolated by his peers because he is a robot. I mean, he really shouldn't feel that way. I mean, everybody is either a animal, food, puppet, CGI monstrosity, Underpants, ghosts, pieces of paper, dinosaurs, clouds, flowers, balloons, giants, whatever the fuck Tobias and Principal Brown are, etc. So he shouldn't have to worry about being a real boy because nobody in this world is even human. Okay, excluding her. Everybody else is not human. Anyway, Gumball decides to give him some advice. First, it starts with Bobber imitating Gumball's voice but then he eventually decides to take over Gumball's life. I must admit the concept was pretty interesting, because as previous episodes have shown, Bobbert has always been a loner character. And I feel like they could have done so much with this concept, but then it just started going downhill immediately. We see Gumball lose everything just because he wanted to help someone out. I mean, the final act is kind of cool, but still, this episode is so, 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 so weak. This episode reminds me of Club Spongebob, just by the mere premise alone. After not listening to Miss Simeon, Gumball and Darwin travel through the Forest of Doom. 
a pretty predictable episode that does exactly what you would expect. Gumball pretends to act like he knows what he's doing, which results in the duo getting even more lost until they hit their low point and then eventually they make it to the picnic site. I will admit I did like Darwin saving Gumball's life, especially after the two recently got out of a fight, but still doesn't change the fact that this episode is predictable as fuck. Also, this creature reminds me of Mr. Gus from Uncle Grandpa. I mean, look at this. Am I wrong? Wait a minute, is that Eye of the Tiger? Well, I'll be damned. Anais wants to be dumb for a day, so Gumball decides to help her. And after she finally realizes how to be dumb, she takes Richard and Darwin away from Gumball, which results in him creating a race. A dumb race, to be specific. It just reminds me of the robot. Dare I say it's an exact copy of the robot. But at least with this episode, the dumb race was pretty fun to watch. And I will admit, Anais and Gumball hugging it out at the end of the episode was pretty nice. It's a better version of the robot. Gumball goes through great lengths to find out Darwin's secret. I relate with what Gumball is going through, especially since he told Darwin his darkest secret when they were in the bathroom. That's basically the gist of the episode, and it's pretty funny. There's a moment where Gumball tries to get information out of Anais, and this happens. Wait, 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 hold up, that, 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 that's, that's not supposed to be in here. And the secret was that Darwin and Anais uploaded a video of Gumball to the internet. Check this out. Gumball and Darwin get sent to the school counselor, Mr. Small, to learn about honesty. All of this happened because Richard ate their homework. Yeah, all of this happens because Richard ate their homework. The episode is just Gumball and Darwin trying to learn about honesty, but then they take it too far and then eventually the sock makes an appearance and it scares the ever-loving shit out of them. And I need to tell you, the sock does not make an appearance until 6 minutes into the episode. Just, just thought you needed to know. Also, they repeat the same joke they did back in the mystery, with Principal Brown and Miss Simeon flying out the window. I thought it was fine. Darwin gets taken away because the government thinks he's a genius. Because, as Anais puts it, so you put clever people on quarantine like there's some sort of contagious pathological disease. How come she wasn't taken away years ago? Like, she attends the same school that Gumball and Darwin go to. Anyway, Gumball decides that he could be just as smart as Darwin. <laughs> you see, I'm not gonna get on Principal Brown or the family for this because there's literally Two episodes all about how dumb Gumball is. So while Gumball's training with his brain, quite literally, Nicole and Richard decide to replace Darwin with... Rocky. This is even more fucked up given the fact that Darwin isn't the first goldfish that the Watersons have adopted. I thought this episode was pretty good. I like the training montage that Gumball and his brain go through. I especially love the song that's being played. Here, have a listen. I was a feeble-minded guy. I slip on ice to wonder why. Seeing the family be heartbroken about Darwin being taken away shows that he's more than just a pet, and he's an actual member of the family, which is honestly pretty sweet. So overall, I thought it was a pretty good time. Although it was a little bit confusing at points, more specifically, why didn't they take Anais years ago? But, I still think it's a good episode. Yeah. 
Gumball and Darwin keep a depressed Mr. Robinson in their attic. But don't worry, this isn't like modern Spongebob. The reason why Mr. Robinson is depressed is because his wife has been ignoring him. So Gumball and Darwin decide to hook them back up. I also like the side plot regarding Richard being paranoid because he thinks there's a ghost haunting the house, when in actuality, it's just Mr. Robinson. I like how Gumball and Darwin are actually trying their best to help out Mr. Robinson. They even go to extreme lengths of hurting themselves to make him smile. And unlike last time, Mr. Robinson actually thanks Gumball for helping him. So yeah, this is a pretty good Mr. Robinson episode with tons of funny and meme-worthy moments. Cheer up, Mr. Robinson. You know what I do when I'm feeling a bit low? I look at this. And this is the episode where I've come to a shocking discovery. Mr. Robinson's first name is Gaylord Robinson. Yeah, I can't wait to see how Twitter reacts to that name. Gumball and Darwin get sick and tired of being kids, so they literally wish upon a star to be adults. And then, puberty hits them like a fucking truck. Okay, <laughs> that's pretty funny. So the second they hit adulthood, they start to experience the troubles of being an adult. A pretty relatable episode, because I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be an adult too. Now I just want to be a kid again because, ugh, the adult life fucking sucks. Oh, I can't believe we lost our jobs. So this is being an adult, huh? No money, no job, crumbly apartment, rent overdue! I'm starting to feel personally attacked. And I like the clever twist where it's revealed that they're not hitting their growth spurts just yet, and it turns out they took some male supplement cereal that Richard purchased. A pretty hilarious and relatable episode. God, I wish I was a kid again. Oh, and the men's song is pretty catchy. At first, Gumball thinks he's going on a date with Penny. So Richard, Anais, and Darwin give him some advice. And then when he gets there, it turns out he was attending a funeral for Penny's pet spider. The first half of the episode is not that bad actually. I think it's pretty cool that the family members try to help out Gumball for the date. But the second and third half kinda sucks. As half of the episode is just Gumball acting like an idiot. I mean, I get it, this is the first time he's done something like this, this is the first time he's been in an environment like this, but it still doesn't change the fact that it's kind of a slog to watch. Not to mention the final act of the episode is pretty terrible. It had a solid start, but it really failed to deliver. I mean, I'll give this episode credit, we do see Anais's room. And I bring this up because this room completely disappears later down the line. The Watersons go to school on a Saturday so they can go to their clubs. But Gumball doesn't have a club to go to, so he tries to find a group that will take him in. But when the rejects come out of literally nowhere and ask him if he can join their club, he politely declines. So they decide to upload a humiliating video of him. So now the Watersons have to go back to school to stop them. I like the different clubs that each family member goes in because it's completely reflective of their personality. Nicole is known for having anger issues, so it's only fair that she's in the anger management club. Anais is the smart one, so she's in the physics club. Darwin is the fish with legs, so he's in the swimming club. And Richard's in the fantasy club because... Why not? I love the third act because the family decides to help out Gumball. And then, for the entirety of the third act, they use their skills from their respective clubs in order to get around certain obstacles. And I gotta say, it's pretty awesome to watch. And this episode tells us that Gumball's middle name is Christopher. Listen, blame Richard, he came up with the name. Gumball and Darwin try to make Richard's wishes come true. So the episode itself is pretty simple. 
Richard uses this wand that he got from a cereal box on a bunch of different deeds, and Gumball and Darwin give a helping hand. I will admit, this episode is pretty nice because these two are only doing this to make their father happy. Because when Richard was a kid, his dickhead of a mother said that magic is fake, which caused him to do this for the next seven years. It reminds me of that Ed, Ed, and Eddie episode, Tinker Ed, where in that episode, Kevin tells Jimmy that fairy tales aren't real, and the Eds decide to fake the existence of fairy tales for Jimmy's benefit. And unlike that episode, where it ended on a terrible note, I say this episode ends on a better and much funnier note. To put it simply, it's like Tinker Ed, but way better. Miss Simeon tries to befriend Gumball and Darwin. Another predictable episode. The only reason why Miss Simeon is doing this is because there's this best teacher award that she wants to get her hands on, but the only way she can do that is if she gets a recommendation letter from a student. I like that there's a little bit of background info we get from Nicole. As it turns out, Miss Simeon has been bullying her from when she was a baby to where she is now. And again, like other episodes from season 1, the ending is honestly the best part. It's Daisy the donkey on ice day! You promised to take me, and we're late! Oh, honey, I'm sorry. Mommy worked really late last night. That horrible mother! That horrible mother! Poor Nicole. Fuck you, you pink little shit! Gumball and Darwin play Dodger Dare and one of the dares requires them to launch a bowling ball onto the moon. And instead of that happening, it lands on Mrs. Robinson's head, which causes her hair to fall off. So Mr. and Mrs. Robinson decide to teach Gumball and Darwin a lesson. After doing every single deed properly, eventually Mr. Robinson's had enough of them. But Gumball and Darwin still want to help him. And why are they doing this? Because we love you, Mr. Robinson. God, this is almost SpongeBob SquarePants levels of creepy. Bye Squidward! Bye Mr. Krabs! Bye Squidward! You said bye Squidward twice! I like Squidward. So he tells them to clean his car, and in one split instant... So to avoid the consequences, they end up hiding in the attic. I thought this episode had some pretty humorous moments, unlike some Squidward torture porn episodes I know of. And I thought the twist where it turns out that every single family member was responsible in breaking Gaylord's car was pretty funny. <laughs> I still can't get over that name. And seeing the Robinsons go crazy at the end was pretty funny too. It's a pretty funny episode despite there being some cringe moments here and there. <gasps> it's funny how their mouths don't move. Gumball thinks he's been cursed because he's been getting a string of nothing but bad luck recently. I like this episode because it shows that clearly, Darwin is the smartest character out of the duo. Also, I think the final act is pretty cool. A pretty funny and entertaining episode. Mama. Did you hear that? He called you mom! Then I guess that makes you its dad. I'm gonna take this line and use it for later. Gumball makes this random thing called the gross jar. And after Richard accidentally puts it in the microwave, it comes to life. And it starts eating everything in sight. Yes, even members of the Watterson family. I mean, sure, it does remind me of that Spongebob episode where Spongebob nursed a baby scallop back to health. But I'd argue this is still a pretty funny and dark episode. I like how they build up the suspense in the third act. Seriously, they build up suspense better than horror movies these days. Actually, yeah, this makes for a pretty good horror movie parody. I just said I love peanuts. <laughs> yeah, peanuts. They taste so good. Gumball, I am a peanut. That's like me saying I like to eat cats. God, this world can be so confusing sometimes. Gumball's not getting any attention from his parents, because one works day and night, and the other one just sits on his fucking ass all day. So in order to make it up to him, Nicole decides to follow Gumball to school, 
and just embarrasses the shit out of him for the entire 10 minutes. I don't like this episode because I feel like they did Nicole's character very dirty. If a character like Richard did this, it would make more sense because he's an idiot and he isn't aware of his surroundings. But Nicole is very self-aware. So to see her embarrass her son all for the sake of giving him more attention is just stupid. And there are moments where she acts very out of character. For example, there's a moment where the nerds are making fun of Gumball in class and she just lets these heads roll. She doesn't even call them out for making fun of her son. Remember in the club episode when she says this? No, when someone picks a fight with one of us, they pick a fight with all of us. <laughs> I guess that doesn't mean jack shit compared to this episode. And then you have a terrible ending where Gumball humiliates himself further by trying to get on the cheerleading squad so that he can win Penny's heart because Nicole embarrassed him earlier. It's not funny and it really drags. This is honestly one of the worst episodes of season 1 by far. You know what? I don't think I'm gonna wear this anymore. Why? I thought it brought you good luck. Yeah, it does, but nothing's fun anymore. Gumball, just keep the goddamn helmet on. It doesn't matter how boring it gets after a while. Remember, there was a whole episode dedicated to you not handling bad luck for an entire day. So just keep the goddamn helmet on, you big-headed buffoon. Yeah, use a and I can't even be angry about it. Anyway, Gumball has this magic helmet that gives him good luck. But after getting sick and tired of it, Richard and Nicole get their hands on it. Look at what you've become! This stupid hat is driving you crazy! It's tearing this family apart! Look at you! You're behaving like animals! They are animals, sir! Don't be a wise ass! So eventually the three become Smeagol, and they fight over the helmet after getting a little taste of its good luck. So Darwin and Anais decide to throw it into the crusher, with Gumball following along. I really love this episode. I say this episode has a bunch of hilarious moments one after the other. Besides, I still got it. How do you know? My lunch is on the floor. Hey, who's the funny guy who did that? It's too heavy. Well, give me the helmet. It's no! It's a man's job. Here, you're just a little girl. You can carry me, though. Sometimes in life, you make your own luck. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure it's paper mache painted gray. What? And he's won the speedball! This isn't going to affect my chances, is it? Um, what do you think? And not to mention, I love the references to Lord of the Rings. A pretty fantastic episode that you should give a watch. Gumball and Tina end up getting into a fight, which results in Gumball getting a bruised eye because he crashed into a door while running away from her. So Nicole decides to talk to Tina's father while Gumball and Tina work it out. I will say that Nicole is a better mother here than she was in The Meddler, that's for sure. I like seeing the family members attempt to help Gumball with this situation. Whether it's Richard telling him to use the bunny hop, Darwin trying to give him some armor to wear, <laughs> like that shit's gonna work, and Anais really not helping all that much because she kind of started this whole fight the second she ran her little mouth on that phone. Yeah, to put it nicely, she's more of a troublemaker than a problem solver in this episode. And to be honest, you deserve to get your ass whooped. The chase scene was pretty fun, and the ending where Tina and Gumball eventually work out their differences is pretty cool. And seeing Nicole kick the shit out of Tina's father, it, 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 it's just crazy. I thought this was a pretty good season finale. God, what a season premiere. And it's hard to talk about this episode without mentioning the elephant in the room. Yes, the characters have went through a drastic redesign. 
It's like night and day. This is season one, and this is season two. And I'll say right now, I like the redesigns. They look really good. Now the premise of the episode is that each member of the Watterson family needs to watch TV for tonight. Gumball and Darwin need to watch TV because they're gonna appear on this show called Cutie Pets. Nicole needs to watch Win or Don't Win so she can answer one question and get a new microwave. What's wrong with their current microwave, you ask? Well, what's wrong with our microwave? Anais needs to watch Daisy the Donkey because they're going to introduce a new character. Sounds like that show's jumping the shark, am I right? And finally, Richard needs to watch TV because he's been binge watching a show in preparation for the finale. Out of all of them, I empathize more with Richard. Nicole, you can literally buy a microwave next time. Anais, you can watch Daisy the Donkey at a later date. Same thing goes for Gumball and Darwin. I need to mention that even though the show changed its animation style, it's still prone to making animation mistakes. For example, in this shot, I noticed that Richard's whiskers are missing. And there are some other examples. But anyway, it's a fantastic episode. It reminds me a lot of the Saw movies, with Anais manipulating everybody into leaving the house and stealing the remote away from Richard. Hell, even the way the episode ends feels like it's a parody of Saw with everyone slowly coming to the realization of what she's done. An easy god tier episode. And also, I love that they keep the flailing arms animation. I've always loved that. And also, any anime parody is going to be an easy W in my book. Gumball and Darwin tried to improve Hector's life after his mother declined their friend request on Elmer Plus which is basically this universe's version of Facebook. A solid episode that teaches the lesson of raising your kids better. You can be protective, sure, but don't be overprotective to the point where they don't have any freedom to do whatever they want. And once again, like every other episode from season one, the ending is pretty fun. Hey, that rhymed. Because Gumball and Darwin ride Hector's mom's witch brooms to stop Hector from destroying the town. A pretty solid episode. What? Nothing. It's just Hector so... <laughs> you're so... Uh, uh, Actually, you're more like... <laughs> oh, forget it! You're born to me. Well, you know what else is presumptuous? Your face! What's with the smug face? Nothing, but I think there might be a lesson in all this. You know, next time you want to judge other people's life choices, maybe you should take a long, hard look at you now! What? Oh, don't worry. I'm going to talk about that later. I'm just waiting for a special occasion. Hey look, Penny went through a redesign too. Anyway, after a hilarious opening, with Gumball being a dick, Gumball tries to impress Penny's dad so that she can come over to his house and study for their medieval assignment. But things start to go bad for him when Tobias comes out of nowhere and ends up being a cockblock. Honestly, the mid-portion of the episode kind of drags a bit, with Gumball constantly trying to get on Mr. Fitzgerald's good side. Also, that's Penny's last name, in case you were wondering. The third act with Tobias being a pain in the ass and a third wheel is honestly the best part of the episode. It's a little weaker compared to the first two episodes, but it had a solid beginning and end, so there's that. And there's a moment where it references Family Guy for some reason. I, I, I'm not kidding. Look. Ah. <sighs> ah. Yeah, I, 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 um, I still can't wrap my head around that. Nicole makes this chart on the fridge that measures the success of every single member of the Watterson family. And everybody is really engaged with this chart, to the point where they get upset if they're not in the same league as Nicole. Everybody is engaged except for Gumball, so Nicole decides to push Gumball to the limit so that he can be a success. Your chart is ruining this family! They're all behaving like animals! They are animals, sir! Don't be a wise ass. I can see why a lot of people don't like this episode, because Nicole really goes overboard in some of these cases. 
Like, waking your child up at 4 in the morning and going grocery shopping is one thing. But outright deserting your child in the desert? Yeah, that's a little too far. But I understand where the episode is coming from. Because there are some parents that are pretty strict with their children. And sometimes they do crazy outlandish shit that you don't agree with. So, in a sense, I kind of relate to this episode a little bit. Because I've had friends who had to deal with strict parents. And at least Nicole has said that she's not disappointed in Gumball. And she just wants him to reach his full potential. I don't mind this episode all that much. And I think the paintball game at the end of the episode was pretty awesome. Especially since they treat it like it's a war zone. So yeah, a pretty good episode. Also, I just noticed they used the song from the Genius episode. Okay, I was literally just editing through the episode, and then randomly out of nowhere, look. They just disappear in the next shot. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? Gumball becomes jealous of Leslie because of how close he is to Penny. So he does everything in his desperate attempt to get Leslie out of the picture. And it turns out that jealousy is a very real thing that consumes you. So Carrie does this exorcist bullshit, and then we see jealousy in its purest form. I had a really fun time with this episode. It's pretty funny, specifically because of how pathetic the Jealousy character is. Uh, curse this evil body. You should work out more. Uh. What's all this? Uh, plan B? Well then good luck finding me in Mexico! <laughs> The reveal that Leslie is Penny's cousin makes a lot of sense if you think about it. I mean, she's a peanut, he's a flower. Makes a bit of sense if you ask me. Also, when I was younger and I saw this effect that Carrie had, I thought you could wear your 3D glasses you got from the movie theater and she would pop out of the screen. Didn't work on my end. Maybe it worked on your end, I don't know. A pretty funny episode. Give it a watch. After Darwin gets his pen back, Gumball notices that it has teeth marks on it, so he comes to the conclusion that Banana Joe must have chewed Darwin's pen. And instead of letting it slide, I can't let this slide! Bro, get a new fucking catchphrase. He exacts, quote unquote, justice on Banana Joe. I think it's a pretty good episode as well. It teaches a solid lesson on lingering things that aren't a big deal, and I find it hilarious that Darwin has this mindset of turning the other cheek, but when he finds out that his homework got ripped up, he immediately goes to destroy Banana Joe's stuff. <laughs> I don't know, it's just funny to see the pacifist lose his shit. There's also the iconic scene of Banana Joe whistling while walking down the hall. And I just realized that this whistling is a reference to the Kill Bill movies. I can't believe it took me this long to figure it out. Especially since I watched these movies at a young age. But whatever. And then we get to the twist that the pen that Darwin gave to Banana Joe was actually Gumball's pen after all. Meaning that Banana Joe really didn't chew the pen. Hey Darwin, here's your pen. What? Your pen. Look, it's got your initials on it. It means the pen you lent Joe was my pen, not yours. And I was the one who chewed it. All this fighting for nothing when I had the pen in my pocket the whole time. <laughs> No, 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 you should kick his ass for this. Come on, y you can't let this slide. Can't let that slide, nobody should. A pretty solid episode. Oh, and this is the episode where things like bruises are heavily detailed. Like, cheese. This is what got us here in the first place! 
kind of reminds me of the last episode if I'm truly honest. In this episode, Gumball and Darwin get a cell phone. But it's not like the cell phones that you and I carry. It's one of those old brick phones. And Gumball immediately gets attached to it, even tossing out their alarm clock, computer, and numerous other things. Hey, keep it down, man! I don't want to miss a call! Okay. Gonna take like three weeks to drill this hole now. I don't care! After not getting a phone call, Gumball gives the phone over to Darwin, who immediately becomes addicted, and he starts texting this character Ojo all the time. Seriously, he becomes so addicted to the phone that when it gets confiscated by Mr. Small, he forces Gumball to go and get it. I think this episode teaches a valuable lesson about phone addiction, and more importantly, that we shouldn't let it rule our lives. But let's be real, phones will continue to own our lives until we end up in the grave. I guess the old saying is true, the things you own end up owning you. Hello? I know you're behind the door. No, no door here, bye. No, no, no. When Ojo comes over to destroy the Watterson house after Gumball was talking shit, it literally ends up being Space Invaders, with the characters losing lives and everything. Nice shooting, noob. It's the trash lift that's defective. Typical, blame the controller. Does that mean this is our last life? It's a pretty funny episode with a good message to boot. It does remind me a lot of the last episode, but it's still a fun episode in its own right. Richard ends up getting a job as a pizza delivery man. And what do you know, the fabric of the universe ends up on the verge of destruction because of this. The second he gets a job, everything ends up out of whack, to the point where Nicole is clearly not happy about this. It's like she's a Jedi who's noticed a disturbance in the Force. Then eventually we get to the third act where things really start to get out of whack resulting in the characters having different animation styles each time they get too close to Richard. It's honestly one of the greatest episodes of the entire series so far. And <laughs> it's so funny how the fabric of the universe is on the verge of destruction just because Richard got a job. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Nonsensical doesn't even begin to describe this. Ceciliana, come see what the stork brought us. Oh, he's beautiful. Uh, thank you so much. Here's a 20. Here we are, the very first official Halloween special of the amazing world of Gumball. And I think they did a great job with this one. Gumball, Darwin, and Anais go to a Halloween party. But the catch is, it's ruled by Ghost. Ooh. And hey, Carrie tags along. I wonder why. Look what you've done. You've completely turned into ghosts. Which means I can finally do this. Oh, now I see why. Even with that, it's a pretty fun Halloween episode, with Gumball and Darwin turning into ghosts and just messing around with the residents of Elmore. Come at me, bro! Give me your best shot! I'm an immortal ghost! I'm not gonna feel anything! Alright, you asked for it. <laughs> I forgot you were a ghost, too. Okay, they, um, uh, they, uh, they, they, they kind of stole that from regular show. Oh man, this is so cool! Dude, dude, punch me in the face! Okay! Ah! Yeah. I thought stuff's supposed to go through us! I thought the final act with all the ghosts trying to suck Gumball, Darwin, and Anais down into the spirit realm was pretty cool. And need I mention, I really love the animation and the colors in this one. So yeah, a pretty good Halloween episode, if I do say so myself. Gumball, Darwin, and Anais try to figure out why their family is so broke. And then the next thing you know, it turns into a treasure hunt. I really enjoyed this episode, despite it being a treasure hunt scenario. And I really like the little details in this one. 
like the fact that they make fun of mockbusters in the first couple of minutes. And that DVD is not even the real film. It's some mockbuster from the bargain bin. What's wrong with how to ratatouille your panda? They reference Legend of Zelda in a split moment. They reference the Philosopher's Stone. Missile launch codes, alien artifacts, a Philosopher's Stone, or something even bigger. And Gumball is keeping up the tradition of showing characters bruised and fucked up. And look, it's a female character that got bruised and beaten up. Wow, I wonder how Twitter will react. Anyway, I like the sense of mystery that the episode builds up. Because back then, the Watersons used to have a lot of money. And it made me very curious as to what they blew their money on. And it turns out they blew their money on a goddamn star. And who's to blame here? The internet, of course. Like the previous two times Richard blamed the internet for something. None of this would have happened if it wasn't for you! Uh, who are you blaming here? The internet? I couldn't help myself. It's the internet's fault. Every time I open my emails, this is what I get. Speaking of which, can anyone else feel that draft? I really didn't get Cartoon Network back then. Showing this to a seven-year-old was perfectly fine, yet showing a gay character is where they draw the line. Thank god they've evolved from that mentality, but back then, ugh, that this this was this was a major head scratcher for young Christian. Miss Simeon tries her damnedest to frame Gumball and Darwin to prove that they're the biggest scum of the earth. Now do I think Gumball and Darwin are bad kids? Considering the other shows I've watched, I've seen worse. They're not terrible kids per se, as they do go out of their way to help people. But sometimes, they can get out of line, if these previous episodes are anything to go by. Anyway, I don't know, it's kind of weird seeing Gumball and Darwin act so innocent in this episode. I don't know, it, it, maybe it's just me, but I'm so used to them causing mischief and doing stupid shit. And can you blame me? Anyway, after multiple failed attempts, Gumball and Darwin decide to frame themselves on purpose so that Miss Simeon won't lose her job and her relationship. And I will admit, that's a pretty cool gesture of them. I really do love the ending as Miss Simeon comes around and realizes that she was wrong about them. It's a pretty good episode. I really like it a lot. Uh, listen, these kids are decent children. There's nothing you can suspend them for. They don't fight, they respect school property, they don't steal. Oh, 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 oh boy. I can't wait to see how well that line holds up later down the line. You're embarrassed, aren't you? Oh my god, are you guys fans? I think you are, considering that this is another Legend of Zelda reference. For this episode, Darwin can't stand up for himself, which is pretty weird considering the fact that he has no issue standing up to Gumball, but whatever. So with the help of Gumball, he's able to use his words, but then Darwin starts taking it a little too far, to the point where he actually ends up hurting people's feelings. I'll say this much, seeing a mean-spirited Darwin is pretty fun to watch for me personally. Because Darwin has always been the most kind-hearted character who's put up with a lot of crap over the course of two seasons. So it's led me to wonder, what would it be like if he actually lost his cool for once? I mean, we've seen them in small doses like the banana episode, the phone episode, and the mustache episode. So if you've ever wanted to see Darwin lose his cool and act like an asshole for 10 minutes, then this is the episode for you. The little song in here was pretty nice to listen to, and then the final confrontation ends in a Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat kind of style, which I thought was pretty goddamn awesome. A pretty solid episode that teaches the value of speaking your mind, but not going overboard about it. And I just gotta show this clip. Wait a minute, pause. Darwin, I think this has gone far enough. Surely you understand what I'm trying to say to you. It's good to speak your mind sometimes, but what, what are you doing? I find this line to be rich with irony, given the fact that 10 episodes before, Gumball spoke his mind about Hector's mother and how terrible she was. Man. Ah! Wait, give me a towel. I'll block the pipe. 
Darwin, you don't wear pants. Just take one for the team. And also, you'll notice that his feet are unblurred. Which is weird, because back in Season 1, they were blurred out. I don't know, I, I just felt like bringing that up, because this is very inconsistent throughout the series. Anyway, after they trash the locker room, Gumball and Darwin make friends with Clayton, and they start to realize that he's a compulsive liar that they shouldn't hang out with anymore. Good job, team. Dude, I think you're a bad influence. You should've just told the truth. Darwin, you hang around Gumball all day, and he's known for lying. Yet, suddenly, Clayton is where you draw the line? Trouble? <laughs> no, we're fine, absolutely fine. No trouble here, bye. Are you lying? <laughs> oh, no, of course not. Right, you're lying. I'm coming home now. And also, I need to note, when Clayton transforms into Gumball, I'm pretty sure Darwin should see him transforming into Gumball. And then in the next scene, Darwin says, I'm so pleased you convinced me to give Clayton one last chance. <laughs> convinced you? But who convinced me? You saw Clayton transform into Gumball. Like, what the hell? The episode is just a rinse and repeat of Clayton saying he won't lie, and then he ends up lying, and then Gumball and Darwin try to break off the friendship, and then eventually the skull guy that Gumball made up at the beginning of the episode comes to life, and then he ends up chasing our heroes throughout the school, and what do you know, it turns out to be another lie by Clayton. Ugh. I thought the final act was pretty cool though. The episode begins with Gumball and Darwin playing bet together, until Bobber comes along, and it's revealed that he doesn't have experience playing games with the other kids. Can I join your game? Of course you can. As long as you don't go wacko crazy like you did last time. So after losing a bet, Bobber ends up being Gumball and Darwin's slave for 24 hours. Imagine if the robot was black. I'm pretty sure everybody would think that this whole thing was racist. But given the fact that the robot is white, it's cool. And I, I, I don't know. I just thought about Twitter there for a second. I just thought about... When I read that synopsis, I just thought, I wonder what Twitter would think. I know this is pretty random, but I'm looking back at previous episodes, and I've noticed that in this episode, Gumball's on a stack of books. But he wasn't on a stack of books in episode 6. I'm way off track. Anyway, I found this episode to be way better than the robot episode. Sure, it's pretty predictable, with Bobber taking everything Gumball says quite literally, to the point where he ends up getting rid of all the teachers. Where is everybody? Hey, what are you still doing here? School's canceled today, there's no teachers. But eventually this not giving a fuck mentality starts to bite Gumball in the ass at the end of the episode. Bobber, you don't take orders from anyone now, alright? What the? What's your problem, man? Following command. Bobber, terminate Gumball. Oh yeah, uh, delete that from your memory. Command denied. Robert, you don't take orders from anyone now, alright? And I gotta say, the library scene is just freaking hysterical to watch. Dude, I've got a plan. It involves me running out that door. The problem is only one of us survives. What? What are you doing? I'm waiting until it gets to three. Shall I get that super strength you get in life-threatening situations? <laughs> Not gonna happen. So, I guess it's time for some good last words, huh? A way better version of the robot, although I do find it weird how the roles reversed, because in the robot, Gumball wanted to help Bobbert, and Darwin was just there. And now in this episode, it's Darwin who wants to help Bobbert, while Gumball just wants to take advantage of having a robot for a slave. Pretty weird, huh? Richard hits Santa Claus with his car. But for some reason, he looks like a homeless guy. Maybe the car knocked the magic out of him. I don't know. Anyway, Gumball, Darwin, and Anais try to help Santa with his memory loss. Meanwhile, Nicole tries to tell them that Santa Claus isn't real because for her entire life, she sent her Christmas letters to the South Pole instead of the North Pole. <coughs> okay, that's actually pretty clever. And while that's going on, Richard tries to get back on Santa's nice list. It's not the greatest Christmas episode I've seen, but it certainly isn't a bad one. There are some pretty good jokes in here. Come on, puss! What? Well, I don't think it's right to give kids whatever they want or they end up spoiled brats. Like this one. 
<laughs> All I want for Christmas is world peace. Well, that's just impractical. Can I go on your lap now? Nope. Can I have my cookie now? No! Oh, wait. It was just a weak Christmas episode. And that shocked me considering the Halloween episode was fantastic. But this one, it didn't really click with me. Richard gives Gumball a watch, and since he doesn't want it, he gives it to Darwin, who ends up giving it to Martin Fingelheimer. So the whole gist of the episode is Gumball and Darwin going through numerous attempts to get the watch back from Martin. But after Richard reveals that he didn't want the watch, and he just wanted to ditch it onto his kids, the two tell Martin that he can keep it. And then in a split instant at the end of the episode, it turns out that the watch is worth a lot of money. $700 to be precise. And so this leads Gumball, Darwin, and Richard to go after Martin, who plans to sell the watch and get the money. I found it funny that Gumball was able to do this trick with the watch. Deal. Now check your hand. What? This one? Or this one? Now check your I want you to have it. Check your hands. You keep it. Mmm. Check behind your ear. You keep it. Now check inside your pants. But I don't wear any. But overall, it's an alright episode. It makes for decent background noise. And I like how Gumball and Darwin, and by extension Martin, come down to the conclusion that the watch is not worth killing each other for $700. So they decide to split it. But then this happens. Again, an alright episode. Because Gumball is sick and tired of the modern lifestyle, he invites Idaho over to his house to teach the family to live a simpler life. Even though they didn't want to do it in the first place. But eventually, the family has grown accustomed to living outside. Well, everybody except Gumball who ends up going inside the house playing video games and eating pizza. Ironic, given the fact that he was the one that was sick and tired of the modern lifestyle, and now he's going back to relive the modern lifestyle. I thought this episode had a ton of hilarious moments in it. No, it's a free world with no electricity, no cars, no supermarkets, and especially no TV. Tooth Fair accepts change. <laughs> suck the poison out and you'll be just fine. Yeah, chill out, people. It's only a wasp sting. You just gotta suck the poison out. Ah, <sighs> That's not how you deal with a wasp sting. It also teaches a nice lesson of not forcing your personal beliefs or lifestyles onto other people. Wait, what were you doing playing video games leaving this outside all night? You! Hypocrite? Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. I hated this whole lifestyle from the moment I turned off the TV. And why did you force us to keep it up? Because I got principles. It just turns out I can't live by them. <laughs> so funny, yet so stupid. And also, I don't like this song. Aberdeen in the wheel in the field Potato Said. Uh, but if it wasn't true, there's no point in you taking piano lessons. You only have four fingers. It's a waste of your dad's money. Okay, this episode made me realize how much of a dick Gumball turned into in season two. For example, this episode and the other episode, Colossus, shows him being needlessly judgmental towards people's lifestyles for no reason. He was never like this in season one, so I don't know why they turned him into this in season two. Anyway, after Gumball rightfully gets his ass kicked for making fun of Tina, he gets pissed off at Darwin for flaking on him. And this sucks because the kids have a lot of things to do today. They have to get their chores done and also look after Richard because he's on anesthetics. 
Similar to the last episode, it has a bunch of funny moments in here. For example, Gumball and Darwin getting at each other's throats, which on paper should be very annoying, but they made it quite humorous. That wasn't letting you down. This is... <laughs> Apologize. Never! Apologize! This is your last chance. <gasps> And seeing Anais get her brothers to forgive each other was pretty cool too. But I say the third act is honestly the best part. With Anais trying to get Richard back home because he got out earlier, Darwin trying to stop Nicole at every turn, and Gumball cleaning up the house. I thought they would get away scot-free, but luckily they don't. I had the weirdest dream. Darwin burned the kitchen. Gumball smashed the computer. I'm pretty sure I drove the car into a swimming pool. And at some point, I remember nibbling a couple of people. <sighs> Flaker. I thought this episode was pretty good. Hey, Richard runs like Gumball. After an incident that really goes to show how stupid Richard is. Don't worry. There's an explanation for why he's so stupid. Granny Jojo, yeah, you remember her, comes back to take care of the family. And by that, I mean she becomes so overbearing to the point where the family, excluding Nicole, can't take care of themselves anymore. I thought some of the different techniques that Granny Jojo used to scare the shit out of the kids were too realistic for my taste. lesson showed that nobody is safe the moment they leave their house. Uh. And this lesson shows that nobody is safe around windows. I will admit I did relate to this episode a lot because this is something that parents will often do to their children. They'll traumatize and scare the shit out of them until they become heavily reliant on their parents. This is why Richard is the way that he is, because Granny Jojo raised him by scaring the shit out of him and having him rely on her. I mean, think about it. This is the same woman that told Richard that magic didn't exist back in Season 1. So, yeah. I did like that Gumball comments on overbearing parents. I did like that a lot. The third act is pretty fun to watch, and I like the way each character remembers. I think this episode is pretty eh, but it did have some solid commentary. Gumball and Darwin have to deal with the pain in the ass that is Terry, a paper teddy bear hybrid person, who constantly keeps preaching about germs and tries to teach Gumball and Darwin how harmful they can be. And what do you know, there's one specific germ that tries to infect Gumball. Uh, he got a high five from Penny three months ago and refused to wash it since. Don't tell me you haven't showered in 90 days. Of course I've showered, I'm not an art student. The fuck is that supposed to mean, you blue little shit? Oh my god, I just realized something. Terry tried to warn us about COVID. And we didn't listen. We didn't listen! Stan, get in the car, we have to evacuate! We didn't listen! If you want a PSA on how dangerous germs are, or you just want to scare the shit out of your kids for 10 minutes, then this episode is the best example to go by. Gumball and Darwin rush back home to spend time with Anais by watching this dumb movie they purchased. But they seem to run into every single obstacle that comes their way. Gumball, Darwin! What's up, guys? Hey! Rich? Did you just call me Rich like it was a question? Oh, trust me. He becomes important later in the series. But what about the episode itself? I say it's pretty good. I like seeing the brothers try to hang out with their little sister, but they literally bump into every single obstacle that comes in their way. And I also like this little moment with Richard trying to say the right thing to Anais when she's feeling insecure. I also like this reference to the Spongebob Squarepants episode, Pre-Hibernation Week. No! What have you done? We'll never find it! It'll be like looking for a piece of hay in a needle stack! It's gonna take hours! 
hours. Find the hay in the needle snack. And there's also a funny reference to My Little Pony. I think her horror movie brain got traumatized by an overload of pony cuteness. I thought it was a hardcore horror movie fan, but I was living a lie. Tell me, is it wrong for a punk rock chick who lives in a haunted malevolent mansion to be touched by the magical friendship of a pony? Funny stuff. Wow, you guys weren't wrong. This episode sucks. The basic premise for this episode is that Gumball and Darwin are being punished for calling Richard stupid. The problem with this episode is that Anais and Nicole don't face any ramifications for being total bitches to Gumball and Darwin. And again, this is another episode where the mother decides to cut their children off of basic living necessities to teach them a lesson. Why can't you just, I don't know, tell them to go to their rooms until they're ready to apologize? Cutting them off from basic living necessities is just something that I don't get. Remember when Nicole said this in season one? Oh, silly. There's nothing you can do that will ever stop me loving you. Come here. <laughs> I guess that was just a blatant fucking lie on her part. And Anais, you acting like a dick to your brothers is unacceptable too. So you think it's just Nicole and Anais that are intolerable to deal with, right? Nope, Gumball's a dick too. This is something I talked about briefly, but Gumball just becomes straight up unlikable in some of these episodes. I don't know why, but they started making him into an unlikable asshole in season 2. And this character trait of Gumball would only get worse as the series progressed. The middle portion of the episode is just unbearable to watch, mainly because, I don't know, child neglect isn't funny. Maybe if it were over exaggerative it would work, considering that this is a cartoon, but it's not. So, is there anything good in this episode? I mean, the song that Richard sings is pretty nice to listen to. And the message of parents seeing their kids no longer depend on them since they're growing up is relatable for the most part. And the third act is okay, even though it's a little bit rushed. So yeah, this is a pretty terrible episode. Also, I just have one question. Is it really hard to animate whiskers onto Richard? Like, look, look, look at this. Look, 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 look at these pictures. Missing in multiple separate scenes. Like, what the fuck? Hey, maybe 2025 will be the year when the movie comes out. As for the plot itself, I'll just let Darwin say it. It was a dream! I didn't kiss Penny! It wasn't real! I know. But I just can't help hating you! You hurt my feelings! You hurt your own feelings with your own brain! You're being irrational! I know! And that's really all there is to say about this episode. It's just Gumball getting pissed off at Darwin for kissing Penny in his dream. You know what? Play that clip from Long Beach Griffey. After everything we fucking been through, you got some fucking nerve. Man, what the fuck is you talking about, bro? You fucking other bitches in my dream. Right in front of me. I hate you. Scoot over, bitch. I'm going to sleep so I can fight this bitch. What a goddamn s <sighs> Okay, look. I know I said I wouldn't get on Gumball for being a simp because he does get the girl in the end. But yeah, his simping levels are through the goddamn roof in this episode. As he thinks that what happens in his dream automatically transpires into real life. And the middle portion of the episode is just uncomfortable to watch because Darwin tries everything he can to make it up to Gumball, and Gumball is still stubborn. It's not funny, it's just unpleasant to watch. The only thing I liked about this episode was the end portion, where they travel into each other's dreams. It leads to some pretty funny moments. but it automatically gets ruined by this shitty ending. Uh, <laughs> Why did you make me get 
just sussy! Get over it, dude. It's just a dream. Yeah, it's not that great of an episode. Granted, it's not as bad as the last one, but it's still not good. Darwin gets sick and tired of being Gumball's sidekick. So to speak. So after a bit of back and forth, Gumball finally lets Darwin be the leader, and he lets him deal with the situation of Tobias taking their game. I mean, the concept itself does make sense, because Darwin always follows Gumball around on his crazy adventures. It's been that way since season 1. And I guess it is interesting seeing Darwin take the leadership role, but they barely do anything with it. It just ends with Darwin kidnapping Tobias's mom, and then eventually the two decide to take her back. I mean, it does lead to a nice moment where Gumball says that he doesn't see Darwin as his sidekick, but more as his guardian. And yeah, that does make sense. Darwin always tries to lead Gumball down the right path. And there's a pretty funny moment where they pretend that Tobias's mom is homeless when they're walking down Main Street. So conflicted. I'm glad this is working, but I'm really disappointed in mankind right now. Oh, oh, hold on, I've got some change for you. Just ignore him and walk faster. It's a decent episode that explores the dynamic of Gumball and Darwin's relationship. It's school picture day, and every picture that Gumball takes ends up being horrible. So now he tries to look good before 3pm to take his last photo. I'll say this much, this episode has a better set of jokes compared to the last one. Important thing is to smile with your eyes. That makes absolutely no sense. This, this is horrific, horrific, isn't it? Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you crying or jiggling? I don't know anymore. Are you serious? If you were drowning and this came to the rescue, you'd swim downwards. <sighs> you made me do this. Uh, ow! Darn it! Uh, face me like a man! Uh. uh. Are you done? Because I'm late for math. But then eventually we get into the third act of the episode, where Gumball ends up looking like this. How does it look? And I'll say this much, this won't be the last time we see realistic facial expressions on Gumball or his family members. The third act mostly drags out how weird Gumball's face looks. And it seems like Banana Joe's getting revenge on Gumball for ruining his school photo, but not much happens outside of a quick joke. Right? For the first time in my life, I'm actually early. Oh, and the episode ends on this note. <laughs> Even with my criticisms aside, it's a pretty humorous episode. Richard and Mr. Robinson end up in a feud with each other. So naturally, this leads Gumball and Darwin to be in the middle of it. Up until they eventually try to settle the beef between the two, because if things get out of hand, the two could potentially go to prison. I'll say this right now, I did not know this was a reference to Justin Bieber when I first saw the episode. Well then, how would you like your radio tune to young people's music? Seeing Mr. Robinson and Richard constantly get back at each other was pretty fun to watch. But after the constant fighting, eventually Gumball puts the two of them in a saw-like scenario, with them being trapped in the garbage can. And can we please acknowledge this scene of Mr. Robinson and Richard bonding? Can we acknowledge that? Because I don't think this will ever happen again. And the third act with Gumball and Darwin chasing after the wrong garbage can because they suspected that Mr. Robinson and Richard were in there was pretty fun to watch too. I think this episode was pretty great, all things considered. Don't worry, I'll use my rollerblading skills to avoid it. <laughs> okay, remember how in the pilot Alan and Masami were going out? It's kind of weird how they shifted that to Alan and Carmen going out. I mean, I personally wouldn't want to go out with a girl that could kill me just by one prick. But anyway, Gumball and the other students get sick and tired of their relationship because of how perfectly sweet they are. Carmen forces Gumball to spark it up a notch. Gumball! 
Bimbo Waterson might be a lot of things, but he is not a cheap, corruptible bimbo! But when that doesn't work, they end up separating. So now Gumball has to help them get back together, and he gets help from Asami, who has ulterior motives. Look, I'm really sorry. I don't know why I said all that stuff. Because you're a gutless coward who has to ruin other people's lives? Because he's too much of a chicken to ask penny out? You're so perceptive. I'm surprised you didn't see this coming. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what Gumball's transformed into. I thought it was a pretty solid relationship episode. Which is saying something considering the fact that I don't like romance to begin with. It's pretty sickly sweet how Alan and Carmen come back together at the end of the episode though. If Alan was a cheese ball, I'd want seconds. I love you, Carmen. I love you, Alan. Blech! So sweet, yet so cringe. Oh, and the storm that Masami creates at the end of the episode is pretty cool as funk to watch. But if you reinflate, you could have a shot with Masami. I don't think I have the strength to inflate. Thanks, Gumball. Whatever, man. Wow. They actually made a blowjob joke. <laughs> Holy shit. Gumball and Darwin end up procrastinating instead of studying for their math test. So what do you do when you have a test coming up that you didn't study for? Well, it's pretty simple, really. Cheating! Did you really think you could get away with this? To be honest, yeah, I thought we could. I have no idea what went wrong. So yeah. Gumball and Darwin get sent to detention, and to make sure they don't get their asses whooped, they end up working for this guy named Julius by getting him the stuff he needs to break out. Fun fact, this is the fifth time that Gumball's had detention. God, he's been in detention five times? Jeez, you would think he would be knowledgeable enough at this point. Throughout the episode, I've noticed some references to Star Wars Episode 5. You have failed me for the last time. Oh, come on, we're supposed to be studying. You have failed me for the last time, Admiral. The Simpsons. What do you think? I don't know. I think we look a bit too old for young offenders. Maybe. Perfect. And for some reason, my hair and ear form an M and a G. And Thelma and Louise. <sighs> As for the episode itself, I like how they paint detention as a prison. And I think the song in here is well sung too. And overall, I think it's a good parody of Shawshank Redemption. While it's not an exact parody as there are some changes here and there, it's still parodying the exact concept. Darwin the first, so that's where you are hiding. Wait, I thought you said that Darwin the first left to live a happier life on a farm with other fishes. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you did. Just like I said before, this makes them replacing Darwin in the genius with Rocky even more fucked up. You don't know what you're doing! Yeah, because you didn't write any instructions. And what you did write is spelt wrong. Dodds are dar? Oh, I have things to say. Many uses of the word what, a pinch of the word the, and just a cosmic boatload of the word fuck. So, no time to waste. What the fuck? Okay, I know this isn't a big deal, but this is a retcon, because back in season one, they spell Dodger Dare correctly. Anyway, remember when Gumball and Darwin played Dodger Dare back in season one? Let's make a whole episode dedicated to it. So Gumball and Darwin come across their old game, and they make a conscious effort to never play it again. But sadly, Nicole, Richard, and Anais begin playing it, so now they have to play the game and finish it. A pretty outstanding episode that really utilizes the concept to its fullest potential. It kind of reminds me of the movie Jumanji with Robin Williams. Rest in peace. Give this episode a watch if you haven't already. You won't be disappointed. Nicole and the rest of the family go shopping. 
and the children, being the greedy little sack of shits they are, want a treat. But when Nicole won't give it to them, they go through extreme measures to get what they want. They even get Richard involved at one point. Until eventually, Nicole can't take it anymore, and she finally reaches her limit. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Yeah, you guys are right. This episode is pretty bad. The kids act like Caillou in this episode, acting like a bunch of spoiled little brats when they don't get their way. Richard is also pretty bad too, as he tries to teach the kids how to shoplift. And Nicole, while she was tolerable in the first half, she ends up turning into a murderous psycho in the third act. And maybe this whole thing would be passable if the kids actually learned their lesson. I mean, granted, they do apologize to Nicole, but they still get their candy at the end of the episode. So what the fuck? Yeah, this episode is pretty bad. I, 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 don't, I don't recommend it. Have you ever noticed that nothing in this world is set up as it should be? I should be more important. I should be the one with the sidekick and exciting adventures. I'm more handsome, richer, and more colorful than you guys. And yet, it's like I'm the supporting character of my own life. Well, you had your chance to join the duo back in season one, but you kept charging them money every time they hung out with you. So I can understand why you're degraded to being a background character. Gumball and Darwin try to find out who in Elmore Junior High sent them an anonymous message. I had a fun time seeing Gumball and Darwin interact with all the school characters one by one. And it turns out the one person that sent them that message was William, the eyeball with wings. <laughs> what? Seeing this eyeball go to extreme lengths to kill Gumball and Darwin, all because they told him that they didn't want to hang out with him? is crazy but trust me there is a character that's crazier than him we'll, we'll we'll get to her later don't don't you worry i promise we will we will get to this this thing later it's an entertaining watch i'll say right now that this is a step up compared to the last episode oh god damn it Darwin tries to make amends with Banana Joe after discovering that he's pissed off at him and Gumball. Gumball isn't cool with this in the slightest because he and Darwin were supposed to play a new game over the weekend together. That's about the only thing I like in this episode. Overall, this episode sucks. It's just Gumball acting uncharacteristically selfish by caring more about a video game than his weekday friend. His words, not mine. I like Banana Joe. He's like my favorite fruit. But I'm not gonna ruin the gaming weekend of the century for a weekday friend. You're a douchebag. And then in the later half of the episode, he acts like a fucking baby. What the- Jesus, you're 12 years old. Grow up. And it turns out the whole reason why he's acting this way is because he wanted to spend more time with Darwin. Play the clip. Don't you get it? It's about us. I just wanted to spend some time together. I guess you don't feel the same. You guys spend every single second, minute, hour, day, week, month, and year together. What are you talking about? And while Gumball and Darwin are bitching and arguing, Banana Joe ends up hurting himself when he tries to lift a weight. This episode is terrible. Moving on. Why don't I have a nickname? But Gumball is a nickname. Not a new one. Also, I want you to remember this line for me because I'm going to bring it up later. Because of Richard's laid-back attitude, everybody in Elmore starts to take advantage of it. And then they crash at the Watersons' house. Which is fine at first, it's, it's passable, it may be a little chaotic, but it, it's manageable. Until the Watersons end up getting kicked out. 
I think the episode gives a solid message on how freedom is a wonderful thing, but when you have too much of it, it becomes utter chaos. I don't really have much to say about this one. It's a mid-tier episode. But I will admit, the ending is pretty awesome. With Nicole coming home and setting these bitches straight. You're going to clean this place until it looks better than when you arrived. Then you will leave and never come back. Or what? That was awesome. <sighs> Too bad the rest of the episode is just mid. Do you guys remember this? <laughs> Let's make a whole episode dedicated to it. Gumball and Darwin try to understand Juke's language. That's it. Skip. Gumball and Darwin make a home movies with their family members and their friends. It's a pretty fun episode, seeing each character's segment ranging from Ojo's cheat codes, Tobias pretending to be cool, an animal documentary on Richard, making a ninja movie, or my personal favorite, <laughs> makes for some pretty entertaining moments. Good job you guys, you managed to redeem yourself. And you managed to fuck it up once more. Good job. Sarah the Ice Cream Cone claims that Gumball and Darwin are pretty hardcore. And... I'll just let Gumball say it. It'll save us the guaranteed shame of being out it later on if I just tell you right now that we are absolutely not hardcore. Yeah, let's face the facts. Some meathead will hear us claim that we're hardcore and then they'll come and kick our butts. Thanks, but no thanks. And let's get back to the tour. Yeah, that's basically it. A bunch of douchebags come over to challenge Gumball and Darwin to a contest, and then Gumball and Darwin reluctantly participate. It's probably the most forgettable and basic episode in the show's history. In fact, it reminds me of that South Park episode, Butt Out, where Kyle recommends to Stan and Kenny that they should step out of this situation while they're ahead. You guys, I think we should bail out of this right now. Huh? I just know where this is heading. It's going to end up with the whole town taking this too far and us having to talk about what we learned to change everyone's minds. And I say we just stop it right now and go play cards or something. So I'm not going to waste much time on this episode, especially since this isn't even Sarah's debut episode. She appeared back in the banana episode. The only thing to note about this episode is that this is where she becomes a crazy deranged stalker. Next. <laughs> There's no ghost in this video. It's just a car driving down a road. Oh, so that's what they were watching. <laughs> that's funny. Gumball accidentally ends up posting his reaction to the internet. Hmm. And because of that, he becomes a living, walking meme. So he decides to track down the internet and have him take down the video. Now I know what you're gonna say. Christian, the internet is a thing, not a person. You tend to forget, this is the amazing world of Gumball. Anything is possible. Hell, they even have an episode dedicated to the world itself. So, you better get ready for that episode. As for the episode itself, I thought it was pretty fun. Especially the later half of the episode, where Gumball and Darwin try to confront the internet themselves. And he tries to stop them at every given opportunity. And I like how the internet is portrayed as a basement dwelling virgin that lives at his mom's house. <laughs> That's pretty funny. And also, it's pretty noticeable that he's played by Tobias. You've gone kind of viral, dude. You're famous. Think about the freedom of speech. Apart from the two thirds of the world that don't have it. All right, Gumball, you redeemed yourself. Now, make sure you stay strong until the season finale, please. Mm -hmm. 
Gumball, Darwin, and Anais discover this letter addressed to Nicole. So they formulate a plan to get rid of the guy that sent it. This is another good episode. I thought they utilized the episode's concept pretty well. I like the characters portraying each part of the plan. And it turns out that Daniel Leonard, the guy who they thought was trying to take Nicole away from them, is a brand of cosmetics. <laughs> good stuff. I also like this little gag. Why don't we take bikes? Because it's way funnier to watch you try to run. <laughs> Uh, it's so stupid because Anais doesn't run like this, but whatever. An episode that focuses on all the inanimate objects of Elmore. A really fun episode that takes the attention away from the Watersons and the side characters and focuses on the inanimate objects as I've said before. There are some moments that are pretty funny, some moments that are pretty creative, some moments that are really weird. And some moments that are pretty interesting. So yeah, the world of Elmore is pretty goddamn good. Now, let's get on to the last episode of the season. God damn, what an episode, am I right? So right off the bat, the episode automatically makes callbacks to the first season. They even make fun of season one's character designs. But then eventually we get into the plot. I'm afraid I have some not very shocking news. It appears Gumble and Darwin have to restart school from kindergarten. What? Why? Because all you do at school is argue about your little problems and aggravate students and staff members until they go nuts and chase you through the halls. None of which makes for a decent education! <laughs> uh, listen, these kids are decent children. There's nothing you can suspend them for. They don't fight, they respect school property, they don't steal. That one didn't age quite so well. Ha <laughs> ha! Told ya! The Watersons end up facing the consequences of their actions from season 1 and 2. At first they try to fix their problems, but when they can't do it, they just decide to make things even worse. An easy god tier episode. I like that it has strong continuity from season 1 and 2. I also like this nifty little detail where they keep adding flashbacks for each thing they've done in the past. It's really fun to see. It reminds me a little bit of regular show's second to last episode, Cheer Up Pops. Because there's a specific moment where they make references to every single adventure that the park crew has been on. And when I was younger, I really thought this was the end of the amazing world of Gumball. Sure, it's kind of depressing, but it teaches a valuable lesson that sometimes you can't run away from your problems forever. And when you do that, your problems will get bigger and 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 bigger until eventually the whole town drives you into a corner as they try to kill you. And more importantly, I love how it gives the big fat metal finger to the status quo as God in this episode. A fantastic episode that you definitely should give a watch. Now, let's move on to Season 3. You guys remember what happened in Season 2's finale? Well, throw that in the garbage. None of that applies anymore. Anyway, I've noticed that Gumball and Darwin's eyes are a little bit smaller compared to how they were in Season 2. But that's not the only thing that's changed. Gumball and Darwin's original voice actors have gotten older, which means their voices have changed a lot. It was a bit noticeable in some cases of Season 2, but it's way more noticeable in Season 3. Here, I'll play some clips back to back. But technically, you rented it with your money. The money I have to go and earn to feed you kids. The kids you decided to have. They wouldn't care about a handsome bachelor, 12 years old who likes world cinema, fine dining, extreme sports, and long romantic walks on the beach by moonlight. Are you serious? If you were drowning and this came to the rescue, you'd swim downwards. Okay, we got off to a shaky start, but if we just pull together and stick to this new plan, I'm sure things are going to go our way. Yeah, dude, I've been 12 for like... Forever now. He didn't understand a word I said and told me he doesn't speak fax machine. No, this one's red. It means urgent. Red, 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 red
an envelope. It's really hard to read, actually. She's not my girlfriend! What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I know. I'll just run away and hide forever. You don't understand. For my whole walking life, I've had to keep my mouth shut, having to deal with everyone's annoying little habits. But now, I can say what I like. Sorry, man. At least you know if Phantom Doctor doesn't work out, you can get a job as a test dummy for a cosmetic surgeon. I don't know. What are you pointing at? No. <laughs> Look! Half price on double chip cookies! That's like quadruple chocolate! <laughs> So as a way to give these actors a proper send-off, we have a whole episode dedicated to Gumball and Darwin's voices changing. It's a pretty relatable and hilarious episode that gives a respectful send-off to the original voice actors. The rap number in the middle is pretty catchy, and there are some nice animation moments in there too. And the most important message to get from this episode, please enjoy and embrace your childhood while you still can. Because as it says in the song, life can get pretty tragic when you're an adult. And trust me, it, it, it's been, it's been fucking hell, I'll, I'll tell ya. And we get introduced to Gumball and Darwin's new voice actors. What was that? <gasps> Dude, what's going on? I sound even younger than before. That's it! That means we're in the 1% of people who never grow old. Yeah! You better get used to this because uh, they do this quite a lot. Hey, you remember Sarah the ice cream cone from the sweater episode? Let's have another episode dedicated to how much of a stalker, I mean, fan she truly is. Gumball and Darwin have to deal with a crazy, obsessive stalker. And then at the end of the episode, they bow down to her demands and make her sick fan fictions come to life, all because she's lonely. Oh, come on, I thought we were done with this kind of shit. It's like a weird fan fiction come to life, but I will say this, it's not nearly as cringy as some fan fictions are. The song in the middle is really creepy though. For a very long time, I've watched you from afar, hunched in your closet or strapped beneath your car. I treasured all the stories the three of us share. Wherever you are, I'll always be there. It's a fine episode that piggybacks on one of the greater episodes from season three. But I will give Sarah this. She's not as bad as this twat. Ay, ay, oh boy, she's a, mm, she's a bad egg. Gumball and Darwin get a new gym coach. After forcing Jamie to apologize to Gumball, I'm sorry Gumball for what I said. Let's put our differences to bed. I hope these words will make amends and we can be the best of friends. Gumball and Darwin get the suspicion that Jamie is gonna get revenge on the coach for making her apologize to him. Eh, not that great of an episode to be honest. The only thing I found funny is that every time the coach talks, she reminds me of Ross from Monsters, Inc. Maybe the day you want to win gold in the 1986 Olympics. Wazowski, you didn't file your paperwork last night. And it turns out that coach is a woman. No, dude. We're shocked because coach, coach is, is a woman? Are they trying to make a comment on trans people? Eh, probably not. It's Monday morning, so this means that Gumball and Darwin are rightfully pissed off. So Richard decides to give them a wonder hug, and it works to an infectious level. Seriously, because of this hug, it ends up being a zombie apocalypse at school. Everybody starts getting infected by the joy, and the only person that can save them all is Miss Simeon. That was a lot of things ending in ick. It was graphic, it was idiotic, it was sick, one could even say it was horrific. But it certainly wasn't scientific. I thought that was fan fantastic whoop de boring dude. What are you talking about? That was fan fantastic I like that throwback. That's really good. God, this episode is so freaking good. The creepy factor is bumped up to a hundred. And I think Miss Simeon is at her absolute best. 
because she senses that something's off with Gumball and Darwin right away. And throughout the episode, I'm just hoping that she manages to cure everybody because nobody should be happy on a Monday morning. But sadly, just when she was so close, A pretty spectacular episode. Give it a watch. What are you doing? Give it a watch. I I'm not joking. Get, get, click off the video and go give it a watch. Now. Richard gets the family a puppy. <laughs> Psych. He gets them an evil turtle. What are you going to feed him? Souls? I'm sorry, but I'm calling it. That turtle is evil. Yeah, that's basically it. After they try to return it back to the awesome store, which is a van by the way, you, you, you should keep a mental note about this van because it will make a comeback in later episodes, I promise. The turtle ends up on the loose. Well, that's good. All it needs to do is get hit by a car and everything will be... Well, shit, never mind. So now Gumball, Darwin, and Anais need to track it down. I'll tell you what, this turtle is freaking crazy. And this isn't a one and done. It remains a member of the family for quite some time. So yeah, for the entire episode, you're just watching this evil turtle do horrific acts. Sure, it's not evil Stewie levels of crazy, but it's still right up there. And for some reason, he attacks Gumball the most. Trust me, I know how you feel. Some pets can be pretty vicious. 2017 you guys this is Shiva I wrote her in today because I'm telling you she's a better <laughs> And another reason why I like this episode is because it has one of my favorite moments in the entire series you could drag me to the bottom of the lake so you could eat me later. Well, guess what, punk? I'm a fish with legs. I thought it was pretty good. It's pretty relatable for those who've gotten a pet. Except, I'm guessing your pet has never tried to kill you. If not, then maybe this episode isn't all that relatable for you. Am I the only one around here, Maze, that he's still alive? Anton dies all the time. It's been that way since season one. He's essentially this universe's Kenny McCormick. Anyway, we're making plots out of one-off gags? Huh. Okay. Show me what you got then. Gumball and Darwin are shocked to discover that Anton is still alive. So they decide to get to the bottom of how he can die and come back to life continuously. So after a small montage of killing him 50 times in a row. Maybe we should just ask him. Uh, maybe you should have said that before we iced him 50 times in a row. God, they've killed him so many times, I'm pretty sure South Park would blush. So after going to Anton's house and finding out that there's a specific recipe, ha, to bring Anton back to life, they decide to make their own Anton. We have to do exactly what they did. Does that mean I have to wear a mustache and we should, you know, kiss no and for the record i'd be the one wearing the mustache i'm just gonna leave this clip right here Mama. did you hear that he called you mom hmm then i guess that makes you its dad you know how most shows do the clone the main character trope that's basically this episode after losing anton 2 darwin makes an anton 3 so now Gumball and Darwin have to track down Anton too by cloning multiple Antons so they can check the entire neighborhood. And while they're doing that, Anton 1 clones his own army to kill the original Anton so that he can be the original Anton. Oh my god, it's such a pain saying that name multiple times in a sentence. I found this episode to be pretty funny because the concept is centered around toast. <laughs> Come on, you can't tell me that's not goofy. 
And there's a moment in this episode that made me laugh my ass off. There's a moment where Darwin tries to sacrifice himself by fighting off all the toasts by himself. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And there's also this scene. This is the end. We're too heavy. You'll have to let us go. Dude, you're two pieces of toast. I flipped it a sandwich before. <laughs> this episode is so stupid, yet it's so funny at the same time. What's the point in learning all these combos if all you need is button mashing? Who cares? Thank you! We have another show that agrees that button mashing is the best technique. In your face, Burleazy. Okay. Okay, remember how in The Promise Darwin said that Gumball is his nickname? So for this episode, we find out that his real name is Zack. Zack Watterson. Zack. Gumball's called Zack now. So, yeah, good point. So with this information, he completely transforms into a different person. You know how our Gumball is a loser? Well, Zack prides himself on being a winner and being extremely hardcore. When I first saw this episode, I was immediately reminded of that Family Guy episode, Quagmire's Mom. In the first half of the episode, it's about Peter learning that his real name is Justin, so he acts like a different person as a result. But you know what? This episode is way better. I love the third act of the episode because that's where Zack starts to change Gumball's memories. They even reuse animation from season 1 and season 2. And I've noticed with this specific flashback, they redub the original voice actor. Which is pretty weird. <laughs> The final chase with the family going down to Town Hall to change Gumball's name was pretty fun to watch. Even though the lady working there does bring up a good point. You know, you coulda just filled this out on the internet. A solid episode all around though. An episode that serves as a sequel to the world. For this episode, we focus on the background characters. It's a little weaker compared to the world episode, but it's a fine episode. It's just not one of my personal favorites. And there's not much to say about this one. It does exactly what the title states. I really like this song, but I want to sleep some more. I empathize with you, Gumball. I really do. When Gumball and Darwin do nothing but bitch and complain, a lot of people decide to open a charity case for them. But when the duo tries to come clean and say that they're not poor, the townspeople become bloody savages. They lied to us! Jesus, these people are freaking crazy. And while that's going on, there's a side plot of Anais teaching Richard sarcasm. The side plot had its moments, but the main plot reminded me of the sweater, and that's not good. But I will say that seeing Gumball and Darwin trash the house was pretty fun to watch. There's even a moment where Darwin acts like a Disney princess and sings out to his comrades to come and destroy the house. It's a mid-tier episode. Other than those two moments, there's not much to say about this one. I don't, I don't recommend it. It's, it's, a, it's a slog to get through. The Watersons go out camping, but things start to go south because, buddy boy, this turns into a goddamn horror movie. I found this episode to be a pretty fantastic time. It starts with the kids telling scary stories until Nicole tells a really scary story because Darwin says this. Don't worry, Mrs. Mom. It's not your fault you're boring. It's because you're old. I'm having fish tonight! Okay, PSA to children, if you want to make sure that you're still drawing breath and that your head still stays attached to your body, please, don't ever comment on your parents' age. Just, 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 
trust me, just, just don't. And sure, it is rather predictable with everything in Nicole's story coming true in real life. Starting with the car running out of gas, the family being stranded in the middle of nowhere, a weird guy helping them out, them going to the gas station, this guy and his mother looking like they're going to eat the water sins, you know, stuff like that. But I don't know, man. I really like this episode. More specifically, the third act. The third act was really fun to watch. So yeah, it's a personal favorite of mine. Oh my God. Everybody stop chilling. It's him. Gumball and Darwin end up in Principal Brown's office because they're naked. And the reason why is because Richard decided to put their clothes in the dishwasher. I... I don't know anymore. Anyway, we eventually get into the plot of Gumball and Darwin discovering that Principal Brown's diploma is fake. Out of fear that they might tell someone, Principal Brown decides to do a bunch of desperate shit in order to make sure they don't say anything. Some of the gags were kind of funny. Wait, I got bottle rockets, cherry bombs, and this big one, I don't even know what it does! What if this were to go public? <sighs> Look, Principal Brown. First, that was a phase. And secondly, we felt ashamed so many times in life that I think we're now incapable of feeling it. As in, chemically. But most of them were just misses for me. Swag, rap music. What the what? Piercings, YOLO, hashtag, MP3, tweets, selfies, skinny jeans, L-O- Don't just reference modern shit, you idiot! That's not comedy! I would say the third act made me laugh my ass off the most because Principal Brown decides to blow up the school at the end of the episode. <laughs> Jesus. It kind of reminds me of that South Park episode where Kyle decides to set the school on fire because a bunch of girls called him ugly. It's middle of the road. Gumball and Darwin start to realize that a student is missing. So they investigate to find out who it is with the help of Mr. Small. Yeah, this episode is pretty good. I like it when they go into the void because it's filled with neat visual gags. They even make some references to what we used to use back then. And hey, look, Rob is there. Look, I promise he is very important to the story. Oh, and the character that's been missing since season one is Molly. And guess what? It's not just the characters that didn't notice. I didn't even notice until this episode, to be honest. And again, I love it when they make fun of the status quo. It's very funny. We must tell everyone before the world tries to make us forget. But how could we forget something like that? What were we talking about again? Yeah, this episode's filled with creative and clever moments, a bunch of good jokes, and a good dynamic between Gumball, Darwin, and Mr. Small. After Gumball and Darwin destroy Mr. Robinson's backyard, he ends up blowing his lid. Quite literally. I think I need to lie down on my face. So because of him losing a lot of stuffing, he needs a stuffing transfusion, and his wife can't do it because, well, she's a bitch. I mean seriously, when her husband is ill and in the hospital, guess where she is? <laughs> Jeez, what a bitch. What a total twat. Anyway, the only family member left to ask is Rocky. But Mr. Robinson doesn't want his son stuffing because of how much of a failure he is. So Gumball and Darwin decide to help Rocky get a job to impress his father and also get the surgery done as well. It's a decent little episode. Although the premise of Rocky working for an evil corporation reminds me of that Family Guy episode where Meg worked for Superstore USA this one really goes to show how working at an office job is probably the worst job to take. Again, it's a decent Rocky-centered episode. Not much to say. Alright, you asked for it! Say hello to Gumball! What was that for? <laughs> Just seeing angry Darwin always makes me laugh. And hey, it's Clayton. Remember him from season two? 
let's make another episode dedicated to him. Gumball and Darwin try to get to the root of why Clayton always lies, and while that's going on, Tobias tries to get a girlfriend. Eventually, it's revealed that Clayton has this martial arts move that can disintegrate one's heart. I will admit Clayton's reasons for why he lies is pretty relatable for some people. Some people do lie because they want to make themselves look more interesting than they are in reality. Tobias hitting on girls was pretty funny, even though Twitter might not think so because, you know, hashtag me too, hashtag times up. And the third act of the episode is fine, I guess. After Clayton does his move on Tobias, Gumball and Darwin try to cover it up. I'd say the ending of the skull is more entertaining than this. Even if it isn't canon. Dude, it's so hot that I'm sweating this right out. I don't have sweat glands, give me some. Ah, that's better. Gross, but better. <sighs> I know you're paying, kids. Trust me, I'm doing this video during the goddamn summer. Anyway, Gumball and Darwin hang out with the donut cop who tries to show them that being a police officer is cool. But after being influenced by Gumball and going insane Bart Simpson style, he ends up losing his badge, which leads him to be depressed. But then he gets right back into the swing of things when Karen, look, I know she has a name in universe, but I'm just going to call her Karen because it's fun for me. Anyway, Karen ends up hijacking an ice cream truck and going on a rampage, so now the donut cop, Gumball, and Darwin have to stop her. Call me crazy, but this was weaker than both Rocky and Clayton's episodes combined. The basic concept just reminds me of the Colossus episode. Remember in that episode where Gumball and Darwin called Hector boring and then he tries to prove them otherwise? It's basically the same thing here. I will admit, the first half of the episode is pretty funny. But after that, it just kind of spirals downhill. I thought this was about finding what I'm allergic to. Yes, that as well. Well, he's been hanging around with you all day, so maybe he's allergic to stupidity. That's kind of messed up to say in hindsight. Darwin keeps sneezing, so Gumball and by extension Anais try to find a way to cure it. It seems like the most boring episode at first, but Darwin's chaotic sneezing makes it more fun to watch. Eventually, it's revealed that Darwin is allergic to feathers. Now, how do feathers factor into this equation? Well, earlier in the episode, Gumball and Darwin were having a pillow fight, and one of the feathers from the pillows got stuck in his gills. It's a pretty entertaining episode. Gumball, Darwin, Tobias, and Banana Joe have a mom off to prove which one of their mothers is superior. Now this is one for the ladies. A nice concept that was well executed. And seeing the different rounds that the boys put their mothers through is really fun to watch. And out of the three mothers, guess who's the best? If any of you say it's Tobias's mom or Banana Joe's mom, you're wrong. You are very wrong. It's Nicole, of course. It would have been Tobias's mom if she and her son didn't cheat throughout the competition. After putting their mom through hell, Gumball and Darwin get grounded. So they try to make it up to her by doing this. You're super mom. Happy Mother's Day. We're sorry. It seems like a nice gesture. But then this happens. How did that not work? Ah, oh, we should have been jumping at the same time. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So this prompts Nicole to go and rescue them. Like seriously, her mother instincts kick in like this. My kids are in danger. I believe this episode shows Nicole at her absolute best. It shows that she can be strict but she's still a loving mother that will rescue her boys any day of the week. As long as you ignore episodes like The Hero, we're on easy street. Good move, but I can take it. 
Why so realistic? Jesus Christ. Gumball and Darwin are distraught to find out that Anais is Richard's favorite child. I'm just gonna place this video right here. And all this because you guys wanted to be my favorite, when we all know, in fact, that Darwin is my favorite. Yeah. And they figure this out via password on the computer. I'll get into that later. So throughout the episode, Gumball and Darwin tried to be Richard's favorite kids. I don't know about you, but I felt really bad for Richard throughout this episode. I mean, first he chokes on food, gets set on fire, jumps into a hot bath, gets attacked by a dog, and gets hit by a car. Holy shit! I mean, I give credit that we see Richard tell Gumball and Darwin to go to their room, which is something I thought I would never see. Until eventually, Gumball and Darwin decide to call Nicole their favorite parent. And then this results in a chase with Richard and Nicole trying to buy Gumball and Darwin a laptop. All of this transpired because Anais changed the password on the computer. Oh, good luck logging in. I changed the password. Sure, the twist at the end of the episode did remind me of the remote, but it's still a pretty good episode. Wait a minute, didn't Larry put a restraining order on... <sighs> you know what, never mind. You are procrastinators. Oh, we're jumping right into this, huh? Gumball and Darwin are tasked with taking out the trash before 5pm, and what do they do? They start procrastinating their asses off. I'll be back at around five. Don't worry, Mom. We'll get right on it. That's basically the whole episode. Gumball and Darwin start doing a bunch of random shit instead of taking out the trash immediately. There are some pretty funny scenes, specifically Gumball acting like a cat. Nah, this laser paint is garbage. And this whole scene was nice to listen to. Some people may say it's a filler episode, and it's considered by many to being a pretty bad episode, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And also, Terminator reference. Just cause, let, let's just throw it in there. Why not? Also, just when it seems like they took out the trash... Uh, can I have some more of the sports section, please? Can someone please explain to me how this happened? Uh, wrong bag. I personally don't get where the hate is coming from, but I like this episode a lot. Are you annoyed by that? Well, fuck you, it's my list. Gumball accidentally cracks Penny's shell during a theater play, and after getting the news that Penny and her family are planning on moving, Gumball convinces Penny to come out of her shell. When I heard the premise for the episode was that Penny was coming out of her shell, I thought she was going to be a deer because, well, these were a massive red flag. But nope, it turns out that Penny is a shapeshifter, and throughout the episode she takes on many different forms. The basic gist of the episode is to do two things. One, confirm that Gumball and Penny are now a thing, and two, to answer the long-running question of what's inside Penny's shell. This is how you do a setup and payoff correctly. Looking at you, regular show and Adventure Time. So yeah, this is without a doubt one of the greatest episodes in the entire series. Because unlike Finn and Mordecai, Gumball got the girl in the end. Okay, I know it's not much of a shock given the fact that I already spoiled it at the beginning of the video, but still. Oh, and I need to mention, this will be important later. Gumball and Darwin are forced to look after Chris Morris, the school hamster. And guess what? The thing that's inside the cage right now is a piece of Principal Brown's hair, and the hamster is actually out on the loose. Listen, listen, trust me, this is important for the next episode. 
So yeah, Gumball and Darwin end up hanging out with Principal Brown's hair for 10 minutes. And they do countless things with it. Okay, where's the bleach? I'm washing my eyes out. Eventually, they realize that the real Chris Morris is at school, and they decide to put him back in his cage. Up until they eventually just decide to let him go free, after he rescued them from being caught by the Donut Cop, Miss Simeon, and Principal Brown. I did like the third act a lot, especially with Chris Morris outsmarting Gumball and Darwin. And I thought it was pretty heartwarming with Gumball and Darwin releasing Chris Morris into the wild. That was pretty nice. But overall, it's a decent episode. Oh boy, an episode that's considered by many to be Darwin's worst episode. So let's talk about it. Darwin gets jealous of Gumball and Penny's relationship. And no, before you ask, the jealousy spirit does not make a comeback in this episode. So throughout the episode, Darwin acts very aggressive to Penny. So Penny decides that she and Gumball should take a break, which causes Gumball to do this. And hey, you want to know Darwin's excuse for why he did all of this? Play the clip. I, I, I just wanted to spend more time with you. I'm so sorry. Yes, you heard that right. It's the same excuse that Gumball used in The Promise. Don't you get it? It's about us. I just wanted to spend some time together. I guess you don't feel the same. I'm just gonna leave this clip right here. You guys spend every single second, minute, hour, day, week, month and year together what are you talking about but eventually darwin and gumball do reconnect and darwin decides to help gumball win over penny by trying to marry her at the age of 12. what luckily penny says no they're still together they just can't get married thank god now, I'll say this, the idea for the episode is not entirely bad. It seems like an interesting idea on paper, but the problem was the execution. I feel like the only way this episode could have worked was if the Jealousy character made a comeback and influenced Darwin to do some of the stuff he did in this episode. But because that character isn't here, it just makes Darwin feel out of character. Especially since he came to terms with how he feels about Gumball and Penny's relationship in the last episode. And for people who are going to say, well, Darwin didn't care too much for this relationship back in the Shell episode, because in this picture, you can see that everybody approves except for him. A little side note, the reason why Nicole looks like this is because she's been tranquilized. And to that I say, he wouldn't have even bothered helping out Gumball in the date episode then. And to make sure Darwin doesn't cause a school shooting, they have a bro-like wedding to ensure that Gumball and Darwin will always be brothers at the end of the day. This episode had a decent premise, but it got ruined by piss poor execution. And one more thing, this episode reminds me of The Dream from Season 2. But I'll give that episode a 6 because you can argue that Gumball is acting semi in character. Because Gumball can act pretty irrational, especially in season 2. But with this episode, I can't give it a 6 because Darwin is acting way too out of character for my taste. Anyway, next one. I'm, I'm done with this episode. <gasps> I don't need an invite! Well, now that we're alone... Gumball gets cursed, again. But this time it's by an email that tells him that if he doesn't forward this message to at least 10 people, he'll lose his money, his friends, his girlfriend, and his family. Well, I've lost all my money, all my friends, and my girlfriend, so it looks like you were right to take that curse seriously. Come on, just say I told you so. I don't know what you take me for, but I get no pleasure out of this. Trying to terminate because you wanted to hear me say I was wrong. You know me well, don't you? 
sure it's a rehash of the curse episode, but I think they change it up just enough for this episode to be its own thing. And not to mention, it's way better than the last episode, by a wide margin. And now that I think about it, this kind of reminds me of a regular show episode. They take something simple and relatable, and they go all out with it. And for that, I think they did a good job. And then we find out later in the episode that the ghost that cursed Gumball is Carrie's father. So you get a nice bit of Carrie in this episode. So, good stuff. Hundredth episode, everybody! This is the hundredth episode of the amazing world of Gumball. And it's fine. What is Father gonna say when he comes back? Father? Yeah! You said he left to buy some milk 42 years ago! He could be back any minute! Uh... Huh. I wonder if we're gonna meet Richard's father in the future. Eh, we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, so Granny Jojo is going out with this mouse named Louie. Much to the dismay of Richard, who forbids her from seeing him. And now Gumball, Darwin, and Anais have to help Granny Jojo. No, let me explain something! I don't want you to see that guy anymore! Well, I don't think it's for you to decide, young man. Why are you under my roof? You're part of my rules, old lady! Eh, to be honest, I would react the same way. And also, their bedroom is on the first floor? I always thought their bedroom was on the second floor. But anyway, for a hundredth episode, I was kind of left disappointed. I mean, this is the hundredth episode of the show. You really gotta do something big to celebrate. I mean, for God's sake, the episode takes place in one location throughout the entire 10 minutes, and that's in the Watterson house. I mean, I give credit that it has a nice third act with Richard and Louie having a man off because of Gumball. And then we have an emotional moment of Richard admitting that he doesn't want to lose his mother just like how he lost his father. I felt that. The third act was really strong, but the first and second act just don't click. Because Larry is rightfully frustrated because of the water sins, he quits all of his jobs, which results in Elmore falling apart. This episode pretty much shows that Larry is the real MVP of the town and the show, because as you can see, the town pretty much ends up being a cesspool of chaos when he quits. And I do like that the family acknowledged that they were cruel to him, and they make it up to him by giving him a $100 bill. That's pretty nice. And also, I need you to remember this setup, because this setup will be used in a later episode that is widely considered to being the show's worst episode. Since it's January, and everybody is usually down around this time of year, Gumball makes up a new holiday called Sluzzle Tag. And it makes everyone happy. Everyone, except Miss Simeon, who decides to call out Gumball for being the lying sack of shit that he is. I like the Sailor Moon reference. That was pretty neat. As for the story itself, it's just Gumball lying until he realizes that he needs to give everybody in Elmore presents or else they're going to realize that Sluzzle Tag is fake. It doesn't really matter in the end, because even when he gets called out by Miss Simeon, everyone is still smiling at the end of the episode. So, what's the moral of the story? Happy Sluzzle Tag, everyone! Gumball and Darwin release a butterfly out into the world, and it causes a butterfly effect. For those who don't know what it means, it's a theory that the smallest thing, like the titular butterfly, can lead to a world-ending catastrophe. Like this! <laughs> but more complicated. And that's really the whole premise for the episode. Gumball and Darwin don't hog the spotlight for the fourth time, and you see a bunch of characters experiencing the butterfly effect. I'll say this much, it's a way better episode than the extra. And I don't know, but I can't help but get the feeling that the butterfly effect was a movie at one point. Hmm... Eh, probably my imagination. Hmm. 
after Gumball and Darwin go through a sugar rush, they try to find the answer to the meaning of life by asking everybody in Elmore. This episode reminded me of that Family Guy episode where Stewie tries to find out what happens after death. I think each character has an interesting outlook on what life is all about, and out of all of them, I think Sussy has the best answer. It's not about the destination, but it's more about the journey, making friends along the way, and enjoying every single minute of life, for the good and the bad. Well, now that I think about it, I've been living the bad part of life for the past 20 years. God damn. Gumball wants to prove to Darwin that Alan isn't the saint that he makes himself out to be. And why is Gumball doing this? Purely because he has nothing to do today. And I'm not paraphrasing, that's an actual line from the episode. You know what? I bet he isn't really that nice. Everyone has a breaking point, and I'm gonna prove it to you! Why on earth would you want to do that? For science! And because the people deserve to know! And because I got nothing else to do today. It's just Gumball acting like an asshole, while Alan acts like the perfect saint that he is. Like seriously, Gumball really does a bunch of horrible things. Things like breaking up Alan and Carmen's relationship, making a racist post on Alan's Elmore Plus account, taking his last meatball, and finally, selling his parents. Ugh, Gumball acts like Mr. Turner from the Fairly Odd Parents. <clears throat> what? Cloudy with a chance of rain? This can only be the work of... Morning, Turner! Dinkleberg. But even with this, it's an alright episode. Even if Gumball is very insufferable for like, most of it. I like the Saving Private Ryan reference at the beginning of the episode. And I also like that each family member tried getting Anais' cupcakes, but they failed. That was pretty funny. Oh, I was actually coming out here to pick up a cupcake. Get the fuck out of here, EDP. Okay. Come on, think hard! Come on, you too! What is it with this show going hyper-realistic on some aspects of the face? Jeez. Anyway, Gumball and Darwin try to help Anais make an imaginary friend, but shocker, it turns out the imaginary friend is real. It's a very unique concept for the series. I mean, we've never seen Anais have any friends before, so I thought this was a decent attempt. Even though this episode reminded me of that Family Guy episode where Stewie had robots for friends. But I prefer this episode over that one because at least in this episode they try to mix it up a little bit. Especially the third act of the episode where they have the police involved to take away said imaginary friend. And the kids take them down one by one which is a pretty clever homage to Home Alone. Look at that! What the? What? Eh, close enough. See, I told you this gag from the show would be important later. After looking at a set of Banana Barbara's paintings, which by the way predict the future, one specific painting gets Gumball's attention as it depicts him being naked at the mall. Hey. So throughout the entire episode, he tries to prevent that future from ever happening. Well, you've been wearing that sweater constantly for the past three years. I can't take it off! It doesn't go over my head! Well, that's just a blatant fucking lie. I thought the ways that Gumball escalated the situation was pretty funny. Let's take your sweater off! Good idea! Are you kidding me? No! You're keeping your clothes on! Ah, oh, this is cool you down. Ah, that was coffee! Overall, I thought this episode was pretty funny. But that ending, though... What could that mean? Eh. I guess we'll find out when the movie comes out. After watching those shitty fear-mongering safety videos, Darwin goes to extreme lengths to make sure that his family and everyone else in Elmore is safe, to the point where he ends up being... the villain? I say that with hesitation because he's kind of a hero. I mean, he's making sure that everybody is safe, but at the same time, he's still doing world domination. So... 
I don't know. A pretty awesome episode that made me realize that Darwin did in one episode what Stewie couldn't do in the first three seasons of Family Guy. He came close to succeeding with his world domination plan. Not to mention the jokes in this one are really great. Dude, I don't even know any real curse words. I only know the mom sanctioned versions. But those words hint at the bad ones, so they need to be censored as well. So what are we supposed to say when we need to vent? Like when? Like now. <laughs> Did I go too far? Yes, 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 yes! No, the cape is awesome! Of course. Easily one of Darwin's greatest episodes. Although there is one thing that doesn't fly with me, and it's the cape. Did I go too far? Yes, 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 yes! No, the cape is awesome! Dude, Edna Mode clearly says... No kicks! Gumball wants to be a part of a secret society at school, so throughout the episode, he starts doing stuff like this. Good. Hmm. It's gotta be here. <gasps> here! Yeah! A secret lever! <gasps> what is he doing? <sighs> He's checking for membership tattoos. The only way to stop him is to give him what he wants. What? No! Has that ever stopped anyone? You'll just fuel his madness! Whatever it takes to stop that kid, we're doing it right now! <laughs> Look, it's pretty funny, but you guys could just, I don't know, send him home or suspend him instead of giving him what he wants, because that's what they do. Instead of punishing him, the entire school decides to give Gumball what he wants. They stage a fake society to make Gumball happy, but he still ends up going overboard. At the end of the episode, he almost falls off the roof of the school, but luckily Darwin tells them to spill the beans. Luckily, Gumball does come to his senses, and he realizes that he doesn't need to be a part of a secret society at school because he has Darwin. Even though that's not really the message he was supposed to learn, but whatever. A pretty good episode overall. Huh, a don't spoil this product for me episode. I wonder if it's on par with regular shows. Well, let's see. Gumball tries to avoid spoilers for this upcoming horror movie. And while that's going on, Anais tries to suck up to him so that she can come along. Okay, play the music. Come along with me. Yes, that was completely necessary. It was in the script. I just I had to throw it in there. And also, Darwin is trying to hear all the spoilers so he doesn't get scared. Nice consistency. I think it's right up there with regular show's episode. It's pretty funny and pretty relatable. Especially this scene where Gumball gets pissed off at his friends for vaguely spoiling the movie for him. Which very close he was in was the one that's looking to go to I relate to both Gumball and Anais in this one. Gumball for obvious reasons because I really hate getting spoiled. Seriously, if you spoil anything for me, I will- and I relate to Anais because I can remember when I was little and I would want to watch horror movies all the time, but my parents would say no. Another scene I liked was when Gumball and Penny were on the phone and it turns out that everybody was eavesdropping. Do you have any other spoilers, please? Is anyone else eavesdropping? Yeah. Hey guys, is everyone on the phone? Oh, I gotta go. Something's in the oven. I lost a shoe. Hello, too. But the best part of the episode is definitely the ending. Just when Gumball and Darwin are about to watch the movie, Anais pretty much ruins it, and to avoid getting spotted by Larry, Darwin spoils the entire movie for Gumball and everyone else. That's just... not right. But hey, at least Anais gets jump scared at the end. A pretty great episode overall. What does it look like I'm doing? I'm writing a movie! No, I'm not! I bought a ticket online, so I paid to be here. I'm just taking the movie home to watch by myself. Percy is stealing! <laughs> 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 
Gumball and Darwin have to get to school on time, because if they don't, Miss Simeon will expel them both. It's a fan favorite of mine. Similar to the last episode, it's pretty relatable for those who've been late to school. I know I have. What makes this episode great is that there's an actual countdown at the top of the screen. Which made me more interested to see if they would get to school on time. But then eventually Gumball just breaks the counter altogether, stopping time completely, and then we get to the best part of the episode, the time travel aspect. Now it's no mystery that I don't like time travel, but I like the way it was implemented here. We go through so many time travel hijinks that I really enjoyed. And the episode ends with this. Yeah, I can live with that. What can I say? It's a fan favorite of mine. Are you annoyed by that? Well, fuck you, it's my list. Nicole, Richard, and Anais's stuff goes missing. So who do you think they pin the blame on? Exactly, Gumball and Darwin. So this leads the duo to try to figure out who's responsible. And then they discover Rob, yeah, you remember him, has been living in their house for quite some time, and he's the one that's been taking everyone's stuff. I think he's more scared of us than we are of him. Let's run the scary! Okay, when I first saw the episode for the first time, I had one question. Why did Rob look like this? And they give a good explanation that follows continuity. You see, in the void, Rob grabbed onto the van that Gumball, Mr. Small, Darwin, and Molly were riding in. But when he did that, his appearance ended up changing for the worse. So now he blames Gumball and Darwin for what happened to him. So, he decides to become their mortal enemy. Now I know what you're thinking. Wasn't William Gumball and Darwin's mortal enemy in Season 2? Yeah, well guess what, this guy literally blew that guy out of the water. I will take away everyone you love. I will be your nemesis. Oh, cool. Glad we could help. So, this is the origin for one of the show's greatest villains. Let's see how he lives up to the hype. Gumball's in a crabby mood, so in a fit of anger, he wishes to be left alone in peace. And he gets just that. This episode reminded me of that Spongebob episode, Alone. The best way to describe this episode is that it's like Alone, but a shit ton better, with a way better twist. Should we tell him? Gumborg the Destroyer will be back when the toilet tank is full. Uh, okay. Actually, Alan, if you heard that, never mind. I'd rather it was just me left in the world than just me and you. What's this? Nah, let's save him the embarrassment. Nicole wants to show Karen that the Watersons are a normal family. Come on, you guys. You are weirdos. Accept it. For God's sake, the Mitchells accept that they're weirdos. Why can't you? <sighs> anyway, while Nicole and Karen are having this dick measuring contest, Anais and Karen's son, Billy, end up getting along. And it seems like a pretty nice friendship. But it gets ruined when Billy says that he doesn't like Daisy the donkey. That's the only thing I got out of this episode. Oh, right, and the song sucks. Just you and me, could live a life of perfect harmony, a satisfying intellectually. And I need you to remember this, because I'm gonna bring it up later. The only two things I liked about this episode was the beginning, Okay, I guess I have to ask. What? Respect you! No, I said you had to look respectable. I said act natural, not au naturel. Too serious? I can understand this kind of stuff from them because, well, what's a nice way to put it? They're halfwits. So could you please wear something sensible? No! <gasps> and the continuity from previous episodes. That's about it. This is an episode that isn't well liked by many fans. And guess what? I don't like it either. This episode reminded me too much of the replaced episode from regular show. Nobody in this episode is likable, and I just wanted to skip it altogether. But... <sighs> I'll briefly talk about it, for your sake. Darwin joins the school marching band because of his incredible talent to play the swanee whistle, 
which pisses off Gumball to no end. And then eventually Gumball finds out that someone sabotaged Darwin's whistle, so he tries to tell everybody, but they don't care. I, I, I'm not being sarcastic, they, they, they literally don't care. <coughs> no way! And I'll expel you from the school if I see your face again. You dick! So now it's up to him to protect his friend. The problem with this episode is that nobody is likable. Like, at all. Darwin has been acting like a stubborn asshole ever since he got this gig. Which I find weird because usually Darwin has no issue with being a loser. But for this episode, he claims he doesn't like being dragged down to Gumball's level. That's just dumb, but whatever. Gumball acts like a petty bitch, and for some reason, in the end portion of the episode, He's betrayed as the hero for some reason. Why? You can't just flip-flop like that. Principal Brown is a dick, and it turns out that Leslie is just as petty as Gumball. You know what? This episode can suck my dick. Skip. Richard screws the family over, and now they're broke. We can't afford the water bills now. This is all we got. Drink up. That's so disgusting, yet so relatable. So Larry decides to help out the Water Sins by starring them in a commercial. But Gumball says no because of morals, dignity, principles, and all that crap. It's the most relatable Gumball episode ever. It's pretty similar to that regular show episode where Mordecai and Rigby didn't want to sell out to that toy company. It's the same thing here, but what makes this episode more relatable is that it hits you with the truth. When you don't sell out, you're broke. And when you're broke, you're poor. And when you're poor, your whole world falls apart. No, seriously, Gumball's world literally begins to fall apart. And I love this part of the episode. It goes from traditional Gumball animation to storyboards and finally to post-it notes. It's easily the show's greatest episode. What an outstanding way to end season 3. Let's see what season 4 has up its sleeves. Imaginate a butler who will treat you like the queen of being It's Gumball, Darwin, and Anais's first day back to school. But what do you know, they end up missing. So now Richard has to find them and take them to school before Nicole finds out. It's a Richard episode that really goes to show how stupid he is. And it turns out he ditched them in a ball pit in the children's area while they were school shopping. What can I say? It's a Richard episode. If you like Richard, you will like this episode. If you don't like Richard, you won't like this episode. For me... It's in the middle. I feel like Richard's stupidity only works when he's surrounded by other characters, but when he has to hold an episode on his own, it really doesn't work all that well. You remember the nobody, right? I will take away everyone you love. I will be your nemesis. Oh, cool. Glad we could help. Well, guess what? Rob tries to follow through on being Gumball and Darwin's arch enemy, but every time he tries, he ends up failing. It's the oil from the trap. What trap? Just one of the 563 traps I've set for you guys, like this one! Now you know how Plankton feels when he loses. So Gumball and Darwin try to help him be a better villain. I will admit, I like this episode better than the last one, because seeing Gumball and Darwin try to help out Rob was pretty fun to watch. And... <laughs> I love this little interaction. Mm -mm -mm. You never apologize for wrecking his cookies. Mm. Mm. Okay, I forgive you. Usually villains don't say sorry or hug their arch enemy, but luckily he does find his footing at the end of the episode. Hopefully he can keep it up later down the line, which I think he will. Gumball and Darwin tried to be a part of a social group, so, who do they turn to? The senior citizens, of course. And hey, did you guys notice that Uncle Louie isn't present here? I just realized that. And there will be a reason for that, I am sure. It's the second most boring episode in the entire series. 
It's only second place because the sweaters from season 2 takes number 1. Even the twist at the end was pretty weak. I hope when you get out of prison, you two will join the ranks of the best crew in the world. Prison! A pretty bad episode. Moving on. You know how you're like a baby, but you're at school with us? How does that work? Are you kidding me? I'm not sure what you're upset about. The fact neither of you know that your sister, who you live with, is in the year above you in your own school. Wait a minute. You're telling me that Anais is in the 8th grade, while Gumball and Darwin are in the 7th grade? Huh. You know what? That makes a lot of sense. Look around you, mine's the only class in Elmore Junior High. Gumball, no it isn't. The world doesn't revolve around you. Anyway, Anais has Gumball open his mind to find out that there are other students in the school. Besides the usual group of characters we see in every single episode leading up to this one. Eventually, we follow this character named Claire, and we follow her so-called world. And after seeing that she's going through a difficult time, Gumball and Darwin decide to insert themselves into the plot to help her out. I will say the concept of the episode was pretty interesting, as I wanted to follow Claire and see what her life was like. You know, without Gumball and Darwin inserting themselves into it. But we don't get that. As you know, The Amazing World of Gumball does have episodes where it doesn't follow Gumball and Darwin, and we focus on other characters in the show. Episodes like The World, The Extra, The Butterfly, and The Return are episodes that don't have Gumball and Darwin hogging the spotlight like they usually do. But how's the episode itself? It's better than I expected. At first, I thought I would hate the idea of Gumball and Darwin inserting themselves into this situation, but they make it quite humorous, because with Claire being so melodramatic, you gotta have some humor sprinkled in here. And I thought Gumball and Darwin did a good job of doing that. I said, this is not about you. Not a bad chew? Not about you! Still not getting it. This is not about you! Nor date and set the gang one gang one. Oh! And more importantly, I like how there's a major contrast between Claire and Gumball's worlds. But there's one thing I had an issue with while watching the episode. Why is Darwin joining Gumball on this? Usually he's the voice of reason out of the two, but for this episode, he just decides to join Gumball on this, which I didn't get, but whatever. So I thought this episode was pretty good, even if it reminded me of the death from season one. After getting the news that Granny Jojo and Louie are getting married, and they plan on moving to Florida, I don't think that's such a good idea, but eh, what the fuck do I know? So in response to this, Richard decides to make Louie his son so that he can forbid him from marrying Granny Jojo. And the funny part about this is that he actually succeeds. Richard, the dumbest character in the show, actually succeeded in getting Louie to be his son. Dear Lord Almighty. I just realized while editing this that Richard is surprisingly big compared to the other characters. Look at this. Oh, and in retaliation, Louis adopts Nicole so that she can be his daughter. I tell you, when I first saw this episode, it confused the buck out of me. Eventually, because of all of this, the person that's in charge of everybody now is Frankie Watterson, Richard's dad. I thought this episode was pretty solid, and I think it does a good job picking up from the man episode. Because in that episode, Richard didn't like the idea of Granny Jojo going out with Louie because he doesn't want to lose her. So it would make sense that he doesn't like the idea of them getting married and going off together, given his abandonment issues. Especially since they're going to a place like Florida. Seriously, what the f- And in this episode, we finally meet Richard's dad. And it turns out that he's a mouse. I- I- I don't even know anymore. Eventually, the episode ends with Frankie trying to take over the Watterson house, so they end up going to Town Hall to stop him. The ending of the episode is honestly the best part. Not only does it have some funny moments, like always, It's blocked! And this goes nowhere! We're literally caught in 
a labyrinth of red tape! Then hashtag make, hashtag sure, hashtag you, hashtag stay alive to hashtag enjoy it! That's not how hashtags work. But we have a beautiful ending of Richard giving Frankie adoption papers to sign because he still wants his father back. Oh, uh, you got a restraining order, huh? No. Adoption papers. I want my dad back. I think this episode is pretty great. It's filled with funny moments and a lot of heart. I don't mean to be a dick, but this scene is pretty similar to the other scene from the crew. Look, copy and paste. I'm not kidding, look, look at this. You can't make this up. Anyway, Uncle Louie gives Gumball, Darwin, and Anais $5,000. So the kids talk about what they would do with the money. And each scenario they paint ends with humanity on the brink of destruction. What? I'm not kidding. Play the clip. Hello? Predators. My fellow Americans, I think we all know where this is going, so let's just skip to the end. Eventually, the episode ends with Nicole, Richard, Gumball, Darwin, and Anais racing over to the bank to cash the check for their own selfish motivations. Well, everybody except Nicole, because I think her reasons for getting the money makes more sense than anyone else. You know, I just realized something. Four out of five family members run the exact same way. Look at the way Richard, Darwin, Anais, and Gumball run. Why do you guys run like that? Nicole doesn't run like this. But I bet there will be an explanation for why she runs normally. As for the episode itself, I think it's pretty fun. Especially with the Watersons driving in their imaginary cars. Look, just, 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 just roll with it, okay? Just, just, just... Ignore the logic and just roll with it. How does she do that? And if she can do that, why does she need the money to fix the car? Just shut it and drive! And the twist at the end of the episode was pretty funny too. I forgot the decimal point. There. Oh, Fifty dollars. You want to know what I find funny about the whole car chase scene? The Watersons want to be seen as a normal family, if the egg is anything to go by. Yet they're constantly doing weird shit like this. But at the same time, I think any family would kill each other over $5,000. And once again, let's show some appreciation to Larry for stopping this family from killing each other. Hey guys, 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 what's the problem? We've been given $5,000 and we can't work out what to do. $5,000 between five of you? Well, that's $1,000 each. Yeah, $1,000 each! Once again, Larry is the real MVP. Hey, look, Gumball went Super Saiyan. Remember how he tried to do that back in the others? <laughs> Good for him. Anyway, Anais is being bullied. So Gumball and Darwin try to help her resolve things peacefully. But it turns out it's Billy from the Egg episode. Like, I thought it was a different bully, but no, it's just Billy from the Egg episode. How lazy. Midway through the episode, Anais just randomly leaves, resulting in Gumball dealing with Billy by himself. Eh, I don't know, man. I mean, it's a nice gesture of Gumball and Darwin trying to help out Anais resolve things peacefully, but I don't know. Just wasn't all that great of an episode to me personally. I mean, I will admit the fight between Gumball and Billy is kind of entertaining, I guess. And it turns out the reason for why Billy was being a dick to Anais is because he's in love with her and she doesn't feel the same way. Maybe it's because you ridiculed her favorite TV show in the Egg episode. And Daisy the donkey! <laughs> in an ironic way, of course. What? No, I love Daisy. <laughs> Oh, I'm Daisy, the incarnation of the dumbing down of a whole nation of children while cashing in on merchandising. Maybe that's why she wants nothing to do with you. Listen, if you want a boyfriend or girlfriend, don't make fun of the things they like. It's kind of a dick move. 
little Billy's life is awesome and it's very intelligent and rich, but Anais doesn't love him, so now he's a broken man. Things don't always work out the way you want in life, dude. I find this line rich with irony given Gumball's attitude back in the others, but whatever. It's an eh episode. Moving on. Mr. Robinson is selling his house, so Gumball and Darwin decide to stop him from making the sale. But hold on, if you've only just found out he's leaving, how'd you make that shrine so quickly? Ah, oh, you've had that forever. God, this is SpongeBob SquarePants levels of creepy. Wait a minute, why am I sensing deja vu? Because we love you, Mr. Robinson. God, this is almost SpongeBob SquarePants levels of creepy. Anyway, Mr. Robinson doesn't sell his house, moving on. Okay, okay. Gumball and Darwin reenacting police brutality was pretty accurate. Now get down on the ground! Oh. Sir, get up, sir! You have the right to remain silent! Now watch your head! Oh. Hey! This is not your car! I'm trying to do with Grand Theft Auto! Wow, I think the police are scarier than the criminals. But other than that, skip. Gumball and Darwin try to give Masami the perfect gift. Which is pretty difficult because she's the popular rich girl archetype. Eventually, this leads to Gumball and Darwin locking her in their basement. That's how you get frog flu. I'll prescribe wart cream, a healthy dose of reality, and far fewer princess movies. Ew, what, 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 what does that even add to the episode? Anyway, as for the episode itself, it's just the typical humanizing the mean girl archetype. You know what? Maybe this would be very interesting. If it hadn't been for the fact that I've seen this archetype being humanized a number of times already. But you know what? I'll give you points for trying. And be careful with the paint job. It costs more than you make it a year. Uh, let me fix that. Oh. Uh. Holy mother Anyway, the Watersons try looking for a parking space. And that's it, really. Ten minutes, and that's the entire premise. Oh, no! Some rebellious young person defaced this pretty fence. It's lucky I'm here to fix it. <gasps> Africa, ta -da! I like this callback. Anyway, a pretty simple episode that does everything you could do with it. The Watersons try looking for a parking space, which results in failure, until they eventually find a space, but it's back at home instead of at the mall. It's an A-tier episode. Moving on. Hmm. And thus begins our hero's quest. That's CGI broom, though. So, we have another Richard episode. Well, let's see what we got. Richard has to go get Mayo, but the twist with this episode is that it plays itself out like a medieval fantasy. So for me, I think it's way better than the Return episode, mainly because it's throwing curveballs at you with its medieval fantasy elements. It's one of the better Richard episodes in my opinion. Bobber gives himself an upgrade, and what do you know, the stuff that he's equipped with is pretty useless. <laughs> if they're trying to make a commentary on Apple, I think they're doing a fantastic job so far. Anyway, because of Bobber constantly buffering every minute or so, the company gives Gumball and Darwin a new Bobber, while the old one gets taken away. So now they have to use the new Bobber to get back the old one. I really like this episode because I see it as a commentary on Apple. Think about it. At the beginning of the episode, the company constantly brags about making new updates and changes to the world while introducing a new and upgraded version of Bobbert. Does that sound familiar to anyone? At first, Gumball and Darwin wanted an updated Bobbert, but after realizing that the update has a bunch of crappy mechanics implemented into it, they eventually get upset. I think you guys get the point. The only real difference is, is that Apple users are such slaves to Apple that they'll buy every single product that comes out. The new iPhone. Damn, another one? Uh, what are the new features? It doesn't matter. 
It's a new iPhone. Where's the line? You're right. Very true. So what can we expect with the new iPhone? Nothing at all. We are literally selling you the exact same iPhone X with a different name and a new camera feature. We're like NBA 2K. We just copy and paste. We don't really change much. Okay, it doesn't matter what Apple puts out. Apple could sell a cucumber for $2,000. People will buy it. Anyway, a great episode that makes good commentary on Apple. But at the same time, we Android users are much better. You're the Jeffers Laser Heart. You are. You're a superhero whose special power is your optimistic heart. That's awesome. I know, right? I made it myself. Gumball, I don't know why you're choosing to listen to a deranged stalker who stalks you every second of the day. But whatever. Gumball decides to become a hero called Laserheart, a character that's made up by Sarah. Oh, this should vote well. So, superheroes are lame. They wear their underpants on the outside, they have stupid names like Manatee Man, and have pointless powers like a super tongue or an elastic butt. The only people into them are fedora-wearing neckbeards, and I want nothing to do with it. Man, if we were in the 2010 decade right now, I would go on a full-blown rant on how superheroes aren't lame. And I will talk about how they're pretty popular right now, because during the 2010 decade, superheroes were at the height of their popularity, to the point where every single studio wanted to copy the Marvel Cinematic Universe formula. And I can see why, because Marvel was putting out some damn good movies at the time. Movies like The First Iron Man, The First Avengers, Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy, Civil War, Ragnarok, Infinity War, the best superhero movie out of all of them. Don't at me. And I guess Endgame. But now that we're in the 2020 decade where superhero movies are being made for the sake of, let me just get the list out, pushing a political agenda, making some pretty lackluster stories, assassinating each member of the Avengers for the sake of beefing up the rookies, forcing in representation because it's popular now, well, even more than it was before, and just milking money out of this franchise instead of letting it end after Endgame. So you know what? I'll let that comment slide. Anyway, this episode is just making fun of superhero tropes, and I really liked it. I really enjoyed watching Gumball attempt to be a superhero, and also Darwin tags along too. Okay, granted they are just playing out Sarah's sick crazy fanfiction, but this one is a little bit better than the fans, so I'll give you a tiny thumbs up for that. Also, there's a moment where a shadow creature robs Gumball, but don't worry, he faces karma in the end. So yeah, a pretty funny episode that makes fun of superheroes. And hey, did anyone notice that Spider-Man 2 reference? No? Well, you guys suck. Gumball forces Penny to go on a dangerous quest, all because she gave him one heart emoji instead of three. What is the what? Penny only signed up with one emoji with hearts for eyes instead of her usual three. I think you might be overreacting. You don't understand. I always get three. Yes, all of this happens because Gumball got one heart emoji instead of three. You blue mother... It's kind of adorable, I guess. Although I wasn't a big fan of... Let me just get the list out. Penny getting an allergic reaction, being stranded in the desert, and running for her life from a bunch of wild animals in the forest. Now that I think about it, this episode reminds me of The Fridge. Think about it. Nicole goes through extreme lengths to help Gumball reach his potential. And in here, Gumball goes through extreme lengths to help Penny remember all the great times they had together. It's not bad, it's just really, 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 really shocking, to say the least. After an entire minute of Darwin trying to get Gumball away from the computer so he doesn't binge watch endless videos, which ultimately fails, the duo spend the entire episode binge watching a barrage of videos one after the other. Now call me crazy, but I think this episode is really great. Sure, it's just a bunch of stupid videos one after the other, but I still found it to be pretty funny. What? 
The Amazing World of Gumball movie trailer. Click it. I'll say this much, this episode is way better than any clip show these two came up with. Okay, I probably shouldn't have said that, because Gumball came out with two shows whose episodes consist of nothing but clip show episodes. But we'll get to those episodes when we get to them, I promise. But for this episode, it's really good. Gumball decides to be Mr. Fitzgerald's apprentice for a day so that he can prove that he's good enough to be Penny's boyfriend. It's not as bad as I thought it would be, but it's still pretty boring though. I give it credit that Mr. Fitzgerald and Gumball's relationship does improve at the end of the episode. And I'll say this, this episode really goes to show how far Gumball's matured over the course of four seasons. I say it's a decent episode, but I don't plan on rewatching it anytime soon. Say. Because that's what you say every time we have pasta. What the what? I, I am not, not that predictable. predictable. <laughs> yeah, he's so predictable, he's done this dance three times in a row. Gumball tries to prove that he's unpredictable, so he ends up befriending this hot dog guy. I thought this episode was fucking hilarious. I mean, yes, it's following the formula of Gumball taking things too far until eventually it gets out of hand. But I just really enjoyed this episode. There are so many moments in this episode that you can take out of context and it'll make you laugh your ass off. What the? Uh, oh man! Okay. <sighs> hey! Wait a minute, I keep on pretending to be friends with this guy, but he doesn't even know my name. Hot dog guy? Huh, guess he does. A hilarious episode. Give it a watch. Bring it in! Yeah, you guys should just f***ing get it over with. I didn't like Margaret at first because she is a cold, heartless, unfeeling, cheating bitch. But this episode solidified my hatred for her. Wrong show. Yes, that one. Margaret Robinson shows off her evil side. Darwin, being the naive soul that he is, tries to show Gumball that there's some good in her. Eh, too easy of a joke. After she lets Darwin choke on a toy car, Darwin and by extension Gumball decide to teach her a lesson. Step 4, Disrespectful Victory Dance. Dude, this is the fourth time he's done this dance. What the fuck? This episode reminds me of an Ed, Ed, and Eddie episode. You know how the whole gimmick of the show was that it would punish characters for their wrongdoing? Well, sometimes. That's exactly how this episode operates. You have Margaret doing a bunch of horrible things throughout the episode, and all you want is for Karma to bite her puppet ass. And it does. Yes, the ending is by far the best part of this entire episode. They even make a throwback to the mystery from season 1. It's pretty good. I'm sure How To Basic would be honored to be referenced in an amazing World of Gumball episode. And also, that face. Gumball tries to get revenge on Alan for ditching him, but after discovering that Alan only ditched hanging out with Gumball because his mother was having surgery, Gumball and Darwin decide to help out with the surgery. This is just another episode where Gumball acts like a dick for no reason. The only reason why I don't hate it is because I think the jokes in here are pretty good. You can speak animal. Mm -hmm. 
So, what do they say? Bread, bread, bread. Bread, 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 bread. Bread, bread, bread. What? Uh, I, I don't know. I just expected you to... There's even some nice visual gags as well. It's not bad, but it's not great either. This episode focuses on the story of how Darwin joined the family, but for this part, we focus primarily on a four-year-old gumball and the other Darwins before our Darwin stepped into the picture. I gotta say, the numerous times they've killed these fishes is messed up, but it's pretty funny. What can I say? I have a messed up sense of humor. And in this episode, it's revealed that Darwin is from the Awesome Store, like the Evil Turtle. And I like how it's shown that Gumball and Darwin immediately have a strong connection with each other. So it makes the relationship a little bit more believable. So, with that introduction out of the way, let's get on to the second part. So for the second part, it's basically finding Gumball. After getting flushed down the toilet, Darwin makes his way back to Elmore. And while that's going on, Gumball tries to find him. You know, this is the first episode that made me cry like a little bitch, purely because of this whole sequence. It, it's... It's so sad. If you don't think this is sad, you are a heartless bastard. At least we have a nice musical number while watching this heartbreaking scene. In this episode, we get answers to questions that I've never had before. It's revealed in this two-parter that Gumball gave Darwin lungs and his own legs because of the connection they share. We even get a nice little animation sequence when we switch from one point of view to the other. And Jesus Christ, that ending. It goes from making me cry one minute when Darwin thinks that he's being replaced again to making me smile when the two finally reunite. And finally, it's revealed why Gumball doesn't wear shoes. Because he gave his last pair to Darwin. These two episodes are fucking outstanding, and they do a great job of making me appreciate Gumball and Darwin's friendship. It really goes to show how deep the relationship is. And not to mention, these two episodes are filled with such hard time and effort, and they made sure to answer some questions that fans had. The animation looks really great in these episodes, and it does a fantastic job of tugging at your heartstrings. Like, this episode made me cry like a bitch twice. Like, goddamn. These episodes are truly outstanding, and you need to give them a watch right now. Again, turn off this video and go watch them right now. Here. Oh, thank you. I'll never take them off. I feel like people get pissed off at me when I do this, but I do have one nitpick. Why aren't Darwin's feet censored? This is a kid's cartoon. What the hell is wrong with you? Oh, for God's sake, really? It's funny how we go from one of the greatest episodes in the entire series to arguably the worst episode in the entire series. And that's no exaggeration. Look at the IMDb score. It's noticeably lower compared to any other episode in the show's history. A lot of people have talked about this episode before, so I'll try to keep it brief. Jamie decides to make Darwin her boyfriend, and instead of telling her that he's not comfortable with the idea of dating her, he decides to say nothing throughout the entire episode. If you don't get it by now, this whole episode is a commentary on abusive relationships. You remember Screams of Silence from Family Guy? And the message of that episode was that if you were in an abusive relationship, you don't get to be called a woman. The fact that you are being abused has affected my life in the following ways. The sister that I knew and loved growing up no longer exists. The person I see before me now is just a punching bag. And I call you person and not woman because a woman is a strong, beautiful, vibrant creature. Which is heavily contradictory given the fact that Seahorse Seashell Party aired before this episode and the whole message of that episode was to say that if you were in an abusive relationship, you were so strong and heroic for doing so. Do you think it's possible that 
That this family can't survive without some sort of lightning rod to absorb all the dysfunction? Maybe if I feel bad, they don't have to. You know, that's incredibly noble and mature, Meg. You know, I think you might be the strongest person in this house. So yeah, this episode decides to follow in those episodes' footsteps by making a message saying that you should let an abuse victim stay in an abusive relationship and just hope that they get better. Because when a gorilla charges you, you stay still and say nothing. Why aren't you saying anything? It's simple. Her problem is that she doesn't understand love, so the best thing to do is to wait quietly until she works it out for herself. How could you let that happen to your own father and say nothing? Don't say anything. She has to work it out for herself. No, don't do anything either. Just stay. You know, dude, all you had to do was keep your mouth shut and say nothing. Three out of ten. I fucking hate this episode. Moving on. Mr. Small is depressed because he feels like he hasn't inspired the children of Elmore Jr. High. So Gumball and Darwin decide to help him out by taking his terrible advice to heart. <laughs> oh, I have so much advice for you. No offense, Mr. Small, but you're terrible at giving advice. If the sock from season one is anything to go by. It's a better episode compared to the last one. No, seriously, I'll take any episode over that one any day of the week. Even if this episode is a ripoff of the sock, I don't care. This episode is better than the last one. And besides, Mr. Small's song at the end of the episode is actually pretty nice. Before you judge someone, walk a mile in their shoes. A little backstory. When I watched this episode for the first time and I saw it was glitching like this, I ended up unplugging my cable box to fix it. Yeah, I know, I was dumb. The entire town of Elmore keeps glitching and spazzing out. Because of this constant glitching, Gumball ends up unintentionally insulting Darwin, so he tries to make it right, but the episode just won't let him. Dear Darwin, your butt ugly, your face is horrible, I hope we stop being friends over this, see you never Gumball. Eventually, Richard decides to take them out for ice cream, and then this happens. There's nobody driving the car. <gasps> In this third act, I realize they kept reusing the same screaming audio for Darwin three separate times. Take a listen. Okay, putting that aside, what about the episode itself? I like that it's a little self-referential. I also like how, because there's a broadcasting issue, the whole town gets affected by this. And just as Gumball and Darwin are about to discover that they're in a TV series, they end up in the dining room, where Richard says this. So we all got home, and everything was fine. You two made up, we're all safe, and all well, the ends well. <laughs> <laughs> this means Gumball and Darwin won't remember anything from this episode, because status quo is God. This isn't the first time they've made fun of the status quo. They've done this a total of two times so far. But it's still pretty effective here. It's a funny, self-referential episode. After reading Anais's diary, Gumball and Darwin find out that Anais is friends with a girl named Jody, a duck who uses Anais for her own selfish gain. And you know what we call that? A gumball. And I'm not being a jerk, that's literally what Darwin says. And this person is taking advantage of her weakness, and you know what that's called? A gumball? Uh, yeah, but I'm the only one who should be allowed to do that, okay? So Gumball and Darwin tried to get Anais to stop being friends with her. But then eventually, at the end of the episode, it's revealed that Anais is a parasite that literally fused herself to Jody. Hey, get off my sisters! Everything! Leave us alone! Oh, it's not so bad, Squidward. Now we can be best buddies and do everything together. Forever! Let's finish this. Remember the episode where Anais thought she had an imaginary friend? It made me ask a question, why doesn't Anais have any friends? There should be an episode where she gets a friend of her own. And this episode answered that question. The reason why she doesn't have any friends 
is because she is a parasitic leech that latches onto anyone within sneezing distance. I thought it was a fine episode. Also, I like this Last of Us reference. Then when you think you guys are friends, she takes over your mind, attaches herself to your body, and before you know it, she's turned you into a fungus thingy so she can release her spores, contaminate more people, and destroy civilization as we know it! Speaking of which, what do you guys think about Last of Us on PS5? Cool or no? Tell me in the comment section below. The town of Elmore tries to teach Bobbert the meaning of love. It kind of reminds me of that episode where Gumball and Darwin tried to find the meaning of life. Even the layout of the episode reminds me of the world, the extra, and the butterfly, as we focus on other characters' descriptions of what love is. It's alright for what it is. And, I'm sorry, it needs to be said, the song in here really sucks. After a long 1 minute and 22 second rap number by Gumball, he ends up running into Hot Dog Guy. And what do you know, things end up being awkward. Oh, this is awkward. <laughs> hey, remember the hug? I remember the hug. It was a pretty humorous episode, but I guess the writers loved that episode so much, they decided to make a sequel to it. Yes, this is a direct follow-up to the Hug episode. And how does it stand? It's basically the same thing as the Hug. Gags, awkward humor, and all. Hey! This is my private happy place! What are you doing here? Not really my choice. What the- How? Well, we hit a bump and- uh... I don't think it's bad. It's basically just the same thing as the Hug. That's all there is to say. It's just awkward humor throughout 10 minutes. But I will admit, there are some pretty nice jokes in here. Oh, come on! Could you just open the door, please? And we're stuck. It's a step up compared to the last episode. And I just realized something. Darwin doesn't make an appearance in this episode. <laughs> Ain't that some shit. After Gary, that's his name, goes missing, Gumball and Darwin try to figure out who kidnapped him. And then eventually they discover that the culprit is their evil turtle and her babies. Oh, it's a her by the way. This is another episode where the creepy factor gets bumped up to, forget a hundred, a million. Especially with the Watersons discovering that there's a nest under their house. Let me tell you something, when I first saw this episode, I flipped shit. I couldn't look under my bed for a solid week. It's a pretty great episode. The best part of this episode is when the baby turtles start to take over Elmore, which is an obvious parody of Gremlins. We even get nice fitting music while they do their takeover. Huh? <laughs> and at the end of the episode, the Watersons say goodbye to the evil turtle. And, I will admit, it's a pretty nice moment. Despite the fact that that turtle is an evil, savage creature that attacked Gumball at every given opportunity. But it's still a pretty good episode. Gumball and Darwin do Tobias' chores in order to get some points for this video game. Oh boy. I mean, I do like how they vaguely talk about microtransactions, but... Neither, because corn farmers for plebs like to get ripped off spending real money on a virtual pig to go with their windmill. We're playing Gallic Trek, and we're about to buy a virtual space hawk to go with our solar generator. Honestly, the mere concept of the episode sounds pretty generic. The side character gets the main character to do their chores in exchange for something that the main character wants. It's something I've seen done in plenty of other shows, including ones I've ranked before. But what makes this one interesting is the third act, when Tobias starts using the weapons he purchased in the game. Okay, yes, granted it is in their imagination, but still. 
This episode took a generic concept and they at least tried to do something with it. The only good thing about this episode is the ending. Other than that, it's an okay episode. Rocky decides to help the kids play hooky by not going to school today. But what they don't know is that this whole thing is hijacked so the parents can teach them a lesson about skipping school. A pretty humorous episode. Although it did annoy me that all the kids were stupefied in this episode, with the exception of Gumball, who acts as the straight man. Uh, Dad? It's Mr. Pink. Fine, Mr. Pink. I know it's you, Dad. Uh, I'm just a criminal. How did I become a criminal, you ask? I didn't ask. I sure. So, I assume you all ended up in a life of crime through skipping school? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we eventually get into the plot twist that the whole thing was planned by Rob. And I gotta say, that's a pretty nice plot twist. I also think Rob does a good job of being a bad guy in this episode and the disaster. But, but don't worry, don't worry. We'll get to that episode soon, I promise. A really solid episode. An episode that goes through the dreams of every single resident in Elmore. I thought this was a pretty stellar episode. Similar to the world in the extras, it focuses on every single character, not just Gumball and Darwin. I thought some of the dream sequences in this episode were pretty hilarious and creative. There were some moments in the episode where I did start nitpicking. For example, in Larry's dream, they reused the background from the countdown episode. Oh, I thought we had more, sorry. We even get some nice fourth wall breaking in this episode. And I thought the dream sequence with Daisy the donkey was honestly the best one out of all of them. Because it feels like it's a parody of Toy Story. You're my best friend, Nice. That was my dream. A pretty fun episode. I know this point I'm about to make has nothing to do with the episode itself necessarily, but this is the episode where I realized that Gumball's voice was really starting to take a dip. Okay, first, you don't have ears. And secondly, this is what people do when they want to get out of a conversation without being mean. While making his way over to the mall for his date with Penny, Gumball ends up running into multiple people on the way. And instead of telling them to fuck off so that he can go to his date, he ends up making things needlessly complicated to the point where every single character he's ran into ends up meeting him at the mall. Characters include Banana Joe, these construction workers, this hobo, shape people, and Richard. And I'm really sorry, but it's just not funny to me. I get the whole joke is that it's meant to be a misunderstanding, but still, <laughs> it's just not funny. If you guys like it, that's cool, but for me, I didn't find this episode funny in the slightest. It's just taking one gag and overstretching it to 10 minutes. You don't like that opinion? Well, fuck you, it's my list. Why does that bear look so familiar? Oh, it's a copy and paste character model. Gotcha. Uh, mom? I know, sweetie. Don't think about it too much. You see, this is exactly what I mean when I say that this world can get so confusing sometimes. The Watersons think Darwin is homesick. At first, they try helping him cope, but when that doesn't work, they think it's natural that he should go back to his normal habitat. What are you looking at? Darwin's browser history. The what? <laughs> Sorry, we had no idea you were techy enough to check out internet browser histories. Please, go on. You guys know you could just clear your browser history, right? Like, there's no need to do any of this. It's like what Johnny said in Ted 2. What, what do you mean? Let's just delete the files! But I guess doing this extra shit makes it more funnier. It's pretty funny, I'm not gonna lie. But it turns out that Darwin isn't homesick, and he tried emotionally manipulating Nicole into getting him a new tank. And you know what we call him? A Watersend! <sighs> yeah, that's basically it. I thought this episode had a bunch of good jokes in here. You can nibble the dead skin off my foot. I think I'm gonna skip dinner tonight. Thanks. What? That's what fish do! I've seen it! What's up with them? Apparently, we now swim as a school. Why? All I got for an answer was... Okay. And much like the genius, this episode goes to show how much the Watersons love Darwin and consider him a member of the family. 
Sure, they've done this before, but still, I think it's pretty good. Hey look, it's Gumball's second voice actor. Karen decides to ban all video games for how much of a negative effect they have on the world. So in return, Gumball tries to show her that video games can be good for people. But when he fails, he and his friends decide to use their trump card, blaming books, with this pretty awesome rap number. It's a pretty solid commentary on how parents are so quick to blame video games instead of focusing on the bigger issue, how you raise your kids. You know what? I think I'll let Billy take it from here. But the nub of the argument is thus. Video games are shouldering the burden of a deeper problem. It is not the material that's to blame, but how parents teach their children to respond to it. Yeah, basically that's the message. And I say this episode still holds up to today's standards. And it doesn't have to be specifically video game related. It could be related to other things like, uh, how parents respond to two gay characters kissing on screen. Saying that if we allow gay characters to kiss on screen, it could have a negative effect on their kids. Or some dumb shit like that, I don't know. And throughout the episode, it makes numerous references to other video games like Star Fox, Space Invaders, Tetris, Legend of Zelda, Mario, Pac-Man, Minecraft, and Metal Gear Solid. And it doesn't stop there. They make references to books too. Books like Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Little Red Riding Hood, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, Lord of the Flies, Oliver Twist, and Dracula. So yeah, this episode has a ton of great stuff in it. Good commentary, nice references, and all around, great stuff. And the ending is so realistic to the point where I bet shit like this would happen in real life. Books can be as dangerous as video games. There's only one reasonable thing to do. Become better parents and look after our children in a sensible way. No. <laughs> How about a more manly version of the classic French greeting? Okay, do this. And now you kiss my guns. Too manly? Yeah. Darwin, you've kissed Gumball a number of eight or nine times already. I don't know, I've honestly lost count. Anyway, Gumball tries to get Tobias to slap his butt. And that's the premise throughout the whole episode. I should be annoyed with this, right? But you know what? I don't care. <laughs> it was really funny. Here, friend, have some of my dessert. Lap it up, lap it up good. <laughs> Look, buddy, if you don't back off, I'm gonna have to get physical. Yes, use your anger and fall into my trap, you worm. I haven't touched you and I already feel like I need to wash this hand. I had a pretty fun time watching this WTF did I just watch episode. And it's because this is definitely something that Gumball would do. Remember the extreme lengths he went through in the Society episode? What is he doing? <sighs> He's checking for membership tattoos. <laughs> One more thing this episode does right is that it keeps Gumball's character consistent. And more importantly, <laughs> it's a funny episode. It's way better than the Misunderstanding episode. And guess what? When Gumball finally gets what he wants, how dare you! You've got some nerve, young man! There are rules in this society and casually slapping people's butt is not one of them! It's so freaking hilarious. Okay, the song in here was a little eh, but who cares? The rest of the episode was great. Anais's toy, Daisy the Donkey, goes missing. So she pulls a detective and tries to find her. I thought it was a pretty decent parody of detective shows. Especially with Anna East monologuing throughout the episode. And it's a pretty entertaining case, as she finds out that Gumball and Darwin destroyed the toy, and surprisingly enough, Darwin tries to dispose of the toy while Gumball runs away from the situation. It was Gumball who ran away. It was Gumball who lost the argument. It was Darwin's plan to destroy the evidence. Why can't you do this? Because I don't have a foldable thumb! You goddamn liar! I don't know, man. This just doesn't sit right with me. I mean, this is Gumball we're talking about. I would expect him to throw away the toy, not Darwin. I'm telling you, it's like the lesson all over again. Because in that episode, Darwin recommended to Gumball that they should cheat on the math test. 
You know, it, it's it's a major head scratcher. Like, why would Darwin do this? But you know what? Whatever. It's a good episode overall. You're not half the person I used to know. Your butt, on the other hand, is twice the size. OMG. Hey, I, I, I wasn't gonna say anything, but the episode did it for me. I thought it, but I didn't say it. Masami's mother, Yuri, demands a rematch against Nicole, but unfortunately for her, she doesn't want to fight. So throughout the episode, Yuri pulls some middle school tactics on Nicole. And the reason for why Yuri is doing this is because these two have history with each other. Like every other anime rivalry, these two started off as friends that used to train together, and then when it came to the martial arts tournament, Nicole beat Yuri. And instead of just letting it slide, I can't let this slide! Bro, get a new fucking catchphrase. She held a grudge. I like this episode because the story feels like a good parody of anime shows like My Hero Academia, Dragon Ball Z, you know, animes like that. It's hard to talk about this episode without mentioning the fight at the end. They didn't need to go this hard, but they did. And let me tell you, I loved every single frame of that fight. Sure, you anime sans may say it's not up there with anime, but I don't care. I still loved it. You also get a nice flashback sequence that's animated in the style of manga. I like Nicole and Yuri's friendship, and I was happy to see them make up at the end of the episode. Sure, it's not original, but stop nitpicking. It's a fucking outstanding episode. Give it a watch right now. Yes, third time I'm doing this. Give it a watch right now. Come on, guys. Let's go home. <laughs> oh, please. It was just a little argument between friends. Yeah, no harm done. <laughs> Much like the tape, this episode serves as a compilation video of all the people in Elmore. And that's basically the episode. It serves as a sequel to the tape. But you might be wondering, which one do I like the most? Well, to be honest, I like both of them equally. It's a fun little episode with a fantastic musical number. Also, this is another time where Gumball and Darwin kiss. <sighs> I, I did... I don't keep numbers anymore. This is just another time where these two kiss. Also, I just want to go on a little rant here. There's a moment where this episode references the creepypasta, the grievening. And to this day, this part of the episode has not been edited out. I say this because in a recent Spongebob episode, Spongebob in Random Land, there's a moment where they reference Squidward's suicide. And in re-releases of this episode, they've edited this portion out. I don't know why they did that. I mean, Cartoon Network literally uploads this portion of the episode to their YouTube channel. So why doesn't Nickelodeon do that? And for the people who are going to say, well, they didn't show the actual creepypasta. Still though, that's a bullshit excuse. Keep the scene in. Okay, moving on. Wow, good Halloween mask. It's not a mask. I'm allergic to the face paint. Jesus, it's only been 52 seconds and we already have a horrific facial design. It's Halloween time in Elmore, and Gumball has formulated a plan to get more candy. By basically being Ghostbusters. Except there's no real ghost haunting the school, and it's just Carrie participating in Gumball's scam. Darwin originally didn't want to partake in this, but after hearing that he could get close to Carrie with this scam, he immediately jumps on board. Okay, when do we start? I want to call him a simp so goddamn bad. <sighs> but he gets the girl in the end, so I can't do it. I'm sorry. Yeah, as I said before, this whole episode is a glorified parody of the original Ghostbusters. I like that. We even get Carrie to join the main duo again. It's always fun to see these three hang out. And I think the third act of this episode is way better than the Halloween episode. Because Goliath... <laughs> This ghost that Carrie pretends to be is real, and he's on the verge of destroying the school, so now Gumball, Darwin, and Carrie have to exterminate the ghost for real this time. The third act is a ton of fun, with Goliath chasing Gumball, Darwin, and Carrie throughout the school. This episode is better than the Halloween episode in my opinion, mainly because I love the original Ghostbusters, and any parody of the original Ghostbusters is an automatic win in my book.
When I was watching this episode, I realized the song that the Watersons are singing in the car lines up perfectly with the outro. Here, give it a listen. Stop it with your yawning, it's a lovely morning. We're off to buy some stuff at the Elmore Mall. Now, try them together. Stop it with your yawning, it's a lovely morning. We're off to buy some stuff at the Elmore Mall. Saturdays are cool, cause we don't go to school. And I am gonna buy some donkey drool. Nothing can go wrong, we'll, we'll be, be happy, happy all day long. And, and that's, that's the reason why we sing this song. Cool, right? So for this episode, Rob gets his hands on a universal remote which is basically the Infinity Gauntlet in this universe. He uses this remote control to ruin Gumball's life, and much like Thanos in Infinity War, he actually manages to succeed. Only for this win to get butchered by the next part because he stupidly threw the remote into the void before forcing Gumball to go into said void. You stupid idiot! Well, that's retarded. That's like after Thanos uses the stones to achieve his goal, he hands over said stones to the Avengers just so they can undo the snap. Okay, putting that aside, this episode is fucking fantastic. It's the perfect way to end season 4. Because throughout the season, Rob said he was going to be the villain. He said he was going to get his revenge on Gumball. And he does just that. He causes Gumball's family to be pissed off at him. He breaks up Gumball and Darwin's friendship. He manages to break up Richard and Nicole's marriage, and he broke up Penny and Gumball's relationship right before almost killing her. And Rob's motivations for why he's doing this goes a lot deeper than just wanting revenge on Gumball for fucking him up and forgetting about him. I wanted to be the cute sidekick who gets his own plush toy in a spin-off show. He didn't want to be the villain of the story, but he was forced by the creators. Oh, I forgot to mention, this episode goes really overboard with its fourth wall breaking. And you know what? I'm honestly okay with it. I usually don't like fourth wall breaking in shows, but I think they do it perfectly well here. A phenomenal first part. Now, let's get into the second part. Much like Avengers Endgame and regular show's finale, Gumball tries to stop Rob's wrath. It's just as great as the first one, except this one has a lot more messed up deaths. Anais fades from existence because Richard and Nicole have regressed down to babies, Darwin just flat out dies right there on the spot, and then soon Gumball almost fades away from existence as well. What makes this episode great is the ending. Sure, it's reverting back to the status quo, but at least Rob and Gumball end on good terms with each other. And the reason why that is is because Gumball risked his life to go save Rob from the void. And that was pretty nice. Overall, these two parters were pretty fantastic. And hey, did anyone notice that Rob's voice sounded a little... weird? And the time has come for you to pay. This is too dangerous. Huh, maybe it's just me. Remember when Gumball and Darwin rescued Molly from the Void? Well then, you might as well send her ass back, because the problem with this character is that she doesn't stop talking. It was my favorite pencil as well. It <sighs> feels like we've been walking down this corridor for half an hour now. And yeah, that's the gist of the episode. Gumball, Darwin, and their classmates have to suffer through Molly's non-stop boring stories. Like seriously, why can't you guys just say that her stories are shit? I just don't have the heart to hurt her feelings. Okay, okay. Good continuity. I'll give you that. I love the dodgeball segment in the middle of the episode. That was pretty awesome. And the episode's concept is pretty relatable. Come on, I'm pretty sure when you were in school, you had a friend that wouldn't shut their goddamn mouth, making up stories that obviously weren't true. And overall, everything they said was just boring as fuck. But anyway, the episode itself is pretty good. Now I know what you're thinking. Christian, you just shit talk Molly for being a boring character. I know, I know. But I can honestly relate to her. I mean, for God's sake, there's a moment where she hangs out in the bathroom because it's her dark space. 
a special dark place. You know, it's where you go when no one wants to talk to you because you have nothing interesting to say and you feel really boring and awkward. Don't you have one? Okay, are you gonna... <laughs> Come on, kid, that's it. <laughs> oh, no, Stewie's having a tantrum. <laughs> As a loner myself, I felt that. And I thought the end of the episode was pretty nice. I thought it was a relatable episode for a loner like me. This is the third episode of Anna is trying desperately hard to get a friend. Let's see if she succeeds. Did you see that? He wants to be my friend! Great! How much did he charge you? What? Nothing. Hmm, that's weird. Yeah, it must be after something. Okay, you might think I should get on Gumball and Darwin for the way they're acting, but remember The Parasite, an episode that showed Anna is literally fusing herself to Jody, so I can see why they're acting this way. Anna East makes another friend, and no, he isn't imaginary, and he wasn't forced against his will to be her friend. But because Anna East feels insecure about this friendship, she gets Gumball and Darwin to put Josh that's his name, through a series of tests to see if he's good enough to be her friend. I just want to say there's a whole scene dedicated to Gumball and Darwin doing the stupid transformation sequence that's a parody of Power Rangers. I didn't realize that until just now. The episode consists of Gumball and Darwin putting Josh through all these crazy scenarios because they think there's something wrong with him. And, shocker, at the end of the episode, it's revealed that he's a total wingnut. Yeah, now she's my friend, she'll be cryogenically frozen with me until the year 4983, when our great and powerful leader, Krautok, will be finally hatched from his meat egg and rule us all. What? Look, here's a picture of him. That's... a frog. What a twist! Moving on. Hey look, another, let's focus on the side characters instead of focusing on Gumball and Darwin episode. Sure, why not? Like the other episodes, the tape, the world, the extra, the butterfly, the night, and the compilation, this is an episode that focuses on the world of Gumball instead of Gumball himself. It's Saturday and Gumball and Darwin are bored, so they start roaming around Elmore to see if there's anything going on. This episode is exactly like the previous episodes I've stated, but I don't mind it as much because the town of Elmore is so entertaining to watch, so I don't care that they've recycled this idea like six times. And also, it has a regular show cameo, and that automatically made me happy. Oh, and there's a Clarence and Uncle Grandpa cameo in here too, but... <laughs> Who really cares? While roaming through Alan's hard drive, Gumball and Darwin come across Alan's secret plans for world domination. A manifesto on how I will gain the power I need to purge Elmore Jr. High of its greatest problem? What? It's always the ones you least suspect. So Gumball and Darwin try to stop him. I think it's a pretty great episode. I mean, it does draw some parallels to the safety episode, but I think it's just as great as that episode. I just like the idea of the friendliest, nicest character ever taking over the world and making things better, and it's seen as evil. But Alan is an exception because what he's doing is actually evil. A manifesto on how to forcibly seize power and eradicate sadness across the globe. <laughs> and the ending of the episode is pretty funny, with Gumball and Darwin trying to kill Alan. A pretty great episode, give it a watch. Oh boy, The Choices, widely considered to being the greatest episode of all time, to the point where people consider it a masterpiece. This is gonna take a while, so uh, 
indulge with me if you can. Well, obviously you've been indulging with me if you've been watching up to this point in the video, but whatever. Hmm, something's burning. Why does he keep losing his whiskers? God damn. During a disastrous family dinner, Nicole starts to reminisce on the day she met Richard, but she starts to wonder, what would her life be like if she chose a different path on her way to the karate tournament? And that's exactly what the episode does. But before we talk about the different choices she has at her disposal, we finally get to see what Nicole's parents are like. And needless to say, I can see why Nicole is the way she is. And remember, I know, I know, I love you too. No, I was going to say second place is first place for losers, but yeah, that too. No, no. Everything, Anais, not just clothes. The couch is a thing, are you wearing that? What? <laughs> no arguing, young lady. You need to learn to be a good loser. Uh, what is it with this traffic? No! Dad! <laughs> but don't worry, we'll talk about them soon enough. The first path shows her making her way to the tournament, and she ends up being a success, but she ends up being a tyrannical dictator that gets overthrown. The second path shows her marrying Banana Bob. It starts off solid, but because Banana Bob constantly says banana every single time, she eventually goes insane. The third path shows her marrying Harold, and... How do you like the sushi? It took me hours. It's cold. Let me heat it up for you. Is that hot enough for you? Is it, is it hot enough? Is it hot enough for you? Yeah, that happens. And the last three paths end with her being dead. So eventually this leads her to Richard, the last path for her to take. And I gotta say, they make an adorable couple. And as for the rest of the episode, we get a beautiful montage of Richard and Nicole living their lives together. Sure, they've been through some ups and downs, but throughout it all, they still manage to get through, together. Much like the question, this is another episode that gives a good message on life. When Nicole asks, I mean, what should I do with my life? Richard, of all people, says, Maybe start living it? There's not much I can say with this one. It's a phenomenal episode. We explore Nicole's background. We see how her and Richard met. There are lots of heartwarming and beautifully done moments. It has a good amount of comedy, and it gives a solid message to the audience. Please watch this episode. Yes, I'm telling you again, please watch this episode, give it a watch. You will not be disappointed. Something from a time long forgotten, a mystical repository of long lost knowledge, which the ancient people call are you trying to say book? Exactly! You guys have read books before. Stop being dumb. The Watersons don't have any Wi-Fi, so Gumball and Darwin decide to recreate the internet in real life. Plung. What's that? Your inbox! Ah, oh, cute! It's like the little email icon. Plung. Ah. Boop, 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 boop. Hey! And when that fails, they decide to go over to Mr. Robinson's house and get Mr. Robinson's internet password so they can get the internet back. Mom said I have to take you to the park. You're going to have to hack Mr. Robinson to get the password. How? Oh. Ah, I left instructions for you. I know this is unrelated, but this is the second time Anais has been carried around like a dog. The first time was in the second episode of the series, and the second time is now. Come on, it's for your own safety. Mom said I have to take you to the park! Barf! 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 Woof! 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 There were some pretty humorous moments in here. This tank is completely unsuitable for modern warfare. Though the glass panels provide a wide field of vision, I worry my fish will be exposed to enemy fire. Tooth! Larry's coming! Nah, it's fine. The beauty of trolling is that you're anonymous. <laughs> my grandma's really sick. Aww, I like that. What do you mean you like it? Sorry, man. There's no button to express sympathy without having to do all that typing. I mean, after all, we're only Elmore Plus friends. But the best part of the episode was the third act, because the animation changes when Gumball and Darwin enter the cyberspace. No, not that one. Yes, this one. And all together, it makes for a pretty enjoyable episode. Ah, do something! <laughs> for God's sake, you'll censor Darwin's feet, but you won't censor his ass? 
Come on, censor that shit. After taking one of those lame tests, in this case it's what kind of sitcom character are you, Gumball realizes that he's the loser in his world. Took him five seasons, but he finally figured it out. The what? I'm the loser? Of course, you're the character the audience likes to laugh at. A loser. Usually likes to criticize everyone, but stays completely oblivious to their own failings. So he decides to be a much nicer person, which is actually working out for him. Well, aside from the fact that his body is consuming a large amount of venom. Your hair looks like a red star. What was that? The venom I'm keeping inside. And with Gumball being the nice guy, Tobias takes over as the loser of the show, which is actually pretty fitting. Why? Because in a previous episode, The Voice from Season 2, it was revealed that Tobias was jealous of Gumball's life, because as Tobias said, Have you ever noticed that nothing in this world is set up as it should be? I should be more important! I should be the one with the sidekick and exciting adventures. I'm more handsome, richer, and more colorful than you guys, and yet, it's like I'm the supporting character of my own life! So it's kind of funny that he's taken over as the main character. And it's not just that. They even make fun of sitcom tropes in this episode, like the classic Christmas special, the terrible jokes, the inconsistent continuity, adding another character for the sake of boosting ratings, that annoying laugh soundtrack, and the picture has a ratio of 4x5 instead of 16x9. I really love the clever jokes in this episode. And finally, the episode does end with Gumball being the loser again, by doing this. An awesome episode. It also wants to know my hobbies. Well? I like cheese and internet memes. Stop doing that. Gumball and Darwin help Rocky sign up for online dating. Oddly enough, this episode reminds me of that Family Guy episode where Quagmire got exposed to Tinder. Except this one has a better set of jokes. Whoa! But even with that, it's still not a great episode. There's this girl that Rocky ran into at the mall, and throughout the episode, he tries to track her down. And then when he finally runs into her, guess what? She's not interested. Wait! Wait. So... So... Uh... What's the message for this episode? Um... Dating sucks? And you know what, this episode reminds me of another episode from another TV show. More specifically, the regular show episode, Skips in the Saddle. Fill out a form and put it in the suggestion box. <sighs> Where do I file a complaint about the suggestion box? Please post it in the complaint box. And where's that? <laughs> That's funny. Sometimes I wish I could just go straight to the end of the process. What, like going full sausage? No, just be an adult already. Dude, you were an adult once, remember? <laughs> what am I saying? Of course you don't. Gumball and Darwin tried to teach Bobbert about safety, but obviously that doesn't work, and we get a bunch of things like this. Bobbert tried to hurt Gumball. Ow! Okay, new rule. How about you just uphold the law? According to the law in New Jersey, it is illegal to slurp your soup. Uh, no! All life must be protected, including yours. Scanning for threat to life on Earth. Compiling data. Primary threat to life on Earth detected. Mankind. Like the last one, this episode has a bunch of good jokes. But honestly, they've run Bobbert's character into the ground at this point. Seriously, we've had five whole episodes dedicated to him. It's starting to get a little repetitive. And as for the third act of the episode, they copy the premise of the safety and the vision. Remember in those episodes when Alan and Darwin tried to commit world domination? That's exactly what Bobbert's doing. After Gumball and Darwin told him to protect all life on Earth, he starts doing his research, and he comes down to the conclusion to kill all humans. Kill all humans. Kill all humans. Must kill all humans. Bender, wake up! <clears throat> I was having the most wonderful dream. I think you were in it. 
and it's because they are the biggest threat to this planet. It's an alright episode. I just hope that later down the line, we take a break from Bobbert. Also, this is the episode where I realized that Gumball and Darwin's voice actors are getting too old for this shit. We have to stop Bobbert before he... saves the world? You said all lives should be protected, even a virus, so you can't make us extinct. This will be important for the next episode. The episode that rips the Chinese knockoff show Miracle Star a new one. For those who don't know, there was this show called Miracle Star. And the premise of that show was... Basically ripping off the amazing world of Gumball. If you want to know more about it, I strongly recommend you watch Saber Sparks' video, as he delves into this topic way more than I can. So you're probably wondering why am I talking about Miracle Star? Well, Gumball decided to roast these guys for their 168th episode. God, 168 episodes. Jesus, time flies. Anyway, the Watersons come across the copycat family. At first, they don't think much of it. But after realizing that they're making money off their lives... <coughs> sorry, something stuck in my throat. They decide to live their lives in the most dangerous way possible in the hopes that the copycats will do the same. This episode is brilliant. They rip into the Chinese knockoff pretty well. The Be Your Own You song is pretty catchy. It has a very solid message about being original and not copying other people's works. Which is pretty ironic coming from this show, but whatever. And finally, the gags in this episode cross the line so many times that it would make South Park proud. So yeah, this episode is really awesome. Oh, remember when I said that Gumball and Darwin's voice actors have hit their growth spurt? Well, like the previous actors before them, they got replaced. Yeah, as if anyone else could do what I do. Yeah, we're irreplaceable. <laughs> <laughs> potato, potato, potato. I'll just eat those. I'll go ask for some fries. Uh, those are potato too. What did you think french fries were made of? French people? SMH, dude. SMH. Dude, tech sling is for phones. We use real words when we talk with our mouths. Exactly. Don't do that. I'm so insensitive. Yeah, maybe you need to think about how other people feel. Look who the fuck is talking. After getting the impression that he insulted Idaho, Gumba helps Darwin stop eating potatoes. But it's a lot harder than it seems. And when Gumball's tactics don't work, they turn to Sarah the Stalker. Do we really have to tell you or will you just admit that you've been eavesdropping and already have a solution? I sure do! Just leave it to Scoop Dog! Stop it. Stop. Just stop doing that. I thought it was a solid episode with the typical misunderstanding plot twist. Why do I say that? It turns out that Idaho isn't upset about Darwin eating potatoes, even though he really should because Penny got pissed off at Gumball for eating peanuts in season one. What? What? Oh, nothing. I just said I love peanuts. <laughs> yeah, peanuts. They, they taste so good. Gumball, I am a peanut. That's like me saying I like to eat cats. I'm so confused! He's upset about Gumball calling him bro Tato. It's fine, but I'll give it a higher rating because the potato song was really good. Nicole makes a fuss about Richard supposedly forgetting their wedding anniversary. But Richard and the kids don't know that. So throughout the episode, they try to figure out why she's so pissed off. And when Richard figures out that it's the anniversary he's forgotten, he decides to get the date tattooed on his body. I thought this episode had a ton of funny moments. Like Nicole bursting into song only for her family members to ruin it. Her talks about subtext. It's all in the subtext, like when someone says, I'm only two minutes away. Or, it's fine, honey. And overall, just her making a big fuss. Can you please just tell us why today is so special so this family can get back to functioning in its usual dysfunctional way? 
because I'm pretty sure that's relatable for some of, if not all of us. We've all had that one person that's made a fuss about something, and instead of telling you outright, they want you to figure it out for yourself. How am I supposed to know if I don't know, you know? No. Of course you don't know. I thought the neutral song was pretty funny too. No, this idea is not strong. This is clearly a Christmas song. We can't get this up for too long, so tell us what's wrong. As well as Richard using his head for the first time in his life. I got it. What is it? We asked for a clue. Uh. And guess what? Much like the last episode, there's a twist. It turns out that Richard and Nicole's wedding anniversary is November 1st, which is what she thought today's date was. But the actual date for that day was October 11th. I'm glad that Nicole admits that she was wrong. Okay, she doesn't blatantly say she was wrong, but at least she's aware that she was wrong. Because usually characters like this would stay stubborn and insist that they were in the right in spite of how obviously wrong they were. Hand it over. Everything of value. I said everything! Is this really necessary, Mom? Stop pulling out your teeth. That looks so uncomfortable to look at. After the Watersons go over to Frankie's house and see how much of a shithole it is, they decide to invite him over to their house. By making it into a prison. Yeah, I don't know. I personally didn't like this episode at all. If you guys thought this episode was funny, good for you. If you thought this episode was good, good for you. But for me, it wasn't funny, and I just don't like it. Could you do us a big favor and just uh, hold this for maybe five seconds? But whatever you do, don't drop it. Sure. Uh, why couldn't you have managed that when I was a baby? Well, that explains why Gumball is the way he is. Nicole wants Gumball, Darwin, and Anais to break this vase that Granny Jojo gave her. But it's a lot harder than it seems. With no other choice, they go to the junkyard to break it. But Nicole tries to stop them because it turns out that Roosevelt's ashes are in that vase. Switch it on! Oh, wait, wait, wait! Darwin, you do realize we're trying to break this thing? Sorry. We get picked up by that magnet and get dropped into Rat Rapture! What? Are you insane? Hey look, it's the junkyard from season 2. Anyway, I thought this episode was pretty funny. Seeing the different ways that the kids would try to break the vase makes for some pretty entertaining moments. And I thought the twist was pretty clever, even though it's like the seventh twist this season. And the junkyard scene was pretty cool, as it solidifies how much of a badass Nicole is. A pretty good one. Who else have you kissed? Mm. Rachel, Carrie, Gumbo, Gumbo, Gumbo. Okay, what's up with you guys? They've kissed more than that. They've kissed either nine or ten times at this point. Again, I've lost count. After a one minute musical number called Without You, a pretty well done song by the way, Gumball discovers that Darwin has a crush on Terry. Would you help me make her fall in love with Darwin? Oh, well, it depends. Who's the her in this conversation? Terry! Darwin's into Terry. I know! Weird, right? I thought he was into you, but nope, it's definitely Terry. But he has a crush on Carrie, not Terry. Gumball, you know this. You saw him kiss Carrie in the Halloween episode from season 2. And although they try to excuse this by explaining that Gumball doesn't know that Carrie doesn't appear in photos, again, he should already know this. He tried recording Carrie in the tape from season 2, and she wasn't visible. So how can they get this right? No, no. Carrie, cover your eyes! You do realize I can see through my hands, right? Oh, whatever! I can still see. Yet they don't get this right. Carrie Kruger, ask Carrie. Uh Oh, that's not a photo of Terry. It's of Carrie. But she doesn't show up on film. What? Congratulations. 
you played yourself. So Gumball decides to play matchmaker with the help of Carrie, who in return sabotages his plans at first. But eventually she decides to put Darwin's happiness ahead of her own by making a love potion. That's pretty nice. I like that. And then it's revealed, no fucking shock, that Darwin had a crush on Carrie this whole time. What a twist! So now they try to break up Darwin and Terry's relationship. Another great payoff. They've developed this whole Carrie and Darwin ship since season 2. So it's nice to see them finally get together in the end. I think it's right up there with the shell from season 3. The Watersons get a mysterious box on their porch. And throughout the episode, they wonder what could be inside the box. It's just like the check and the plan. Eventually, the box gets destroyed by a lightning strike, and it turns out that it was a package for Mr. Robinson. Oh, and it was ointment, by the way. I know it's a rehash of the check and the plan, but I don't care, because I really love watching the Watterson family. Their dysfunctional shenanigans is so entertaining to watch. Sure, in some episodes, they go overboard. And I mean, really overboard. But in this episode, they're pretty great. Is that Final Fantasy music I hear? Okay, I'm in. Richard gives Gumball a knockoff Game Boy. And just like that, Gumball and the entire town of Elmore end up in a video game called Inverted Paradox, The Enemy Within. <laughs> okay, take a guess at what video game franchise they're making fun of. It's a fantastic episode. It makes fun of a lot of tropes in RPGs. The unskippable cutscenes. Oh god. Oh brother, spare us. Hang on a sec. Can we skip this? Like, hit the skip button or something? Oh, you don't want to skip this. Yes, we do. Oh, you didn't buy the final mix version. Lead me into everlasting darkness. Ransacking people's houses. I don't know. There was no Buddha playing when you took that VHS player. Right now, it just feels like you're ransacking an old man's house. Uh, I guess that's cool. Um, okay. Uh, I guess that's cool. Uh, not cool, dude. The absurd outfits, doing stupid side missions in order to get 100%. A super tedious side quest that preys on every gamer's weakness. The compulsive need to complete every game to 100%. Oh yeah, sure, it's optional. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure, if you don't care about seeing the true ending. Alright, I guess. Not saving before you fight the final boss. And more importantly, the compulsive need to grind your XP. Everything you know about RPGs is most likely in this episode. And if it isn't obvious, the show is a big fan of the Final Fantasy franchise, due to the numerous references to the characters and the music. And the final act is great as well. Gumball, Darwin, and Anais make it to the awesome store. And it's revealed that the villain of the episode is the console itself. Wait, what happens in this game if we perish? Guess we perish in the real world too! Or worse, we'll have to restart the whole game from the beginning. Use the potion I gave you! But we might need it later! Oh, fuck you. So with no console and no potions, the children pull out their trump card. Summons. And we all know how overpowered those can be. This episode is awesome. Fans of RPG games should get a kick out of this one. Give it a watch if you haven't already. And as a diehard Kingdom Hearts fan myself, I say this episode is freaking hilarious and accurate. God, this wouldn't be out of place in a Happy Tree Friends video. Gumball tries to teach Darwin how to ride a skateboard even though Gumball doesn't know how to ride one himself. This episode is pretty similar to The Picnic. The whole episode is just Gumball spouting a bunch of bullshit, acting like a know-it-all until eventually he comes clean. What are we talking about here? I'm saying it looks to me like you don't know how to skate. Oh, 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 oh. <sighs> I'm a poser, all right? I never skated because I'm scared of hurting myself, okay? But you know what? 
I relate to Gumball in this episode because I remember I had a skateboard when I was younger and I couldn't do a single trick. There were some pretty funny jokes in this one, like that obvious reference to Harry Potter. But the first and second act of the episode was pretty predictable. Because like I said before, it reminds me of the picnic from season 1. Luckily the third act does make up for it. They could have used the traditional animation style, but they decided to switch it up, and it looks really good. Catfish. <laughs> I just got that. Gumball and Darwin make a fake Elmer Plus account for Grandpa Louie. Why? Because he doesn't have any friends on Elmer Plus. And they don't want to add him on their account because... Well, that's pretty embarrassing if you think about it. So after accepting their friend request on a new page they made, Grandpa Louie begins to talk about his life story and his relationship with Granny Jojo. And it's revealed that Granny Jojo is very clingy to the point where he can't even hang out with his old friends anymore. But very soon her loving arms refused to let go of me and she kept me captive. Her tender fingers now the bars of a gilded cage from which I can never escape. See, I told you there would be an explanation. After chatting with Muriel, the profile Gumball made up, he starts to fall for her. And after finding out about Muriel, Granny Jojo plans to kill her. But it's alright, because Muriel doesn't exist. Right? No. The picture that Gumball got online was from the Elmer Mall. <laughs> she works there. <gasps> well, who didn't see that coming? I will admit that the episode has a pretty good story behind it. And this episode made me empathize with Louie. Think about it. If you were in a relationship with this psychopath who told you that you couldn't hang out with your friends anymore and is constantly on your ass 24-7, you would chat with other people online too. I thought it was a good episode, although I do feel like Uncle Louie should break up with Granny Jojo because this bitch is controlling and clingy as fuck. Aww, so does this mean Grandpa Louie's allowed to have friends? Maybe just one. See? Told you guys, she's fucking crazy. Now kill her. Before we talk about this episode, am I the only one that thinks that Darwin's voice actor kind of hit puberty halfway through season 5? Give it a listen. She means you need to put it into the situation and deal with it in a mature way. See? Weird, right? Harold acts like a dick to Richard for no reason. What are you talking about? I'm all about the thug life. Stop fucking doing that. You guys want to see how real I can get? Well, break out the aloe vera, because you are about to get burned! <laughs> anyway, back to the plot. It turns out that Harold's been a dick to Richard since high school. So Gumball, Anais, Darwin, and Richard come up with a plan to get him back. And that's making him think he won a billion dollars. And instead of letting him face the consequences of being a dick, Richard decides to come clean with him. This episode is not funny. Seeing Richard constantly being picked on by Harold just makes me feel bad for him. Especially since Harold doesn't face any consequences at any point in the episode. Well, other than him blowing up his own house at the end. But is that supposed to be a satisfying payoff? Because it's not. Trash episode, moving on. After Richard gives Larry a bad review, Larry offers to give him free haircuts. I don't think that's how it works, but okay. So this inspires Gumball and Darwin to be self-entitled dickheads. Okay, sorry I read the line wrong. This inspires Gumball and Darwin to go around town and get free stuff from Larry. Because if he doesn't fulfill their demands, they'll give him a bad review. Here's your check. Eh, I don't think we'll be paying. And why would I give you a free meal? Because that's the sort of generous touch that guarantees you a glowing five-star review. You know, Larry, you could just do this. I've had enough! All you Yelp reviewers, get the hell out of here! I don't care what happens to my business! I ain't kissing your asses no more! You can't treat Yelpers this way. 
You get the get the fuck out. Ow. Eventually, Gumball wants to review everything and everyone, so he forces Larry to make a website. This episode reminds me of that South Park episode, You're Not Yelping. But I will admit, Gumball forcing Larry to create a website that reviews everything and everyone was pretty neat. Seriously, imagine if such a thing existed today. You know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, it would be chaos if that happened. The end of the episode was pretty freaking funny. Everyone gets one star, so this prompts all of them to do absolutely nothing. The only one that can shut down the website right now is Larry. And he'll only do it if Richard admits that he's bald. But he doesn't want to admit it, so Larry has this brilliant idea. Then I'll give the website a five star review and it will become unstoppable. Am I the only one that wanted Larry to win at the end? I mean, he constantly bows down to everyone. So it would be nice if he got a win for once. I give this episode three stars. I'll admit it. I'm both. Uh, me. Cartman? All right, all right. Cal? I'm smiling, isn't it obvious? No, it looks like you're trying to eat your own chin. How about that? Uh... Yes? <gasps> hmm, I just lack practice. Miss Simeon, you smiled normally before. Stop playing. What? What else have you been hiding? She knows. Finish her now before she tells all the others. But Harry Potter. Because Gumball failed a test in kindergarten, it means his grade point average is one point short, which means his ass gets sent back to kindergarten. Imagine you're in 12th grade, and all of a sudden your teacher comes up to you and says that you have to go back to kindergarten, all because you flunked a test. Post your thoughts in the comments. It turns out demoting Gumball was a bad move on Simeon's part, because she's one student short of her quota. So now she has to go and get him, and prepare him for a test so that he can get back into Elmore Junior High. The kindergarten scene was a bit hard to watch, but hey, I sat through Toy Story 3's kindergarten scene. Also, I like this callback to the genius. So? What do I do? I've literally never studied before. But after re-watching this episode twice, I do have some issues with it. I feel like it kind of fucks up Miss Simeon's character. Because it seems like her and Gumball were on good terms with each other in the later episodes. But now they're back to square one, with her hating and wanting to fail him for no justifiable reason. I mean, sending Gumball to kindergarten is pretty low, even for Miss Simeon standards. But the rest of the episode was fine, as she tries to help Gumball get ready for the test. This episode reminds me of certain episodes of Regular Show, where they try to improve Mordecai, Rigby, and Benson's relationship. But at least with that show, they actually stuck with it. And they didn't have Benson regress down into hating Mordecai and Rigby for no reason. So yeah, this episode has issues. Remember the job from season 2? And how the whole world was on the brink of destruction because Richard got a job? That's basically the same thing here. For this episode, Gumball and Darwin decide to help Richard with his diet. And also help him get in shape while they're at it. And what do you know, he becomes a ripped egomaniac. Well, who didn't see that coming? This reminds me of that Family Guy episode, He's Too Sexy For His Fat. The episode where Peter gives himself plastic surgery. But I mean, this episode does have some funny moments. This one being my favorite. <gasps> the parking lot! Where you going with my tires? But it's a pretty recyclative episode. Is that even a word? I don't know, who cares? And I just noticed when watching this episode that Gumball and Darwin literally passed the same environment three times. Rob stops being Gumball's mortal enemy and focuses on Banana Joe for some odd reason. So Gumball tries to get him to be his mortal enemy again. This episode has poor characterization. Gumball becomes even more of an oblivious idiot. And Penny ends up being a nag. Usually their relationship is wholesome and sweet. 
But for this episode, it's at its absolute worst. And the ending is really bad too. You know how the show actively makes fun of the status quo? Well guess what, for this episode, they revert back to the status quo by having Rob be Gumball's mortal enemy again. It completely ruins the development that these two had in the rerun. Some people will say that this episode parodies a difficult breakup, but that still doesn't make what this episode does okay. Just not a good episode. What? You know, I'll be like that boy in the book who was told he was special by a bearded guy who took him to a big castle to learn magic. Oh yeah, the nice boy with the scar and the spectacles. <laughs> what is up with all the Harry Potter references lately? Gumball wants a special talent, so he decides to learn magic and he forces Hector's mom to take him in as her apprentice. This episode is basically the Owl House in a nutshell. Except this episode is way funnier, well acted, better animated, and not shit. Moving on. Okay, <laughs> that was pretty mean. This episode is fine. I thought the song in the middle was pretty good. And the third act, like always, is the best part. And that's because they end up doing witch trials. But it's still an average episode. But luckily, the third act makes up for it. I don't know what that secret ingredient is, but the customers just love your burgers. The secret ingredient is love. <laughs> At least these two aren't as crazy as SpongeBob when it comes to cooking patties. Such perfection. From your little lettuce hair to your rosy ketchup cheeks, right down to your mustard smile. May I call you Patty? Richard, Gumball, and Darwin try to find the secret Joyful Burger. So the trio goes to great lengths to find it. They won't just tell anyone. They'll need to trust you. So first, you have to be the best employees ever. The secret ingredient is love. <laughs> And in other news, business moguls Gumball and Darwin Watterson have sold their joyful burger shares for a whopping $4.6 billion. Uh, uh, what are you doing? Uh, uh, no! Burger can't be seen eating our competitor's food! Please stop! Eventually they get the answer. The only way they can get the secret joyful burger is to eat a burger from every single joyful burger restaurant in Elmore. Like the last episode, the third act is honestly the best part. <laughs> Like always, it's not even a shock anymore. Because Richard goes from this to this. Remember when Richard tried to stay in shape? Now he's just back to being a fat fuck again. Marry me! Call it, guess I owe you 20 bucks. Jesus Christ. Gumball tries to be Ojo's best friend so that he can hang out with Mario. Yes, the Mario you and I know and love. This episode reminds me of the slap. I mean, we're seeing Gumball go to extreme lengths to get what he wants. Even emotionally manipulating someone who has trust issues just because he wants to see his famous uncle. But to be honest, I would do the same thing. The trials that Gumball goes through are really fun to watch. Eventually, Gumball meets Mario. And after the interaction doesn't live up to his expectations, he decides to stop being friends with Ojo. I really like the goodbye song, even if it has very noticeable auto-tune in there. A really fun Ojo episode. Also, did you notice that this character hasn't had much focus since season 2? Whoa! This is worthless. Also, I want to tell you about the blatant censorship this episode has in its reruns. They removed the part where Gumball gets kicked in the balls. And they removed the PTSD scene, which is just weird. I always wonder if people really want to be friends with me or, you know, because of my uncle being so famous and stuff. What? Mario? No, the other one. The blue hedgehog who can run very fast. Gumball, if you met Sonic, you would be much more disappointed. But then again, probably not. Gumball and Darwin try to help Sussy be less of a weirdo. I thought this episode would be boring, but it's pretty enjoyable. Sussy herself is a really endearing character, despite being a weirdo. Loose, 
take notes. And overall, this episode teaches a valuable lesson about being yourself. Sure, it's on the nose, and it's probably the most obvious message that you can tell, but I still appreciate messages like that. There's even a good musical number in here, and I like how the art style changes when Gumball and Darwin put themselves in sussy shoes for once. God, this is the seventh episode this season focusing on Richard. Tone it down a little bit, okay? Richard has this helmet on for no real reason. And instead of going to Joyful Burger and getting some burgers, he ends up going to the bank and steals two million dollars. Holy shit. And the cops don't stop him because, well, they're incompetent as fuck in this episode. So for the rest of the episode, the Watersons come up with a plan to put the money back without getting caught. The third act reminds me of the previous three episodes, the plan, the check, and the box. Because of the different scenarios the Watersons come up with. It's humorous, I guess. But there's not much to say about this one. I will say, it has a pretty funny ending. Uh, you guys are gonna have to clear the area. We just found a suspicious package in the bank. But don't worry, we're gonna do a controlled explosion. <laughs> Knock? You look disturbingly a lot like Olaf, and I don't like that. But the episode itself, I liked very much. I didn't think an episode focused on the characters singing would be this good, but it's pretty good. Not to mention, they mix it up a little bit. There's a rap number, there's a K-pop musical number, a very sexually suggestive musical number by Principal Brown, Banana Joe's version of Sympathy- Fuck. Banana Joe's version of Symphony. Banana Joe's version of Symphony. Symphony. Fuck. Banana Joe's version of Symphony Number no. Five. There, I got it. And plenty of others. It's a way better version of Hot Water from American Dad, because in that episode, characters randomly burst into song for no reason, and most of them kind of suck. But for this episode, the song slapped harder than an oncoming train. Okay, so randomly out of nowhere, Carmen acts like a real pain in the ass. Because throughout the episode, she constantly ridicules Gumball for every single solitary thing he does. Uh, Gumball, you need to make eye contact with people. It's how you show them you care about what they have to say. You really shouldn't be eating that. Too much greasy food is very bad for your digestive system. Careful how you hold your pen. That's how you get cramp. Simeon's just trying to do her job. Teachers have feelings too, you know. <laughs> This is a library. People are trying to work. If you work in silence, your success will make the noise. By the way, you shouldn't slouch in your chair. It's stunting your growth. Bitch, shut the fuck up! So Gumball decides to dig up some dirt on Carmen and expose her. What is this? I have studied the martial ways of the social justice warrior. Fight me in an argument if you dare. Perish under the sword of my self-righteousness. The SJW part is the only funny thing here. But as for the episode itself, it's just a mess. Similar to the triangle from season 3, I don't know who to root for in this episode. Carmen is a big pain in the ass that constantly ridicules Gumball at every single given opportunity. And Gumball, in return, decides to dig up some dirt on Carmen just so he can make himself look good. So because of this, I end up hating both of them. I will admit, Gumball and Darwin trying to make sure that their classmates don't see the video of Carmen getting arrested was pretty fun. But it doesn't change how the episode has a shitty ending. Wait, what? And just one more word of advice? If you're gonna upload yourself to the internet, maybe wear some pants. And that reference to Tumblr is just... Ugh. Cringe. And before people say some dumb shit like, Well, Christian, you need to understand. Carmen is meant to be a commentary on people that act this self-entitled. And to that I say... 
It should have been a new character altogether, because Carmen has never acted this way in any other episode leading up to this one. So yeah, this episode is... not great. The Watersons switch roles for the day to prove to each other that their lives are horrible. Nicole becomes a man, Gumball and Darwin become women, Anais becomes an adult, and Richard becomes a child. It's one of those character switching roles episodes. American Dad uses it a lot in their show. And the problem with this episode is, it's not funny, stereotypes aren't funny, misinformation isn't funny, and the Watterson family acting out of character isn't funny either. And just when I thought this episode would at least have a good ending, with everyone coming to the conclusion that they all have it equally bad, Nicole says this. Oh no, that's the problem! Men just don't listen! Women always get cut off in the middle of their Thank you. Get the fuck out of here with that gender bullshit. Maybe this episode wouldn't have annoyed me that much if they also showed the positive sides of being a woman, a man, a child, and an adult. But since this episode is called The Worst, they obviously can't do that. Even though in previous episodes, Gumball tries to show the positive side of everything, despite being a very cynical show. Yeah, it's pretty clear South Park really rubbed off on people. So yeah, this episode is... not very good. If you guys like it, that's pretty cool, but for me, I don't like it that much. And I need to reiterate this because I don't want dickheads in the comment section saying, Oh, he likes this show, but yet he criticizes it. You do realize that just because I like a show doesn't mean I gotta like every single solitary episode, right? There are episodes that are good or awesome, and there are episodes that are bad or weak. Accept it. If you can't handle it, Take a fucking walk! After a long one minute rap number by Nicole of all people, wait a minute, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Anyway, Nicole gets a raise, and as a result, she ends up being smug. This prompts Richard to get upset, because he feels like he doesn't get any appreciation for all his hard work around the house. I don't think you notice all the work I do around here, and I think it's about time you appreciated me! Richard, all you do is sit on your ass and watch TV all day. It's been that way since season one. <laughs> okay, I'll give you that one, but you need to appreciate what I do. Oh, shut up. Oh, and this is the sixth episode. Sixth episode focusing on Richard, everybody. So after Nicole rightfully tells him off for being a fat, lazy fuck, Richard goes on strike, resulting in the kids turning into gremlins. Didn't they already make a Gremlins reference in the nest from season 4? But still, it's pretty cool. I like the atmosphere and music when Nicole steps into the house. It really gives off the impression that when there are no adults around, these kids will turn into monsters. And maybe I would have a little more respect for this episode if it wasn't for the fact that later episodes still show Richard being a fat lazy fuck like he always is. So this episode basically has no leg to stand on. But with all the nitpicking aside, I thought this episode was pretty fun. The way Richard handled the kids at the end of the episode reminded me of Jurassic World. And at least this episode shows that Richard can be strict when he needs to be. It really goes to show he did learn something from the castle. Good looking people don't need a personality! Personalities were invented by ugly people to make up for what they lack on the outside! Well shit. He's not wrong. But would you still love me if I look like this? Yeah, you'd still be the shining sun of my life. Aww. What about now? Mm, much better. That's pretty sweet. Oh, right, the plot summary. Leslie looks ugly, so now Gumball and Darwin try to help him get his beauty back. And after a bunch of failed attempts, it's revealed the reason why he looks like this is because he's wilting. And there's only one thing that will help him get his beauty back. There are some pretty funny moments in this episode. Like the moment where Gumball and Darwin pretend they're on a TV show called Gardening Time. Today's episode is about the seasonal decapitation of flowers, or as we gardeners call it, deadheading. And the third act in general is just really freaking funny. 
with Gumball and Darwin tracking down Leslie so they can cut off his head. And I'm not gonna lie, it reminds me a lot of Blood and Honey. Okay, serious question. Why is it that Gumball can do horror elements better than actual professionals in Hollywood? No, it's a serious question. How come? I don't know. Anyway, an average episode. We're too old to play with toys and dolls. Nice. Gumball took Mordecai and Rigby's advice on dolls. Pops, you're a grown man. It's just not cool to play with dolls. Gumball and Darwin come across their childhood toys. And instead of growing up and throwing them out, Darwin somehow gets his hands on them and he continues playing with them. It seems fine at first, but then eventually we come to discover that these puppets are alive. And they have ulterior motives to trap Gumball and Darwin in Imagination Land so they can play with them forever. The third act is honestly the highlight of the episode. And this may look familiar to some of you. It's because they got the people from Don't Hug Me I'm Scared to work on this episode. And needless to say, they did an amazing job. God, those guys have come a long way. From working on a bunch of viral videos, to working on a hit TV series, to starring in their own show. Congratulations, you guys. You honestly deserve it. But it's pretty obvious the crew couldn't go all out for this episode because, well, Gumball still is a show aimed at kids. So they can't do half the stuff they used to do on Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. But even then, it's still a pretty fun episode. And it teaches a solid message about growing up and leaving your childhood playthings behind. A pretty stellar episode. What do you know? Everything the Watersons have been doing over these past five seasons is catching up to them. Again. The Watersons get summoned to Town Hall for a meeting. And the family is shocked to discover that the town of Elmore and the not-so-subtle Donald Trump is kicking them out. This reminds me of that Simpsons episode where the Simpsons get kicked out of Springfield. Was that an actual episode or am I just imagining things? Eh, probably my imagination. Before we move on, I want to talk about this picture for a sec. You see every single resident of Elmore cheering for the Watersons to get out of town. But there's one character that's missing, and that's Mr. Robinson. I bring this up because he lives next to them. He has to deal with them every single day. So it's kind of shocking that he's not there. I would expect him to be on board with this. Why am I even talking about this? So the Watersons are heartbroken to discover that nobody likes them. So, I guess we're just gonna ignore the finale of season 2 then. I don't blame them. They can't remember anyway. Let's be honest. We're the only family in town to have somehow committed a crime in every category of misdemeanor. Public nudity. <laughs> you know, this whole scene would have been funnier if they used clips from previous episodes. Because there are episodes where the Watersons commit crimes, but whatever. So throughout the episode, the Watersons try to pretend to be a perfect family. And then this happens. <laughs> Eventually, the episode ends with the Watersons trying to stop Donald Trump's plan which is to take over the town and sell it to rich buyers. God, the Donald Trump aspect is dated as fuck. Like, I didn't like that part of the episode at all. I like the Watersons turning into humans, and the third act was really fun to watch. But this is a meh episode. And it's because they had to throw in Donald Trump because he was relevant at the time. Ugh. An episode that pokes fun at Star Wars The Force Awakens. Oh joy. The Watersons stand in line to see the first screening of Stellar Odyssey The Force Rehash. <laughs> they think they're so clever. But they're at the back of the line. So they decide to post vague spoilers in order to move up. This episode has aged like milk. They're just making fun of Star Wars, the lore, the fans, and so forth. 
and this may come as a shock to you, but after the rise of Skywalker, I don't give a shit about the Star Wars IP anymore. So to see this episode regress down to making YouTube level observations of Star Wars The Force Awakens, it's just very cringeworthy to watch. But thank god the third act is good. Sure they're making fun of the pod race scene from Phantom Menace, but it's still pretty fun to watch. And the twist at the end was really funny, with the nerds getting to see the movie while everyone else was on the wrong street. A meh episode all things considered. After realizing that Nicole's life didn't go according to plan, Gumball and Darwin decide to make it up to her by doing her chores. But instead of doing her chores, they end up doing her bucket list. It's a really nice episode, and it's very commendable that Gumball and Darwin go through with completing the list. Even though it's a bucket list, it's still a pretty nice gesture. Wait a minute, wasn't there an episode of Regular Show that did the exact same thing? Eh, probably my imagination. For this episode, we focus on the Elmore news. I mean, the animation style of this dude looks nice, but other than that, it's a lame season finale. Skip. Okay, we're not getting off to a great start, but I'm pretty sure the rest of Season 6 will be good. But as for this episode, yeah, it blows. Like the origins from Season 4, we follow a baby Anais as she tries to kill Gumball and Darwin. I'm not kidding, this is how she reacts to seeing them for the first time. So yeah, this is one of those episodes that tortures the main character for no real reason. And when the main character tries to prove themselves, they get ignored. And don't let the title fool you, because Gumball and Darwin don't have any sort of rivalry with Anais. The two of them literally say they cannot wait to meet their baby sister. I for one cannot wait to meet our new little sister. I know, right? And throughout the episode, they try to be nice to her, and all she does is attempts to kill them in pretty brutal ways. Pika. Boom. And the third act sucks too. It ends with Gumball and Darwin putting Anais in a box and leaving her outside to give her a little scare. The problem is she's not in the box, but whatever. And then when the box gets taken to the dump, Gumball and Darwin do everything in their power to make sure nothing bad happens to it. Oh, I guess there is an advantage to being 2D. But after realizing it's empty, they look around for her and the little bitch tries to push them off the edge, only for this to happen. Sure, it's a pretty sweet moment, but it got ruined by this shitty ending. Fuck this episode, I'm done. Also, get new voice actors, cause it's clear that these kids can't sound like kids anymore. Well, Darwin can't sound like a kid anymore, that's for sure. <gasps> There's enough sugar in here to clog your arteries in a couple of spoonfuls. The whiskers, the whiskers, the whiskers, the whiskers, the motherfucking whiskers. Hey, you guys want to play a drinking game? Take a shot every time you see Richard without his whiskers. It should be a fun time. Samantha, finally! We've been waiting so long, Angela's clothes are back in fashion. Why does she look like Hillary Clinton? Jesus Christ. Anyway, Richard is a cross-dresser. Why is he a cross-dresser? Because he wants to have friends. I'll give you credit, the premise is interesting. It was pretty interesting seeing Richard attempt to make friends. And it was pretty nice seeing him give up this persona 
to make his kids happy. And I like the twist at the end, where it turns out that all the females that Richard was hanging out with were all guys. What a twist! It's not one of Richard's greatest episodes, but it certainly is a good one. So how come you're in dental detention? It's called detention. So, what do you do in detention? Darwin, why are you acting like this is the first time you've been in detention? They have a trampoline now? Oh man, detention sounds great! <sighs> I guess we're just gonna ignore the lesson then. So the premise for this episode is that Julius tries to manipulate Darwin into doing a bunch of bad deeds. But Darwin does a bunch of good deeds instead. And I need to mention that Gumball isn't present throughout the episode, so he's not there to tell Darwin that he's obviously being manipulated. Actually, you remember this throwaway line from the sidekick in season 2? Yeah, you're right. So let me demonstrate why people think you're a sidekick. Hey, I'm Darwin! Oh, your shoes are dirty! Looks like you can do with a doormat! Look at that beautiful pigeon pecking the mold off that old chicken leg! Isn't the circle of life beautiful? Yeah, that's basically how Darwin acts throughout the episode. He just acts so blissfully stupid and naive. And maybe this would be acceptable if this was season 1, but this is season 6. You would think after past experiences, Darwin wouldn't be this stupid when it comes to meeting shady people. Especially when it comes to people that he's met before. But nope, he still acts stupid. And that's the entire joke. Wanna come hang out with a bunch of older kids who have a reputation for being mean and manipulative? Do I? Yes, you do. Yes, I do. He's perfect. Hey, go clean out that old woman's purse. Okay, you see that nice clean van over there? You're gonna cover it in dirt. Right away. Wow, she looks great. I was thinking Janice could do with a little facelift. Here. Thank you, sir. Darwin is so stupid that he doesn't see that Bombhead is clearly manipulating him for his own selfish gain. There are some chuckle-worthy moments, specifically the final act of the episode, like always. Oh, but wait, what about my parents? Are they still mad at me? Not after they get the cake you sent them. What? Mm-hmm, the one with sorry spelled out in sparklers. Oh, you didn't wait. Did you just say a cake with sparklers? But overall, this episode just annoyed me. Two hundredth episode, everybody. This is the two hundredth episode of the Amazing World of Gumball. Whoa! Gumball and Darwin decide to veg out for the day, but the universe ruins this plan at every given opportunity. What? I'm not kidding. The episode ends with this. This is a message from the future. The strange things that happened today were for a reason. And it was all the work of... Oh my gosh, Darwin. Who could be sending that message? No, I mean, I just wrote couch candy! Woohoo! <laughs> and throughout the episode, there are multiple fourth wall breaks. Whether it's the void showing up for a brief moment... <laughs> or their couch turning into a cardboard cutout. It's a pretty chill, laid-back episode. And I think this one is a little more funnier than The Procrastinators, purely because it has a bunch of jokes that land. You're not gonna ask me how I got here? Mm, no. What? Do you wanna play a game? Oh, sure, I got a game. How do we play? Like this. Alright, universe! Bring it on! Okay, maybe we need to at least deal with that. In a minute. Ah! Come on, Darwin, we gotta go! Uh, wait, maybe not? Ah! 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 Yeah, going! Man! And it's way more entertaining than the man from season three. Remember when Tobias forced Gumball to pay him money in order to hang out with him? Whoa! You know what, guys? I'll be your friend. Really? Uh-huh. 
for 20 bucks. What? And now Tobias is trying so goddamn hard to be Gumball's best friend. Dude, who invited you in? What am I, a vampire? It's what friends do. How times have changed. Well, on the plus side, we now know I truly love myself. Yeah, but I really didn't need to see your ego smooching itself. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you jealous? You want to kiss too, Mama? Ah, get off of me. Ten times. Tobias tries to be Gumball's best friend. And the only way he can do that is by killing all of Gumball's other friends. This totally falls in line with Tobias's character because ever since season 2, he's always been upset about his place in the world. And seeing that it's called the Amazing World of Gumball, it's totally understandable why he would go to the extreme lengths to be Gumball's best friend. Because if he's Gumball's best friend, he's in the spotlight more often. I used to feel like a nobody cause my sisters always steal the spotlight. This is another good episode. Gumball, Darwin, and Anais try to help Richard bond with his father. I thought it was an interesting episode, but I could honestly do without it. I did like the ending with Richard and Frankie attempting to bond, even though it felt a bit rushed. So much so, that even Gumball points it out. So, here's the plan. You guys go through everything a father and son should have shared, but like, really fast. Three, two, one, go! But at the same time, like the previous episodes, I think it's well done. Hey, remember the hug and the awkwardness? Well, those episodes were so goddamn funny, they decided to make a third episode around Gumball and Hot Dog Guy. It's so exciting! It's so good, I'm gonna fucking come! After they come across each other for the third time, Gumball and Hot Dog Guy have to figure out why they're so awkward around each other. Hmm. Ooh, I know! It's because Gumball randomly gave him a hug out of nowhere just because he wanted to prove to Darwin that he's unpredictable. You hit the hell, hell on the net. But it's revealed in this episode that they've known each other since kindergarten. We have a little flashback scene with a different art style and it looks really good. And that's all. This episode is pretty good though, despite my criticisms. I, I, I don't know. Teachers! Damn, Gumball, calm down. By the way, 11th time, Green Frog, look, I know he has a name, but I'm calling him Green Frog, has to fight a Russian wrestler in a cage fight because the school is running low on money. And while the Russian wrestler is training his ass off, the Green Frog decides to save his energy for the fight by doing absolutely nothing. Take a rest. Wait a minute. Ah, uh, that's pretty clever. Anyway, the episode consists of Gumball and Darwin believing that Green Frog is most likely going to get his ass whooped. They try to get out of the fight initially, but the guy won't budge. And after discovering that Green Frog has an impressive amount of strength, they go through with the fight. But what do you know, he ends up getting his ass whooped. Even after he forced Gumball and Darwin to believe in him. Eh, middle of the road. Gumball and Darwin notice that something's wrong with Elmore. From the colors being sucked out, to the people not recycling resulting in there being a giant hole in the ozone layer, to animals trying to kill people, and to a bunch of kids trying to rob Gumball and Darwin. And the reason why all of this is happening, it's because Alan has lost faith in the world. Unlike Are You Happy Now, I feel like this episode does a good job of tackling depression. I also like the song at the end of the episode. It perfectly captures how life fucking sucks, no matter how old you are. And sometimes the cons outweigh the pros in some regard. But there's still some good in life that's worth living for. Whether it's your family, your significant others, your loved ones, friends, animals, passions, and so forth. And I like how even though Gumball is a very cynical show, 
They're not Rick and Morty levels of cynical. I'm a version of your brother you can trust when he says don't run. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. God, lighten the fuck up. Yeah, Anais, you think you're so woke, but if you truly cared about the cause, you'd be giving that food to the endangered trees of the Amazon. Wh what Jesus Christ, can you be any less subtle? The kids get locked in a room at the school after their parents attend a charity gala. This whole episode is a not-so-subtle satire of the 2016 elections. I usually don't like politics, especially when it comes to the 2016 elections. But at the same time, I thought this episode had some funny moments. Like the moment Gumball gets elected leader, it immediately becomes a riot. But he's only one guy. I mean, how much harm can he- The kids being locked in the room does lead to some pretty funny moments. Shouldn't we focus on the rising temperature? It's kind of boiling in here. Literally. Uh, okay guys, what are we gonna do about the food? Fight? Yeah. 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 So overall, despite the less subtle satire, I thought this was a good episode. Again, I noticed something while I was editing. I'm watching this scene and I realized that Gumball disappeared for this entire sequence. See, he's right there, and then he just disappears out of thin air. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? Remember when I told you that Darwin's voice actor sounded a little old? Well, guess what? They swapped out his voice actor in this episode. So, what are we gonna do? I do not sound like that. Try clearing your throat. Okay. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's better. Yep, that's pretty clever. Anyway, Clayton decides to turn into other people instead of being himself because, no shock, Gumball told him to. Look, look, no offense, but he's kind of the sidekick. If you want real excitement, you gotta aim a little higher. Wow, what a big slap in the face to the ending of the sidekick. I mean, you're not a sidekick, dude, you're a guardian. I need you, man. It turns out that in episodes like The Cage and The Lady, Clayton was in the background for these two specific scenes. Nice. 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 Anyway, I thought this episode was pretty funny. Seeing the different people that Clayton transforms into makes for some pretty humorous moments. Dude, you can't drive. Oh, can't I? There were some misses. Who said that? Me! Whoa, Clayton, you're disguised as a water fountain? <sighs> Wait, if Clayton was a water fountain, then I must have been drinking. Come on, let's go before Simeon catches the real me. But overall, this episode was pretty fun. Not to mention, it teaches a nice lesson of being yourself, even though the show has taught that lesson multiple times before. But whatever. And hey, Darwin's new voice actor is named Christian. Nice. 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 <laughs> I like that. Gumball and Principal Brown are having girl troubles. Miss Simeon has bad breath. Boy, am I beat. <sighs> oh, oh my god, dad! Peter, your breath, it's horrible. And Penny has this awkward laugh. <laughs> Sounds like a clown gargling a haunted accordion. <laughs> and since they don't want to tell their girlfriends to their respective faces, they decide to tell each other's girlfriends about their issues. But after Gumball deals with Miss Simeon, Principal Brown doesn't follow through, so half of the episode is Gumball trying to get him to follow through on his deal. I like this episode a lot. I didn't think an episode focusing on Principal Brown and Gumball would be this good, but it's pretty good. The second to third half of the episode is the best part. 
with Gumball going to extreme lengths to make sure that Principal Brown follows through on the deal. And the whole sequence of Principal Brown trying to stop Gumball at every turn was really fun to watch. Just a great episode overall. I should have just done my part of our secret pact. You get rid of Miss Simeon's toxic pie hole vapors, and I get rid of that laugh that sounds like a circus mule operating a pneumatic drill. I've never mentioned this, but there's a running gag in the amazing world of Gumball where the family doesn't know this guy's name. So they decide to dedicate a whole episode to this gag. Gumball and Darwin try to find out Gary's name. And that's basically the episode. Gumball and Darwin try multiple tactics to get his name. Excuse me, would you like to sign our petition? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have time to- uh, ah! Thank you for stopping, please sign here. Okay, wedding vows, go! Uh, I hereby state that I, Alice and Sandra Gator, do take you as my lawful wedded husband. Okay, your turn, go! Up until they get his real name by a bunch of Russian agents. Yeah, I don't know. The Russian agents trying to track down Gary was pretty fun, but at the same time, this episode made me feel bad for Gary. Throwing that dummy out of the window was a great idea. Now I get to keep my life in my beautiful home. Yeah, it wasn't supposed to fall out of the window. It was meant to look like you were in the house when it... Sarah gets her hands on a magic Cartoon Network notebook from the Awesome Store. And when she starts writing her bizarre love stories in the book, ugh, it comes true in real life. Larry said we can't see each other anymore. It was a hard blow for Mr. Small, and Larry was destroyed. What the fuck? This is another great episode. Because the gist of the episode is that it's making fun of fan fiction, OC, shippers, fan art, and so forth. And I loved every single minute of it. And it looks like I didn't stop at women. <laughs> I agree. I always thought I was the one wearing the pants in this relationship. Mama. Did you hear that? He called you mom! Hmm. Then I guess that makes you its dad. And I just realized that the creator himself has no hatred towards shippers. Hell, he even used some examples for the episode. If you've been around the internet, Zachary Lopez Kirby and Alex Zabandra may have seemed familiar to you. And that's because they're directly based off of two Gumball OCs, Zach Sylvia by Migs Garcia 5127 and Skylin by Gumball Bunny. There were a few alterations in the design for Zachariah, but Alex Zabandra is a spot on direct reference. I think it really goes to show that the creator and the crew really loves the fans. I thought the jokes in this one were pretty great, especially the fourth wall breaking jokes. What? You think you can just lock three people in a room and pressure them to keep coming up with gold? Eventually, they'll start repeating material. I mean, what? You think you can just lock three people in a room and pressure them to keep coming up with gold? Eventually, they'll start re Overall, it was a great episode, and it serves as a big love letter to the fans. I am a till, and I'm working at the till. We're supposed to call a checkout, but I'm gonna stick my neck out and say till, 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 till until so deal with it. I am a till, I'm still working at the till. Earn a diamond, earn a nickel with my- Stop it. Just, just, just stop it. Because Anais keeps face palming at every stupid thing her family does, it results in her having serious brain damage. And if she does it again, she'll stay retarded forever. I mean... Mentally disabled. Psych, bitch! I said retarded! So now the family has to get through an entire week without doing something stupid. And it's way harder than it looks. What can I say? This episode shares a similar problem I have with the sucker. Characters being stupid just isn't funny to me. And guess what? It's not just the Watterson family that's stupid. Well, with the exception of Nicole. It turns out that everybody in Elmore is stupid now. Well, even more than they usually are. 
And what do you know, this whole episode doesn't mean anything because it turns out that it was a dream sequence this whole time. Anais cannot be exposed to any form of stupidity for an entire week. <gasps> Nine whole days? Ugh. You've been out of it for 36 hours. And 12 bedpans. Skip. But wait, before we go, look. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. Your coupon's expired today at 12. Come on, it's 12.01! Store policy, not my fault. Yes, it is. A magic watch. Magic. But look, only 20 cents for the whole palette. I guess times were easier then. If you're a man and not a minority and more comfortable with the constant threat of nuclear annihilation. Huh, how things have changed, huh? Okay, get your commentary out of the way so we can get on with the plot. Nicole runs into her mother and her father at the supermarket. And now she's forced by the kids to make amends with them. This episode could have been good, but I feel like it was trying to be two different things at once. On one hand, it wants to be deep and dramatic. Then why are you so angry at each other? Why can't you just make peace? We were at peace, Darwin. Separately. But on the other hand, it wants to be a typical gumball episode with numerous jokes to boot. Uh, what's wrong with Nicole? Duh. Nicole is my middle name. My first name is Doctor. <laughs> and I personally don't have a problem with mixing in a little humor in a dramatic story. But for this episode, I don't think it was necessary. I feel like this episode could have been as good as The Father, but it just wasn't. So, here's the plan. You guys go through everything a father and son should have shared, but, like, really fast. Three, two, one, go! <sighs> okay. I know this is the cheapest, dirtiest kind of emotional manipulation, but there's too much on the line here. And Gumball being a dick doesn't help either. What's that now? You know, if it's too hard to forgive, then just give. <laughs> that wasn't about them. That was about the Christmas presents they owe us. <laughs> That's not good enough. He needs a more severe punishment. That's better. Memes. Fails. Kittens. Aw, uh, give them time. I'm sure they'll discover all the good things IRL. You know, all the hashtag good things that aren't on the internet. If you feel me, smash the like button below. Oh my god, stop it! Richard gets mistaken for a lost CEO, so as a result of this, he ends up being in charge of Chanex, and because of that, he starts making changes for the worst. Well, who didn't see that coming? This episode does exactly what you would expect. Richard makes a bunch of stupid decisions, and the guy that Richard is working with thinks that he's a genius. Even when the corporation is literally on the brink of crumbling down, he still thinks he's a genius. It's just a rinse and repeat episode. Skip. Larry lets Gumball and Darwin work some of his jobs as a way to get them to appreciate going to school. I say we ditch school today. They've already taught us the three key things we need to know. How to do the grammaring of words good and how to count. I say we don't just ditch school today. We straight up drop out. <laughs> I thought those two learned their lesson about staying in school after the mustache episode from season 1. But eh, whatever. This episode was pretty great. We get a deeper look into what Larry's job life is like, with Gumball and Darwin doing all of his work. Dude, what's today's date? Friday, November 24th. <gasps> the Black Friday sales. What is our motto, soldier? And not to mention, this episode taught a solid message about staying in school. And it's all thanks to Larry. Great job, Larry. You deserve a raise.
Hey guys, quick question. What's the most obvious joke to tell when the internet goes down? Exactly. Everyone starts to lose their minds and regress down to pilgrims. I did it. Get away with me on this. It doesn't make me laugh, but I did it. What? You don't think that's funny? No? Well, too bad. We got to deal with this concept for the next 10 minutes. There is no internet throughout Elmore. So now Gumball and Darwin have to find the internet to find out what's going on. But they end up encountering a bunch of old people and pilgrims throughout the episode. This episode makes the most obvious jokes with the concept of the internet shutting down. People end up losing their minds at first, so they decide to relive the old days and act like pilgrims. We can no longer summon sustenance from the telephone, so we are assembling this day a hunting party of equipped and noble fellows. I have my whisk. And I my kitchen towel. I too have kitchen towel. No beast shall slip through our fingers. You have a bunch of people telling the story of how people became dependent on the internet through caveman drawings on the wall. There was once a time when people relied on technology for everything. It told them how to get where they needed to go, it fed them, bringing food right to their door. It clothed them, and it even pandered to their deepest, darkest desires. And not to mention, you have old people complaining about how their grandchildren spend more time on their phones than bond with their grandparents. It's commentary and jokes I've seen multiple times. It also doesn't help that South Park did this years ago. Anyway, the internet is back online at the end of the episode. Moving on. idea of course just do something to distract from your hype like the titanic was the biggest ship in the world but all anyone remembers is that it's the fastest of course an intelligence potion to help us think of a solution darwin if you're not going to help can you just walk away please of course the further away you get from hector the smaller he appears i meant a shrinking potion well that makes no sense if we shrink ourselves hector will only look bigger god darwin is so fucking stupid in season six gumball and darwin make a shrinking potion for hector and after literally a couple of seconds, Hector doesn't like being small, so he orders Gumball and Darwin to make him big again. Okay, so you want us to make a growing potion? Yes. And what's the magic word? <laughs> now. Uh, no, dude, the magic word is- no! But after not following the instructions correctly, Hector becomes... whatever this is. <clears throat> I thought it was pretty fun seeing Hector grow into different shapes and sizes. It's a pretty fun episode, and it answers the age-old question, what would happen if Hector was normal size? And let me tell you, I was not disappointed. And it had a pretty satisfying ending, with Hector's mom knowing what Gumball and Darwin did, and so she punishes them for it. How? You forgot to hang up when you called me earlier. God, Darwin, you are so fucking stupid. Rob hijacks the broadcasting of Cartoon Network and shows a bunch of spin-off ideas with different characters in the hopes of getting rid of Gumball once and for all. And hey, for all it's worth, he succeeded on that front. At least that's what I thought. The episode does exactly what the title suggests. You get different spin-off ideas with characters like, let me get the list out, Banana Joe, Tina, Larry, Bobber, Karen, Bootleg Power Rangers with the kids from the Sweaters episode, William, Tobias, a reality show focusing on toddlers for some reason, and Ojo. All of them are pretty fun and unique, and each and every single one of them feels like they're spoofing a real TV show. And this is another episode where the show takes the spotlight away from Gumball and points it to the side characters. And to be honest, this is one of the better ones. Penny and her family are having a disagreement about her coming out of her shell. You guys haven't said anything since season 3, so I don't know why you're starting now. So with this argument going on, Gumball is forced to pick a side between Penny or Penny's family. Either Penny goes back into her shell, or her family steps out of theirs. Gumball, you decide. Shell or no shell. Uh, I meant more like professional help. Nonsense. I trust you'll make the right decision. For the good of everyone, including you. Oh shit. This episode teaches a solid lesson about accepting your kids' choices, even if it's something you don't agree with. 
whether it's them changing their gender or pronouns, not following family tradition, or being romantically involved with someone of the same gender or opposite gender. You know, stuff like that. And again, I really like the animation change when Gumball's telling the story of the Fitzgerald situation, but in a different way. But the king warned him, May this decision be right, or I will take your hand and it won't be in marriage! And the princess replied, <laughs> Which was either a threat or an angry burp and neither was good news. Although I did think it was a little messed up that Penny and her family members threatened Gumball. Nonsense. I trust you'll make the right decision. For the good of everyone. Including you. Here, have a cookie. It'll help clear your mind. Ah, thank you. What the what? I know you'll say the right thing. Aw, then she added a little thumbs up emoji to cheer me on. That was the closest I could find to a hand with missing fingers. Just to clarify, it was a threat. But let's be real. If you don't take the side of your significant other or their family, your ass is on the line either way. A pretty good episode. Do you realize what it's like for us to see you walking around basically naked? In my defense, that bear is just wearing a t-shirt, the piece of toast is only wearing shoes and gloves, and that dinosaur is wearing nothing at all. It's pretty hard to know where the line is in terms of public decency in this town. Maybe That's I what I fucking said! That is what I said! Oh, hello! You must be Gumball and Darwin! Huh? Oh, yeah! Hi, you must be Peter's parents. You've met them before- Oh my god. Cool. Lunch open the canteen there with the locker, the hunger sandwich, and maybe some ketchup. Huh. Another misunderstanding episode. Didn't they kind of do that already in season four? And if I recall, that episode wasn't all that funny. So they decided to make another episode with the exact same setup. And what do you know? It's exactly what you would expect. There's this new kid that Gumball and Darwin don't quite understand. So as a result, they're forced to do everything he wants because they feel bad for him. Eventually, Gumball and Darwin meet his parents, the parents from the job in Season 2, by the way. And while hanging out with them, the duo start to realize that the family is a bunch of crazy psychos that hate the government. about the government? Government? Ah, the government! Don't get me started on the government with their endless farms and their red tape! Ah, but what did they Always telling us what to do and what not to do? You can't take your son out of school, you can't teach him at home, you can't teach him how to speak. Do I look like I can't teach my own son how to speak properly? <laughs> Maybe this episode will be chuckle worthy if they didn't do this back in season four. But I will admit, the pizza family doing this at the end of the episode was pretty fun to watch. But as for the rest of the episode, it's something I've already seen before. Let me guess, you saw it, had to have it, and tried to let the kids take the fall for it. Hmm, what is he called? Wonderclub. You know what? This is about as funny as the time Peter bought a horse for his family. Whatever, Peter. Fine. Keep the horse. Good. This family works much better when we're unified. You'll see, this horse will be a fine addition to our family. Jesus Christ, did... Did I just do a cutaway gag? Oh well, let's move on. Because Richard blew a lot of money on a stupid horse, the Watersons come up with an idea to rent their house to a bunch of old goats. Well, I'll give this episode credit, it's better than Family Gay, but it's still a pretty mid episode. I didn't like Richard or Nicole at all in this episode, because I'll let the goats do the talking. You staged these memories. You rented the house to us while still hiding in it, and when we saw you, we fainted in shock, and you thought we'd croak. So you faked the memory map, and we're gonna put us on the train home thinking you'd get away with it. <gasps> what? Yeah, that's the episode in a nutshell. It's not that funny, and the family is unbearable in this episode. But at least they do face repercussions for their actions. And again, they did try to do something with the concept of Richard buying a horse, Unlike another show I can think of. Halloween, it's Halloween. 
Now remember all the rules on the art of trick-or-treating. That God of War costume, though. Carrie doesn't want to go trick-or-treating because Halloween isn't what it used to be. Originally, ghosts were supposed to go around scaring people, but they've lost their touch. Your worst nightmare! <laughs> Wait, you're not scared of me? No, not really. See? No, 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 no. you're ruining it! It's a cast videotape you watch it on the VHS player! Do you want to watch a scary movie? W what do you mean? I said, do you want to watch a scary movie? No, I mean what sort? Vampire, zombie, werewolf, zombie werewolf. And you know what? Thing? Someone's at the door. I gotta go. No, there's not. I've just locked all the doors and windows. You have to watch a scary movie with me now. No, 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 I don't. It's not right up there with previous Halloween specials, but I still thought it was a pretty fun time. I really loved all the references to the classic icons of horror. Characters like Freddy Krueger, Candyman, that creepy bitch from The Ring, Ghostface, Jason Voorhees, Pennywise, and Leatherface. It's a pretty fun episode. And that ending, <laughs> it really killed me. With all the icons of horror getting to scare the shit out of everyone in Elmore. Thanks, guys. recycle anything you act as if you're single-handedly saving the world Ugh, i'll just throw it in the regular trash it's easier to carry the guilt than carry the bottle gumball quit being fucking lazy and just toss the bottle into the plastic bin after gumball questions mr small's eco-friendly commitment he ends up running away from society and lives in the forest not all nature is out to get me huh? oh, oh. It's an alright Mr. Small episode. I did like that the episode makes fun of those people that give other people lectures about their lifestyles and so forth. All I'm saying is we all need to be aware of the impact we're having on the planet. Look at me, I have so little impact that when I'm gone, it'll be like I never even existed. Doesn't that sound fulfilling? No. Elmore Junior High has been doing these themes at school lately. Themes like Technology Week, History Week, you name it. And for this week, it's Plant Week. If you catch my drift. You are not funny. After making the statement that nobody cares about plants, which understandably pisses off Leslie, Gumball tries to show Leslie that he cares and knows a lot about plants. So you've been uh, photosynthesizing. Isn't that more of a plant thing? Yeah, but I just respect the plant culture so much I got into it, you know? Well, let's settle in then. Cool, cool. How long have we done now? About three minutes. <gasps> the ending of the episode is honestly the best part with Gumball and Leslie trying to one-up and outdo each other. It makes for a pretty fun time, because usually Gumball likes to pretend that he's a know-it-all. So it's nice to see someone knock him down a peg. Richard misses his package, and that bird from the storks won't give it to him. Because Richard missed his package, he has to go all the way to the depot to get it. But because Richard is a fat lazy fuck, he obviously doesn't want to do it, so shenanigans ensue. This reminds me of that regular show episode, Maillard's Package. The episode where Mordecai and Rigby wait for a package for Mr. Maillard, but they end up slacking off instead. But to be honest, I find this episode to be way funnier than that episode. Because this Storks lookalike has Richard go from the hospital, to the mall, to the stadium, to the toxic waste disposal site, to the museum, to the runway, to the tanning salon, you get the point. This bastard makes him go everywhere jigsaw style. Speaking of which, I'm pretty sure he will be proud. I like this episode, it's really great. Gumball begins to have doubts in Darwin and Carrie's relationship all because of Masami and Leslie. 
Alti no shade, but this couple is getting sickening, and not in a good way. I'd say they're about to lip sync for their lives. And you're right. Darwin and Carrie's relationship is going so well, something must be going wrong. Shut the fuck up and mind your fucking business, bitch! While he was eavesdropping on them, Gumball discovers that Carrie had a boyfriend before Darwin. So now his big brother instincts start to kick into high gear. Ow! Darn it! I really like Gumball's overprotective nature in this episode, mainly because he has a reason to be worried. Carrie and Darwin are completely different in terms of personality, and sometimes contrasting personalities don't always work out. Well, at least from my experiences. So I completely understand Gumball's point of view. And this episode gives us a little bit of Carrie and Darwin's relationship. Picture it this way. He was like a roaring sports car, and you're more like a shopping cart. Sure, the convertible looks cool, sounds cool, and everyone wants one, but the shopping cart is filled with all the stuff you love. <laughs> Yay. Okay, that was pretty sweet. And like every other Gumball episode recently, it ends with a change in art style. And it looks really, 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 really good. So yeah, a heartwarming episode. Give it a watch. An episode focused on the loner Anais and the abusive twat Jamie? Okay, I'll give it a shot. Okay, I guess it's safe to assume it wasn't you who downloaded the virus. And <laughs> it obviously wasn't you either. Yeah, I'm way too techy to make that kind of noob mistake. No, because you're incapable of doing anything bad. I disagree with that statement wholeheartedly. I mean, this little girl, when pushed, can be quite the troublemaker. Even more than her brothers, I would say. Anyway, for this episode, Anais and Jamie try to figure out who fucked up the library's computers. This is another good one. Because this is an episode that these two definitely need. And they work off of each other surprisingly well. I hope to see more adventures with these two. So anyway, Louie's sister Sheila just turns up out of the blue, waltzing in, leaving her stuff all over the place, and eating our food without even asking. I hate when people intrude like that, but I guess some people just can't read the signals. Wow. Granny Jojo is still an inconsiderate twat. Who would have guessed? Huh, Mad Max reference. Nicole wants to throw out this old refrigerator that Granny Jojo gave them. But Jojo Rabbit and Richard don't want her to do that because that refrigerator is Richard's most prized possession. So Granny Jojo and Nicole go to the awesome store to get it repaired. And while that's going on, Richard has to give away the thing he loves most. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the fridge, not his kids, because his kids don't mean shit. A pretty relatable episode that deals with the concept of treasuring and valuing your possessions. Oh, I need to mention that the refrigerator they've been using, it's not supposed to be used for storing food. It's supposed to be used for storing strong emotions and whatnot. Well, who didn't see that coming? <laughs> it's the amazing world of Gumball. What do you expect? I do like when the house turns into a winter wonderland when the refrigerator goes haywire. Uh, could you pass me the salt, please, Anais? Yeah! Thank you. May I have the gravy, please, Darwin? <gasps> now, now. Maybe a little dessert will sweeten you. <laughs> I will not tolerate this kind of behavior in my house. What the fuck? Nicole, Gumball, Darwin, and Anais are all grumpy. Oh god, please don't be like the worst all over again. But at least the kids have a reason to be pissed. He made us believe we only had 24 hours to live because of a disease called gumbolitis. Well, maybe you shouldn't have bedazzled the toilet seat. My butt looks like a Faberge egg. Nicole, on the other hand, she just doesn't. Like, they have a moment where the kids explain why they're pissed off, but as for Nicole, they just throw her into the mix because... Why not? So Richard decides to have the family play this fantasy role-playing board game. A bit like Dungeons and Douchebags. Wait, that's not what it's called. Tomato, tomato. And I'm not just assuming, Richard literally says this. 
for Saturday night is family time. And since it's my turn to choose, we're raiding Dungeons and Fighting Dragons! This whole episode is a parody of Dungeons and Dragons. And personally, I'm not that big a fan of that stuff. In fact, this episode reminded me of that regular show episode, but I have a receipt. In some aspects. But this episode was really good. Especially with the animation in this one. And as much as I don't want to admit it, there were some pretty chuckle-worthy moments with this feud. I throw it at Mario Kebab's face. I throw it at Testosterona. And I throw it at Frumpet. I feel like they've really captured the look of Dungeons and Dragons in this episode. And I like the redesigns of Gumball, Darwin, Nicole, and Anais. And once again, the third act of this episode is really amazing as it ends with a badass final battle. So even though I'm not a big fan of Dungeons and Dragons, I had a pretty great time with this episode. Gumball and Darwin have run out of things to say to each other. <gasps> Darwin, maybe it's not the games. Maybe we're part of each other. No, don't say that. It's the truth, Darwin, and you know it. So they try to fix that problem in any way they can. I'm Akane Ryuku, a shy anime kawaii girl who likes corgis and friendship. Oh, hey, hey I'm Akane-chan. I'm not used to talk to people. <laughs> Asterisk blushes and turns away. What? Question mark. Equals my message not going through? Chat with me now and win dollars, dollars, dollars. What? Click link and talk. <laughs> You know, I'm surprised the anime community hasn't gotten on your ass for this shit. After a bunch of failed attempts, Gumball and Darwin decide to go their separate ways. And after doing a stupid musical number, Darwin ends up getting trapped in a car. So now the Watersons have to find him. Another solid Gumball and Darwin relationship episode. Banana Joe's mother, Barbara, ends up going missing. So now Gumball, Darwin, and Banana Joe have to find her. And while that's going on, Rob is trying to get Barbara to paint the future. Hey, do you mind if I put a poster in your window? It's for my mom. She's missing. Uh, oh, gosh. Go ahead. Ugh. I like that this episode gives us an explanation for why Banana Barbara is all... This. He won't spend half of December in a Christmas stocking. You found my tooth under the pillow. <laughs> How much? For what? Everything you're wearing right now. What? One hundred million dollars. <laughs> it turns out she hit a massive case of burnout when she was at work. Also, this episode confirms that she's basically God. Because whatever she paints on the paper, comes true in real life. Look at that speech bubble! I always thought she was good at predictions, but nope. She basically controls the universe. This goes to show that Banana Barbara is not one to be fucked with. And, no shock, the third act is pretty creative and awesome. Because when Rob and Gumball start messing up the paintings, it affects the real world. Remember when we straight up erased that guy from existence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Barbara, can you paint him back into existence, please? <laughs> Perfect. Also, I need you to remember this picture because this will be important for later. Principal Brown is having a difficult time confessing his love to Miss Simeon. So, like a pussy bitch, he starts to avoid her. Which leads to Miss Simeon taking a break from the relationship. Why is this important, you may ask? Because throughout the episode, Principal Brown, Gumball, and Darwin think that Miss Simeon has turned into a neck pillow. And it's because of some stupid wish that the duo made. I'm surrounded by idiots. Everyone in this episode is a fucking idiot. At least the ending makes up for it, with Principal Brown telling Miss Simeon how he feels, but still, everyone's a fucking moron. I'm surrounded by idiots. <gasps> I gotta run! If I'm 
much later I'll be back for dinner before I get to work. Wait! Wait, wait. Oh, boy! Thank you, sweetheart. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Are you kidding me? How on earth could you be in there? You handed me the briefcase yourself! Yes, but from the inside. Oh, wait! Your briefcase! Oh, boy! Thank you, sweetheart. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty clever. Gumball and Darwin follow Nicole to work at the Rainbow Factory. And while they're there, they realize that the Rainbow Factory isn't exactly what they'd hoped for. Where are all the roly-poly amps and dungarees? Instead, it's tears and bitterness and awful salaries. And this is exactly why I don't want to work at an office job. I mean, for God's sake, look at how miserable this place is. Wait a minute. Why am I sensing deja vu? This one really goes to show how working at an office job is probably the worst job to take. As for the episode itself, it's fine. It gives us a little look into what the Rainbow Factory is like. And after Gumball and Darwin stupidly press a button, resulting in the near destruction of the Rainbow Factory, they end up saving it. And for some reason, they're congratulated for it. <laughs> They almost caused the destruction of the Rainbow Factory for the second time. Why are you applauding them? Get mad at them! Darwin! Oh, Darwin! Oh, Darwin, where are you? There you are! Oh, man! Notice how they reused the same take three times. Yeah, I don't think Swim Club is for you. The school isn't suited to swim club. Gumball, I'm pretty sure you're not suited for the swim club. I mean, don't you remember season one? You almost drowned. Anyway, after an incident resulting in them losing their clothes, Gumball and Darwin start wearing dance clothes from Lost and Found. Hey. So now Gumball starts to act like a... Super on a mission to find a bunch of stolen crap from the school. In case you don't know, this is an obvious parody of James Bond. And for what it's worth, I think it's pretty good. And I like that the culprit was William this whole time. And it makes sense because of what Gumball said about him earlier. And then there's William. Surely the chlorine in the water is going to sting his... everything. Shh, he'll hear you. Doesn't have ears. So as a parody of James Bond, I think this episode does a good job. I hate this episode so much because it blatantly ruins Nicole's character. Such as 95 ways to protect a turkey and how to baste your children. No, oh no, wait. Uh, um, so when you're online, make sure to leave the spell checker on. Okay, why? In case someone tries to hex you with a chain letter. What are you doing? Updating your antivirus. What? There you go. I'm setting up the firewall. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Right, that should do it. I'm surrounded by idiots. Gumball and Darwin discover that Nicole sucks at using computers. That's some bullshit given the fact that previous episodes have shown her using computers very professionally. Maybe if this was Richard we were talking about, I wouldn't mind this as much. Because it's already been established that Richard is an idiot. But Nicole is very smart. So it's really annoying that she's this stupid when it comes to computers. If they wanted to provide commentary on how teaching parents how to use technology is the most stressful thing ever, I think they did a decent job on that. But it doesn't change the fact that they ruined Nicole's character for the sake of getting that message across. And not to mention, I don't like it when they blatantly reference things from the internet. I know I'm slow, but I'm not into web explorer slow. <gasps> she made a browser nerd joke! She's learning! That shit is really annoying. I found this episode kind of relatable, and I did like the musical number at the end, but I can't ignore how much the writers butchered my favorite character in the show. Okay, Tina, let's get on with it. Actually, I'm in line for Darwin. Uh, 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 sorry, but I'm the only one who's allowed to kiss Darwin. <laughs> Ain't that the truth. You fuckers have kissed 12 times over the course of the series. And didn't Darwin cheat on Carrie by kissing Tina? Eh, details. 
Gumball and Darwin have to look after Penny's sister, Polly. Oh yeah, Nicole, that's fucking genius on your part. But there's a problem with that. Gumball and Darwin were up all night watching videos instead of going to sleep. So throughout the episode, while they're babysitting Polly, they keep zoning in and out. Another funny ass episode, mainly because everything that Gumball and Darwin are doing reminds me of a hangover movie. After hearing Mr. Robinson badmouth them, Gumball and Darwin make a promise to never talk or interact with him ever again. So now Mr. Robinson has to make it up to the boys and fix their... friendship? Uh, I don't see how things will ever be the same again. Short of brainwashing them. <gasps> but of course! How to brainwash ch I say that very lightly because they don't act like friends. It's been established since season 1 that Mr. Robinson doesn't like Gumball or by extension the Watterson family. But with that aside, I thought this episode was shockingly good. Seeing Mr. Robinson feel regretful for what he did is again pretty shocking. We even see him flashback to when he first met the boys and needless to say, I think it's best they never interact ever again. I mean, I'll give Squidward credit that he never did anything like this to Spongebob. Hmm, maybe I should do a ranking every Spongebob Squarepants. Oh, god damn it. So yeah, I did like that Mr. Robinson tries to make it up to the boys. Even though I really don't think Gumball and Darwin should forgive Mr. Robinson for what he did. But at least the episode tries to excuse Mr. Robinson's actions by showing us that his heart is preventing him from feeling his emotions. You know what? Forget it. I'm not even shocked anymore. Oh, uh, that's no fun. This has become the norm for you, Carl. I'll have to try harder next time. Please don't. I feel like I've been issued a challenge. Carl! Darwin feels bad for the objects of Elmore. So he encourages them to stand up and live their own lives. Darwin acts like an obnoxious pain in the ass throughout the episode. And I'm not kidding, he acts like this throughout the episode. They're objects, that's why they're there, to be used. You see, that's the problem! Stop objectifying objects! Uh, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Not you. You, are you okay? Shut the fuck up! And what do you know, the episode ends with the objects of Elmore enslaving humanity. Ah, <laughs> I didn't see that coming from a mile away. Did you see that coming from a mile away? I definitely didn't. Ah, <laughs> fuck this episode. Darwin tries to make decisions for himself after getting a bunch of bad advice from Gumball. This kind of reminds me of the sidekick from season 2. But, let's give this episode a chance. While Darwin is trying to do his own thing, he gets Alan's help along the way. But realistically, he's just doing what Alan tells him to do. So now he's going to make his own decisions for real this time. And noticing that this is a bad thing, Gumball and Alan decide to follow him. Okay. You're the boss now. You get that game back from Tobias. Finally! I've been ready for this for so long! So what should I do? You stole his mom! Okay, you know what? I'm out. The uh, thing is, I kind of signed a note from both of us. With you being my sidekick and all? I give the episode credit that it teaches a solid lesson about making your own decisions for yourself. But yeah, this episode still reminds me of the sidekick. It doesn't make it bad, it's just something I've noticed. Oh my god, another jealousy episode? You guys have done this three times already. Just stop it. Gumball meets his old BFF, Fuzzy. Okay, this whole premise is bullshit, considering the fact that they never showed this character in any of the origin episodes. So after discovering that Gumball had a BFF before him, Darwin starts to become jealous. Yay, another Darwin is a jealous little bitch episode. I've been missing those. What do you want me to say? This episode sucks. 
It's a clear jumping the shark episode. As they say that Fuzzy is Gumball's very first best friend, even though they never showed this character in any of the origin episodes. And as if this episode's concept wasn't bad enough, they pull this stupid twist where Fuzzy has an ulterior motive to steal Gumball away from Darwin. So this makes Darwin's jealousy valid because, hey, look, this shady character we don't know anything about or seen in previous episodes is a twist villain. It wasn't original when Steven Universe did it, and it's not original now. And it doesn't help that Darwin blatantly points this out at the beginning of the episode. Look, just give me a chance. A chance to abduct your best friend and lock him up in a cabin in the woods? What the? No! Look, can we just bury the hatchet? Bury? Hatchet? Okay, I don't know what you're trying to rope me into, but... Rope? This episode is shit. Moving on. Here we are, we have reached the final episode of the amazing world of Gumball. So, did they go off on a high note? Oh no, it started. Well, what the fuck do you think? Let's talk about this episode, because there is a lot to talk about. The superintendent shows up at Elmer Junior High to fix the students and the school faculty. This episode is a joy to watch because the way this guy transforms the characters from who they are to humanoid versions of themselves is pretty cool. And I like how this guy is a real human as he blends into the 2D environment. It reminds me of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And, no shock, the third act was really fun to watch, with Gumball and Darwin helping everyone get back to their usual cartoony selves. And then we get to that infamous ending, where it turns out that the superintendent was robbed the whole time. Why was he trying so hard to change the characters, you ask? Well, let's see if he'll explain. I did all this for a reason. Don't you understand what's going on in Elmore? You have two choices. Live in ignorance about what's going to happen here. Or listen to what I have to say. Okay, God. The reason I've been trying to transform you is because... Ah! I think that's quite enough. Okay... Um... Maybe he'll explain at the very end. Transformation is the only chance they have of escaping to the other place when this world... <laughs> Oh no, it started. Ah! Oh yeah, we don't get an answer because this episode ends on a fucking cliffhanger. Now I bet you'll say, but Christian, I'm sure we'll get answers to that ending with Darwin's yearbook and the Gumball Chronicles. Let me just spoil it for you. We don't. If this was another episode in the series, I wouldn't have much of a problem with it. But the problem is that this is the final episode of The Amazing World of Gumball, and it doesn't really feel like a grand series finale. Adventure Time and regular shows finales felt like finales, even though I think Adventure Time's finale is a little weaker compared to regular show's finale, but that's a story for another day. This just feels like Ed, Ed, and Eddie all over again. Where that show ended on a run-of-the-mill episode, and then eventually we got that awesome movie. And I think this show is following in its footsteps. As it has been revealed that there is an amazing World of Gumball movie in the works. But I'm honestly getting really sick and tired of that. Stories need to come to an end. Not ending on cliffhangers or an open-ended ending in the hopes that a movie or epilogue series will fix it. This is why I have so much respect for regular show's finale, because the show ended and that's it. So as a series finale, it fucking sucks. But as a standalone episode, it's pretty goddamn good. Easily my favorite episode of this season alone. Here's a quick little edit because I just realized that The Amazing World of Gumball is coming back with a season 7. So yeah, this whole little tangent, it's basically outdated because although the movie is unknown and I think the spin-off series is in the works, 
it, it's confirmed that Gumball is coming back for a seventh season. I thought about scrapping this whole part, but I decided to keep it in there because this is how I felt when I first saw the episode for the first time. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's really nothing left to talk about. Well, except for Darwin's yearbook and the Gumball Chronicles. Ugh, fine, I'll take a look. <sighs> These two shows are goddamn pointless, because they're nothing but clip show episodes. They just reuse old footage from previous episodes and talk over it like a bunch of assholes. I didn't think Gumball would copy The Simpsons in South Park, but here we are. Let's just get this over with. I want to be done with these two shows. Darwin is forced to do the school yearbook because Principal Brown doesn't know any of the kids' names. And I'm not kidding. That <laughs> That's an actual explanation. Dear Orange Watson, I need a student to design this school yearbook. I'm asking you because I can't remember the other kids' names apart from the Blue Watson, and he's here in detention. Kind regards, Principal Brown. Okay. We get a bunch of clips from previous episodes that show Banana Joe being the goofy banana we know and love him for. We get clips from the compilation, the uploads, the promise, and the misunderstandings. One, two, three. Oh, man. Hey, man, wanna hang out? Hey, Joe, uh, I'm sorry, I really can't talk right now. Should we just sing instead? You know what, since this is a clip show series, I'm just gonna give my thoughts on the characters to kill time. I like Banana Joe. Sure, he's a little weird and wacky, but he's still pretty fun to watch. where you can build anything out of little bricks. Very good, Joe. A game encouraging creativity. Right now, I'm building a fireplace in my wooden house. <laughs> I don't know why this is called Clayton, because we obviously focus more on Tobias than Clayton. This gets a low score for the misleading title. F minus, fuck you. As for Tobias, I think he's a thoroughly enjoyable character, too. And I like how he goes from being too cool to be Gumball and Darwin's friend to trying to be Gumball and Darwin's best friend. You know what, guys? I'll be your friend. Really? Uh-huh. For 20 bucks. What? Dude, who invited you in? What am I, a vampire? It's what friends do. <gasps> you know what's cool about being best friends? You never need to ask before borrowing money. And am I the only one who thinks he's probably going to be the bad guy in the movie? I mean, think about it. He got pissed off at Gumball because he feels like he's a background character in the show. Darn right I'm angry at you! Have you ever noticed that nothing in this world is set up as it should be? I should be more important! I should be the one with the sidekick and exciting adventures. I'm more handsome, richer, and more colorful than you guys, and yet, it's like I'm the supporting character of my own life! And he was so salty, he tried being Gumball's best friend, and he even tried taking over the show itself. Something that Rob was incapable of doing. So I think when it comes down to it, if they try bringing back every single villain in the series for the movie, something that regular show has done a couple of times, I think Tobias will be on the bad guys team. Sleepover at yours? Yeah, sure, we can have a sleepover. 20 bucks. I should be more important. I should be the one with the sidekick and exciting adventures. I'm more handsome, richer, and more colorful than you guys, and yet, it's like I'm the supporting character of my own life! I think Carrie is another great character too. Although I do feel like she gets way more attention than Penny. You know, the character that's been built up to be Gumball's crush since season one. How come you don't have a girlfriend? What do I need a girlfriend for? This. Mwah. 
And yeah, I still can't get over that. I thought Darwin and Rachel were going to be a thing. But nope, they shipped Darwin and Carrie. And I still don't know where that came from. Because they showed little to no interest in each other in season 1. Even with that, episodes focusing on Carrie were pretty fun to watch. Although I do wish they would have delved into her character a little bit more. Just like what they did with Penny. Because most of the episodes focusing on Carrie revolve around her hanging out with Gumball and Darwin. The only time we've delved into her character was in the mirror, the drama, and the ghost. Other than those episodes, we don't really delve into her character all that much. Which is a real shame. I remember Alan was a simple guy back in Season 1. In Season 2 and onward, they transformed him into a Gary Sue that does a bunch of good deeds from the bottom of his heart. I give the Vision credit that they tried to do something with his character, and the Faith is by far my favorite Alan episode. But for the most part, Alan is just a perfect character. And yeah, I feel like Gumball, I just want to pop his handsome smug face. Listen, Gumball, do you really want to be doing this? I mean, we've never hung out before, and now we're having a sleepover. Yeah. Look, Gumball, what's really going on here? Are you guys going to tell me what's going on here? I want to become school president so I can help those students who feel a bit down and offer them a chance to go to the lake camp at weekends. I mean this with no exaggeration. This character creeps me the fuck out. She's basically the representation of what some fans are like. With their constant fan fictions, OCs, shippings, and inserting themselves into shows to make themselves feel more important than they actually are. Hey, we should totally go on an adventure where we like tell people off for their bad habits but learn that everyone should be themselves and then we hug. <laughs> Miss me with that bullshit. But at the same time, I will admit, she is pretty funny in some episodes like the shippening and the comic. Draw muscles, then more muscles. But she still bothers me. Like in the episode The Fan, where it's revealed that she's been stalking Gumball and Darwin 24-7. For a very long time, I've watched you from afar, hunched in your closet, or strapped beneath your car. I treasured all the stories the three of us share. Wherever you are, I'll always be there. That's so weird and fucking creepy. And I don't know why they persist in making a joke out of it. Because it's not funny. Cause I guarantee if a man did this shit, a lot of people would be pissed off. But what? Because she's female, it's automatically funny? <laughs> it's not. Let's make this quick. I didn't like Mr. Small that much in the first season. I do agree he does get better later down the line. But for the most part... He's fine. I like Principal Brown, mainly because he has good banter with Gumball every now and then. And here are my thoughts on the other teachers. There we go, I did Darwin's yearbook. And I gotta say, there's not much to say about these two shows, because they're just using clips from previous episodes to kill time. I tried making it a little interesting by giving you my thoughts on the characters, and hopefully you guys like that. But we're not done just yet, we still got the Gumball Chronicles to go over. Every single Halloween special of Gumball combined into one. What do you want me to say, it's just a fucking clip show episode. I mean from what I've researched, a lot of people say this series uses new footage. The only new footage they use in this episode is at the end. But even then, I think the new footage in this episode is reused from season 2. Let's just keep moving forward. Gumball decides to run for class president. And you get a bunch of clips from previous episodes. Oh yay. What do we do? What do we do? What should I do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What are we gonna 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 do? 
What bothers me about this episode is that they use this old style of having a still frame with real lips talking. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? I'm Gumba. What are we gonna do? That's just so fucking lazy. And I guess everyone was right. There is technically new footage in this episode, with Gumball trying to ask Penny to be his vice president. You know, this would make for an interesting plot if it wasn't for the fucking clips. You want change? Yeah! Tired of fancy words? Yeah! Well, how about this for a slogan? <laughs> That's annoying. Oh yeah, I think Gumball and Penny are a cute couple. But there are some moments where Gumball can act like an idiot boyfriend and Penny can act like a nag, which I really don't like. It reminds me too much of Cosmo and Wanda. Cosmo and Wanda definitely had it the worst though. They just became miserable to watch. It didn't seem like they enjoyed each other's presence at all, and at best were just indifferent towards each other. Cosmo was no longer just a lovable, well-meaning idiot. He was fucking brain dead and could barely function on his own, but at the same time really hated Wanda and always gets her for being a nag. And Wanda... Well, she just turned into a fucking nag. But then again, those are few and far in between. For the most part, they're a pretty cute couple. Way better than any relationship that Finn and Mordecai got themselves into. Gumball and Leslie, that's all you need to know. <sighs> okay, fine. When they're not flashing back to a clip from a previous episode, I will admit, I do like the conversations between these characters. It feels so nice and genuine. And I feel like Gumball's new voice actor does a good job playing him. Oh, I forgot to mention, Gumball has a new voice actor. Now you know. And as for Leslie, I feel like he doesn't get utilized that often. There are a couple of episodes where he does get his time to shine, but not as much as Carrie, Penny, Bobbert, Alan, or even Sarah. We get a barrage of clips of Gumball and Bobbert. And I'm gonna deliver a hot take. Most episodes with Bobbert, while good, are pretty predictable. Because it's the cliche robot taking everything too seriously, not understanding social cues, and then over the course of their life, they start to reach their humanity. But at the same time, there were some pretty good Bobbert episodes here and there. My personal favorite is The Upgrade. What can you rock it like rocket fuel? Da, 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 da. What can you rock it like rocket fuel? Oh crap, we're still recording. And we're only on episode 5. God damn it! For this episode, Gumball tries to find literally anyone to be his vice president. And we get a barrage of clips from previous episodes for the possible candidates. It ranges from Juke, who's the only one that doesn't have a clip show dedicated to him, to Sussy, Peter, Josh, and this guy Gregory, who literally had only one speaking line. I will admit, it's fun to see those characters again. Even you, Gregory. Anais makes her own family tree. This is the newest footage I have ever seen in my goddamn life. Praise Jesus, everyone. Praise Jesus. I don't know what you expect me to say. It does exactly what you think it does. We take a look at the Watterson bloodline. That's it. Gumball, Darwin, and Anais try to figure out what they're going to get Nicole for Mother's Day. And the best way to do that is to ask their friends, Billy and Hector. And what do you know? More clips ensue. Eventually, the kids decide that asking their friends isn't worth it, so they decide to do this whole thing on their own. And we get more clip shows. Jesus, I'm really starting to like these clip shows. Aren't you starting to like these clip shows? I know I certainly am. And I should probably let you guys know, Nicole is my favorite gumball character. She's hardworking, she's a strict yet loving mother, and overall, she's just awesome.
What do you know? Richard is a criminal. Honestly, that doesn't really shock me. To be honest, every single member of the Watterson family deserves to be locked up for some of the crimes they've committed. And they did get locked up in season 2, only for the status quo to save their asses. But there have been moments where the Watersons did face repercussions for their actions. What? Are you upset that I'm not talking about the episode? It's a glorified clip show episode. You're not missing out on much. And thank God this is the last one because I honestly don't think I can take any more. Wait, it turns out Gumball made a series of shorts called Waiting for Gumball. And it's made by the people from Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Okay, now that's promising. But since there's not much to talk about because they're short, I'm just going to speed through it like I did with regular show shorts. Walt in Imagination Land, Gumball and Darwin come across Gumball's made-up food. I bet it tastes better than Pepsi with chocolate Lucky Charms. Jesus, what was I thinking? A random pineapple begins to talk using Gumball's mouth. I... I don't... I... I don't have any words for this one. Gumball and Darwin make puppets of each other. And it just goes on loop. Forever and ever 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 and ever. Reminds me of regular show's Infinite Short. Darwin shares his drink with Bird Plain Bird. Try saying that five times drunk. Gumball makes fun of Darwin's voice while playing with his puppet. So Darwin decides to get payback by doing the same thing. The ending is the best part because it's revealed that these puppets are alive. I'm sorry too, my lad. Darwin decides to give himself a beard, and because he sucks at doing it, Gumball decides to help him out. Trust me kids, having facial hair sucks. Darwin imaginates gnomes. And when Gumball tries to imaginate something interesting and cool, he imaginates gnomes as well. This reminds me of that Last of Us conversation where Ellie and Joel come across some gnomes. Hey, look. <laughs> gnomes. Yeah, those are gnomes. Man, I had an art book filled with these. I always thought they were super cute. <laughs> Not fairies, though. They creep me out. All right, man. Gumball and Darwin start to feel each other up. Wait, 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 Grady and Frank have a dance battle over this spoon that Grady thinks is his. It's not as great as this dance battle, but it's right up there. Frank bothers Grady and Howdy because he's bored. So the duo tries to entertain him. But then it turns out to be a misunderstanding because what he meant was that he was sleepy, not bored. This is the weakest short by far. Grady and Howdy want to make a television series, but they don't know whether it should be a documentary or a fun show. This one's a step up compared to the last short, but not by much. Grady, Howdy, and Frank set up a party for Gumball and Darwin, but when they don't show up, they get the big sad. You know what? After watching this short, I end up kind of rooting for them in the Puppets episode. I mean, come on, look at all the decoration and hard work. Okay, I get their puppets, but still, shut up.
I've done it. I've watched and ranked every single episode of The Amazing World of Gumball. And I don't care if they did it before me. Anyway, does it still hold up? Yeah, I say it does. This show is just as good as I remember. And now that I think about it, the love I have for it matches that of regular show. The animation is really outstanding and unique, as there are moments in some episodes where it can get pretty creative and expressive, ranging from the world to the characters themselves. Because there was an argument that digital animation kind of limits a character's facial expressions, if modern Simpsons and Family Guy is anything to go by. But Gumball shows that even in digital animation, you can still make some pretty exaggerated facial expressions. The comedy in this show is top notch. Sure, there are some moments where it does do gross out humor, and they break the fourth wall way too much at times. But it doesn't change the fact that this is still a hilarious show. And there are some moments in Gumball where you can take these jokes out of context, and it's the funniest shit I've ever seen in my life. It's fine, honey. Uh, okay, so are you gonna tell us what we should be celebrating? Don't worry about it, sweetheart. Cause somebody has to pay for all this! Oh, of course, allow me. Oops! Hey, wait a minute! This is a cracker! Hold on. I got this! Ah! Oh, uh, <clears throat> hurry up, please. I'm sitting for two. They grow up so fast. The characters are very memorable, likable, and funny, ranging from the background characters to the main cast. There are some characters that are pretty eh, but most of the characters in Gumball are pretty awesome. Even Gumball himself, a character that can act pretty spiteful, selfish, and ignorant, can still be a pretty fun, well-meaning, and lovable character. I think the heart and emotion in this show is very well done. Because there are some moments that made me cry like a little bitch. I didn't think a show about a cat that goes by the name Gumball would make me teary-eyed. But it did. And you know what? Bravo. Now here's the million dollar question you're probably going to ask. Where do I think the amazing world of Gumball went downhill? Because in these other ranking videos, I've pinpointed where these shows started to go downhill. Family Guy went downhill after season 7, and it hasn't been good since then. American Dad started to go downhill after season 10, but it managed to fix itself up with season 15. South Park hit a bad one with season 20, but it's been recovering ever since then. Regular show kind of dwindled around seasons 5 and 6, with seasons 7 and 8 bringing the show back to its former glory. And as for Gumball, much like regular show, it went downhill around... Seasons 5 and 6, because those are the seasons where there are some episodes that ruin the characters by making them uncharacteristically stupid, going overboard for the sake of a joke, trying to be hip and cool, which is just cringy and embarrassing, or they tried making some sort of commentary on something that I honestly didn't care for. And it's not just those two seasons that are bad, season 1 was a pretty rocky start for the series. Even though I didn't go as hard on it like other people have, I can agree it is weaker compared to what we would get later down the line. And while I am still pissed off that the series ended on a cliffhanger Teen Titans style, it's common knowledge that Gumball is coming back with a feature length film and a spin-off series. Or so I thought. You see, according to research, it turns out that the Amazing World of Gumball movie has been shelved because HBO Max decided to drop it. And it turns out that the spin-off show is still going though. So they decided to ditch the movie, but they're still going to do the spin-off show. I don't know, that, that, that doesn't sound right. You know what, I'm going to deliver a hot take. They should have ended the series with season 6. They should have wrapped all the loose ends with one episode, rather than waiting for a movie or a spin-off series to conclude it. You know what, I wasn't planning on saying this, but fuck it, it needs to be said. Don't make a spinoff to the amazing world of Gumball. Let the series rest. And also, the same thing applies to Adventure Time 2. Don't make a spinoff series off of these two shows. 
let them end. You let regular show end, and I don't see you making a spinoff to that show. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, that's it. I'm done. So yeah, that's all I needed to say regarding the amazing world of Gumball. Now let's rank these fuckers. Well, there goes five months of my life I'm never getting back. And let me tell you, this is not scripted, but I did not know this video was going to clock in at six hours. Like, <laughs> oh my god. I thought it was going to be like three to four hours long, but no, it's six hours. Holy shit. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please tell me what you think. Do you like The Amazing World of Gumball? What's your favorite episode? What's your least favorite episode? Do you agree or disagree with the points I've made in this video? Tell me in the comment section below. And I beg you, I plead with you, don't be one of those assholes that say, oh, you're automatically wrong. There is no such thing as a bad Amazing World of Gumball episode. Therefore, fuck this video and your hard work. Please acknowledge that any show that's been running as long as Regular Show, Gumball, Adventure Time, Family Guy, American Dad, or South Park is eventually going to have a bad episode. Get used to it. And most importantly, this is my opinion, not yours. So calm down. Everything I say in this video does not invalidate your feelings of something. You can still like a show even if you acknowledge that it has flaws. Calm down. Jesus Christ. Anyway, I'll catch you guys later. Peace.